This is Audible. The Eliminators, Volume Three, written by Jacqueline Druga, narrated by David Dietz. Chapter One, Pit Stop, April Nineteenth. Day three hundred sixty-five, Minerva, Ohio. The elite prototype Eliminator vehicle, or EPEV, was one of a kind. There wasn't another Eliminator vehicle like it. Other than being beautiful and big, it was completely high-tech, a computerized specialty vehicle designed by the newest member of the Flaming Saffron's team, Aldrich Yates. Unfortunately, despite how high-tech everything was. No one really understood it the way Yates did, and that was the problem. It was parked in nearly the center of the town, a good position. They were there for a quick stop, and that was it. Riggs made his way to the back of the vehicle, to the main intelligence hub or control room. Fred, another newcomer to the team, looked like he was about to pull his hair out as he sat behind the monitors. "What's going on?" Riggs asked. "Where are they?" "I don't know." "What do you mean you don't know?" Again, I don't know. How many ways do you want me to tell you? Fred replied. Barry joined them in the back. Sandy's ready on the medical aspect of it. Riggs looked at him. I don't think it'll come to that. They sounded desperate. Barry said, "Really desperate." They're not desperate. They're ridiculous. Okay, Fred. Riggs said, "Can you track them?" Yes, yes, I can. I have track and fired up. Barry patted Fred on the shoulder. Good. Now where are they? I don't know. Riggs nearly shrieked. This is a fourteen million dollar vehicle. How can you not find them? Easy. Fred lifted the tracking bracelets. Neither of them's wearing one. Why wouldn't they wear them? Barry asked. Okay, I get Rachel, but Yates, he's never without his tracker. I'll tell you why. Riggs lifted his radio, because they weren't supposed to leave the block. He brought the radio to his mouth. Rach, come in. Rach, where are you? I'm a little busy right now, Riggs," Rachel responded. "We're running." Riggs looked at Fred. "Do you see growlers anywhere? They're completely out of range from any of the scanners we put out." "Nope." "Wait, scratch that." Fred's fingers clicked on the keyboard. "I'm gonna guess this is them." He pointed to the screen and some moving objects. One light was slightly ahead of another, and behind those, eight more tracking lights were pursuing something at a steady pace. They're moving faster than a one-legged man in a butt-kicking contest. That makes no sense. Sure it does if you think about it," Fred replied. "Looks like they're running from a butt-kicking contest. They're being chased. They never run from anything," Riggs said. "It's something fast." Sure looks that way," Fred replied. "Stiffs don't typically move that fast," Barry commented. "If they aren't growlers, what are they?" Riggs peered over his shoulder at Barry. "Kids." For some strange reason, all that ran through Rachel's mind as she ran was the song from the Wizard of Oz, "Follow the Yellow Brick Road," all because Yates had shouted out to follow the Red Brick Road. It was fitting, seeing how they had eight demonic-acting munchkins following them. "Follow the Red Brick Road," Yates said again. "Quit saying that," Rachel spoke. "Why? I keep hearing the munchkins. Well, I think of Elton John." "What?" Rachel asked out of breath. And why haven't they found us? What the hell is the matter with your tracking? I'm not wearing mine," Yates yelled. "What the hell is the matter with you? You challenged me to not use tech this week. That didn't mean your bracelet." Rachel then shrieked, "Red Road's ending. Go left." Yates turned right. "I said left!" Rachel yelled. "We have to find somewhere to climb." "I see." Yates shouted and pointed. As soon as Rachel saw where he pointed, she knew it was the place. Suddenly, all the adrenaline that fueled her, that kept her running like a superhero, all that left. Almost as soon as she saw it, everything drained away. They were half a block from it—a giant black and white cow monument. It was perched on a three-foot pedestal that looked like a little yard, complete with a white picket fence. It looked tall enough, but Rachel didn't realize how tall it was until she watched Yates struggle to get on the cow. Yates was tall. That's when she realized the cow statue was almost twenty feet tall. Rachel hadn't a clue how she would make it up the slick animal. 
She arrived and tried to jump. On her second leap, Yates grabbed her wrists and yanked. Feet sliding along with Yates's pull, Rachel made it on the cow, just as the zombie kids grabbed for her feet. The top of the cow was three feet wide, plenty enough room to sit and be safe. Catch your breath, Yates told her. I don't... I don't... think I can. Yates looked down. Who would have thought we'd be saved by a cow? This is insane. Rachel peered down just as her radio went off. Rach, Riggs said. We think we have you. Oh, good, Rachel replied. You can't miss us. We're sitting on the giant cow. I'm not even going to ask. And Riggs, don't shoot them. Why not? They're still kids, Rachel replied. Tell him to use the net. Fred knows where it is, Yates said. Riggs, use the net, please. Oh, my God, I'm ready to kill you guys. One stop, one night before returning to Center City and you guys put yourself in danger. I'm not going to listen to you, bitch. Putting the radio down now. Rach, don't you... Rachel shut it off. I hope he uses the net. Barry won't let him shoot the kids. Barry isn't our leader, Rachel said. Once again, she peered down to the children. Eight of them. One looked as young as three. They're so hungry. I wonder what we could feed them. Really? Yates asked with sarcasm. You want to feed the dead children? I can't help it. It's the mother in me. That's really twisted. It really wasn't. When Rachel looked at their faces, even though they were dead and some decomposing, they were still children. She could see the bite marks on all but two of them. Her heart ached a little, thinking about how frightened they had to have been, how scared and in pain. Was it someone they knew, trusted, and loved that did that to them? Did they suffer? What's really twisted is, Rachel said, if they wouldn't bite my neck or my hand, I'd want to give them a hug. Oh, my God. Rachel laughed. You realize, you know, you challenged me to a tech-free week, yet here we are waiting for the EPEV. I challenged you, not me. Where are they? Probably getting the net ready or learning how to use it. They don't want to blow it when they get close. We should have told them. Yates paused. Follow the yellow brick road. Rachel groaned. You did that on purpose. Think of yellow brick road, Yates said. First thing that came to my mind was the song Red Dirt Road. Oh, that's a good one. What other songs have red brick or road in them? Brick House, Yates guessed. Little Red Corvette? 99 Red Balloons? Hit the... Road Jack! Rachel snapped her fingers. Take me home, country roads? So fitting since we're going to West Virginia. Oh, oh! Rachel said. Boys to men, end of the road. Yates sighed out. I love that song. Speaking of which, he pointed... The EPEV had turned the corner. They're sitting on a cow, Riggs said with some surprise as he peered out the windshield. They're really sitting on a cow. That's what they said, Barry replied. That's the Minerva Dairy cow, Sandy said. Minerva Dairy made the best butter. Used to be in Minnesota, I think. Riggs looked at her queerly. How do you know that? Sandy shrugged. I don't know, I just do. Is there any way to get a picture of those two? She inched back and aimed her voice. Fred, can you get a picture of those two on that cow? Oh, my God. Riggs closed his eyes. Yep, Fred replied. I can do that. Huffing out, Riggs lifted the radio. Fred, we're stopping. Are you ready with that net? Get me a little closer. I'm on it, Fred said. Say, 20 feet. You heard him, Riggs said to Barry. Barry crept the EPEV closer. Yates cupped his hand around his lighter to block the wind from hitting the flame as he lit a cigarette. Both he and Rachel sat on the large cow, legs dangling over the side as they watched the EPEV painfully roll closer. He reached into his jacket pocket, pulled out a flask, and handed it to Rachel. Thanks, she said, then took a swig, giving it back to him. I wonder how we look to them sitting up here. Rachel shrugged. I don't think they're even thinking about it at all, but this cow is pretty cool. It is. I wish we could put it on top of the EPEV. Yates, as if Rachel said the most offensive thing, looked at her with his mouth opened. Why does that not surprise me that you'd want to trailer up my EPEV? She laughed and looked down. Why are they still going for us? The EPEV's right there. Hey! Yates yelled to the small predators. Look! Look! He pointed to the EPEV. Just like kids, they don't listen. 
She glanced back up when Riggs walked from the EPEV, rifle in hand, and stood in front of the bumper. On the roof of the EPEV, there was a silver tube. It looked like a bottle launcher. Here we go, Yates said and lifted the radio. Fred, you've anchored, right? Not for release? Roger that, Chick-fil-A. Yates moved his mouth in the word, what? It's a cow thing, Rachel replied. You know, eat more meat? No. No, I don't. Riggs's voice carried over the radio. On my call! He then whistled. When he did, the undead children all turned to face him. Riggs waved. He called out, Now! as they all raced his way. Right in the middle, between the cow and Riggs, from the rooftop, a silver tube shot a silver object tied to a line. It was a net made of metal, and it dropped on the eight children. It was so heavy, it knocked them all to the ground. They tried diligently to get up, but only managed to squirm. Yates clapped, then carefully climbed down from the cow. He then helped Rachel. Riggs did not look pleased. Barry didn't look like he was bothered at all when he stepped out. Neither did Fred. Fred looked more amused at the netting over the small undead. Oh, my golly, Fred said. They're in there tighter than feminine protection in a virgin. Really? Yates asked with offended sarcasm. Did we need that? Fred just laughed. Rachel tried to put out that nothing out of the ordinary just happened. Hey, Riggs, thanks. We appreciate this. I know I do. I just couldn't, you know, bring myself to put them down. Riggs nodded with an, mm-hmm. What? Rachel asked. Can I... Can I ask what you two were doing over this way? Riggs questioned. Running, Rachel answered. Technically, Yates said, we weren't this far. We ran that long. The cow saved us. Riggs nodded again. You ran from where? Just, you know, Rachel pointed. Over that way a few blocks. Rach, obviously you guys left the designated area. Can I ask what the hell you were thinking? Jeremiah language, Barry warned. Riggs grumbled. Rach. Well, we wanted to go to the library. It was out of the area, Rachel replied. We wanted to get some movies, get Sandy some books, some music. I wanted to do something tonight to take our mind off of the fact that one year ago today, me, Barry, and a whole lot of other people lost everyone they loved. I get it, Rach. I do. You couldn't tell me? Riggs asked. I wanted it to be a surprise, so I asked Yates to go, Rachel answered. Plus, Riggs... This area was deemed safe. Sweep team markings are everywhere. E's are painted on doors. This place was supposed to be locked and clean. The Eliminator team that came through, Yates said, was the Sly Stallones. Really? Rachel asked. How do you know? I know their markings, Yates said. Bunch of lugheads, if that's even a term. No, Riggs shook his head. I don't think it is. Well, the Sly Stallones, Rachel added, must have locked down all the Kettlers. Kedlers? Riggs asked. Yates raised his hand. That's me. That's the name I gave them. Sort of like the super couple name for kids, dead and toddlers. Kedlers, Riggs repeated. Barry nodded. I like it. I thought it was cool, Rachel said. All the Kedlers were in the library, all of them, and the library was marked with an E. I think whichever Eliminator team came through, the Sly Stallones, like us, they couldn't kill... Not us, Yates interrupted. You. You didn't want to kill them. I had no problem. That is really disturbing, Rachel told him. Anyhow, Riggs, they were there, and I don't think the team in here could put them down, so they locked them in the library, maybe hoping they'd starve off. Speaking of which, Barry nodded down to the Kedlers. What are we going to do about them? Riggs thought for a moment. I know we wanted to stay here. Why don't we just... Why don't we just hit the road and try to get to Center City tonight? Yes! Rachel clenched her fist with excitement. I can't wait to see Casper, but what about them? She pointed down. Let's just get in the e and go, Riggs said. And do like everyone else? Barry asked. Leave them for the next guy? Yes, everyone in, Riggs instructed. You know, Yates stepped forward. If you want, I can take care of them. No, Riggs shook his head. Get in the e -pev. Let's get to home base. I've not been there yet, Yates said. Oh, Rachel walked by him to the EPEV. They have a Starbucks. Best news I've heard all day. Riggs just shook his head. What? Barry asked with a laugh. 
Just thinking. Riggs pointed back with his thumb. And now we're putting Casper back into the mix. Yeah, dead or dead-ish. Having Casper back, Barry genuinely smiled, is gonna be great. Flaming Saffron's Log, April 19th, Day 365. Entry, Barry Bix. It was a bittersweet day. The one-year anniversary. Not quite sure it's the exact day the world began to fall apart, but it was the day my world collapsed. I lost my wife and my son on that same day. Rachel lost her entire family. I never thought we'd heal. Not sure we have just yet. But there is one thing for certain. The Eliminators were my saving grace. Rachel's, too. Although there's not a day that goes by where I don't thank God Jeremiah is still in my life. And like me, Rachel had her godsend as well. It came in the form of a skinny young man who made us smile. Casper. Them two were peas in a pod. The roast beef and cheddar on a Bix Lick Delight. Big Bix Beef was the name of my franchise, in case whoever reads this thing was wondering what the heck that was about. We as Eliminators are a motley crew, and for the longest time, there were the core five of us. Me, Sandy, Jeremiah, Rachel, and Casper. Then Casper, against his own darned advice, did a flying hero move, forgetting he wasn't invincible. While he did get up and shake it off, it wasn't before he had been infected by the virus. The thing is, I thought we lost him. Apparently not. Casper is what our new guy, Yates, keeps calling deadish. While I'm not sure what that means, I'm more than excited to see him again. We were asked to go back to Center City and get him for a test run. Heck, I'll take it. We'll all be together again. We've been through a lot, some of us long before the virus. There's a lot of story packed in the year behind us, and hopefully, a lot more to come. Memories Chapter 2. Tis the Season. Four months earlier. December 24th, Day 249. Elkhart, Indiana. North Sector 1. Oh, yeah! Casper said excitedly, looking down at the map command had given them. We got the Walmart and a bunch of other cool stuff. He turned around, high-fiving Rachel, then offered his hand to Riggs. Riggs just looked at him. Nothing? Casper asked, then turned to Belinda, the newest member that had been with them for three days. Huh? Leaving me hanging? She folded her arms. One of those tough-looking women. In fact, she was. Belinda was a stunt woman for ten years before the virus hit. Bear? Casper offered him his hand. Barry did a half-attempt at a high-five. I'll take it! Casper looked again at the map. Cool! The outline of Elkhart looked somewhat like the state of Texas. It was only the second time in the six-plus months they had been Eliminators that they worked with other Eliminator teams in one location. Elkhart wasn't a raging metropolis, but before the virus, there were 50,000 people living there. Sweep teams had already been through, and chances of seeing the other Eliminator teams were slim, unless they ran into them at the temporary headquarters. Elkhart was important. It was slated to be a survivor city. Can I just say... Barry tapped his finger to the map. I am glad we don't have the housing plan. But we get the Walmart, Casper said excitedly. Why, Riggs faced him, does that matter? Because we want to shop. You mean loot. Riggs asked. Technicality, Casper said. We need stuff. What kind of stuff? Stuff? What kind of stuff? Dude, it's like Christmas Eve. Don't you want to have a present in the morning? Not really. You are such a Scrooge. And you need to step into reality, Casper, Riggs told him. Take a look outside. The world ended. I think we can forget about Christmas. Casper gasped. Dude, that's rude. Forget about Christmas means forgetting about Jesus. You think Jesus forgets about you? Um, yeah, I do. Why? Rachel spoke defensively. Are you picking on him? I'm not picking on Casper, Rach. Why do you always defend his enthusiasm? What's wrong with a little enthusiasm? Riggs huffed. It's the apocalypse. Oh, and we're supposed to always mope? Yes. You're insane, Rachel said. 
He doesn't have to mope. He's not in a measured state of mourning. If he wants to get excited about the Walmart, let him. And, Casper added, we have the superhero museum. Rachel spun to him. No way. We have to go there. Oh, my God. Riggs shook his head. You and him. Belinda, the newbie, spoke up. Why don't you let them go? They're a great team and a great couple. Couple? Riggs laughed. Please, she's almost old enough to be his mother. Rachel turned with a dropped jaw. What? Riggs asked. You are. I mean, you could have had him at 16. Are you saying I'm old? Rachel asked. No, I I'm saying... Riggs sputtered some. Stop while you're ahead, Barry calmly warned. And the age difference means what? Belinda asked. Are you saying a younger man can't be with an older woman? And, may I add, one who clearly doesn't look old enough to be his mother? Oh, my God, Rachel said cheerfully. Thank you for that. Riggs furrowed his brow. I'm not saying an older woman can't date a younger man. I'm saying Rachel doesn't look at him that way. She treats him like a son. Riggs caught Rachel's glare. What, am I wrong? No, I do mother him. See, it's a woman thing. Rachel gasped. You are such a sexist. What? Belinda shook her head. I don't know how you and Sandy put up with this for so long. She and Rachel walked away from the table. What? Riggs asked, confused. Told you. Barry placed his hand on Riggs's back. Quit while you're ahead, but you didn't. You never listen. Casper laughed. Okay, what's so funny? Riggs asked him. You, Casper replied. I just love when everyone twists your words. You get so frustrated, dude. Wouldn't you? No, I wouldn't be insulting women in the first place. Barry chuckled. And could you... Casper pointed to the map. Hurry and assign our streets. Me and Rach want to get some Christmas shopping in. Riggs gave a snide smile. Absolutely. He pulled out his pen and leaned over the map. They were the last to return that first night. Rachel and Casper were on their third radio summons from Riggs when they finally finished their tasks. Taking out the dead wasn't an issue. They only ran into three. Elkhart was different. It was as if Command decided to give Eliminators an easy time for the holidays. The town had been swept by sweep teams twice. They already had houses marked as safe and assigned to each team, which was unusual because they always had to find their own safe house upon arriving in town. Walking down the street, Rachel pulled a wagon full of items while Casper dragged a big green bag. On a positive note, Rachel said, we wouldn't have found this stuff at Walmart. I still can't believe he took Walmart. Maybe he wanted to get us something, Casper laughed. Riggs was being a dick. Okay, I'll give you that. I wonder how it went with him and New Girl today. You think that's why he partnered up with her instead of making her go with Barry? Oh, for sure, Rachel said. He's the lead. She's not said much over the couple days she's been here. He's trying to break the ice. Speaking of ice, Casper stopped and looked. It's snowing. Oh, it is. Rachel raised her face to allow the flakes to fall on her. They weren't falling fast or heavy, but they were clumpy flakes. It's going to get bad. You think? For sure. Look at the sky. It's black. You can't see a star or the moon. And you can smell snow. So it's going to be a white Christmas. Yeah? Rachel nodded. How are you with that? Casper asked. You okay? No. It's hard, Casper. It really is. The only thing that makes it easier is the fact that I don't have to see it everywhere we go. Every television show or movie. I don't have to face it. You think maybe we should scrap the idea? Are you kidding me? Rachel shook her head. No. We went through a lot of stuff to find all these Christmas decorations in that attic. And the tree. No. We're setting it up tonight. It's just being so close to home. I didn't even think of that. I'm sorry. Are we that close? Fifteen miles. Do you want... No. Rachel cut him off. No, I do not. They paused in front of the house. It had to be it. The hum of the generator carried to them. Smoke rose from the chimney and there were lights on. What I want is... I want to go in and set up our Christmas tree. You ever realize no apocalypse show ever has a Christmas special? How cool would that have been? I wonder why that was. Rachel pulled the wagon to the front door. Ready for this? 
Yep, and I'm ready for the usual rigs blasting of, Where have you guys been? Casper reached for and opened the door. The second they stepped in, Riggs rushed to them. Where have you guys been? Rachel lugged in her wagon. It's snowing. She ignored his question. Casper lugged in the large green bag. What is that? Riggs asked. A Christmas tree, Casper answered. We found all kinds of stuff. Swell. Riggs reached around Rachel and shut the door. By all means, then, set it up. Sandy was excited, probably the most out of everyone, and she even cried. She had already planned on making a nice dinner for Christmas Eve, but when Rachel and Casper arrived with the decorations, she delayed dinner to make it even more special, enjoying every second of decorating. Everyone but Riggs. Well, Belinda was there. She didn't do much. Rachel slipped away from the tree-trimming festivities, finding Riggs in the back room behind the kitchen. It was probably a family room before things happened. Riggs sat at a table, a lantern by him for light, as he looked at a map and wrote in a notebook. Using the side of her boot, she knocked on the open doorway. Riggs looked over his shoulder. Hey, I brought you supper and a beverage. You didn't have to do that. Sure I did. She walked in. You didn't seem like you wanted to eat while trimming the tree. I never heard of that tradition, Riggs said. Apparently it was a big one for Sandy's family. She set down the plate in a small, empty spot on the table, then the mug. Riggs sniffed the meal. Is that turkey? He asked of the square slices slathered in gravy. Doesn't look it, but it is, and tasty. Command issue holiday meal kits. Sandy said they dropped it off while we were out. Supposedly there's stuff for breakfast, too. Everyone's getting into this. Not everyone. Rachel pulled out a chair and joined him. Belinda's just sitting there, and you're... in here. Riggs proceeded to fold the map enough to pull his meal forward. I never was a Christmas person. At least, not after I lost my family. I understand that. I'm not in the mood much myself. Could have fooled me. Well, Casper was excited, Rachel said. And, you know, I mother him. I just didn't want to damper his mood. Speaking of Casper, she pointed to the mug. Try that. What is it? Casper's attempt at eggnog. Don't we need real eggs, or did Command send those? Nope. No eggs. Casper's invention. Riggs brought the mug to his nose, smelled, and cringed. Oh my god, it smells like straight bourbon. He sipped it and coughed. It tastes like straight bourbon. God, you're such an amateur. And this is coming from a woman that discovered alcohol in the apocalypse? Whatever works. I'm not a rookie, I just wasn't expecting it. How did he make it? Rachel laughed. Condensed milk, cinnamon, and bourbon. That's not an eggnog recipe. As if you'd know. I would. Riggs set down the mug. I made it every year with Anne, Barry's wife. Really? You don't strike me as the eggnog-making person. And cookies, Riggs shrugged. Just around the holidays, after my family died, Anne went out of her way to try to keep my mind off of things. Even in your bad spell? Riggs laughed. Even then. Were you different before all this? Weren't we all? I guess. So, I realized something, Riggs said. I realized we're close to your home. Rachel puckered her lips some, then slightly lowered her head. Yeah, very close. If you want, I would be happy to go with you if you want to go back to your house. Rachel shook her head. As much as I'd like to get pictures and memorabilia, it's too soon. I need to be in a better place. I'm doing well as long as I'm killing the stiffs. At this point, I think it would do me more harm than good. I get that. It took me a good year before I could go back into the house. Thank you for asking. That's what friends do, right? Right. Rachel nodded. Speaking of friends, did you make any progress with Belinda today? I know there was a reason that you partnered with her. She's not easy. No, Rachel said with a laugh. She's not. She's only been with us three days, though. She's like the, what, third or fourth? We can't hold that position, can we? Nope. But usually they're easy to talk to. I wanted to make headway because I'm tired of replacing that spot. Maybe it's because of how she lost her team, Rachel said. She didn't lose her team, Rach. She left them. Really? That never happens. Did she say why? Riggs shook his head. No, 
A command said she left because she was the only woman and heard we had women on the team. She doesn't act like she wants to be around us. Maybe in time. Did she at least hold a conversation with you? Um, no. Riggs began to eat his meal. He pointed the fork at the plate following his first bite. This isn't bad. No, it's not. So, she didn't engage? I asked her. I even used those words. I said to her to feel free to engage with me at any time. I even... I even told her my story. You never do that. No, I don't. Riggs washed his food down with the bourbon-tainted eggnog. But I thought if I got personal, it would open things up. Did you... Um, tell her your sin and debauchery story? I did. Rachel cringed. What? I know she lost a son and husband. I just thought, sharing grief, you know? Riggs paused. What? What is it? She's not me. No one is. Aren't you cute? But I mean, that stuff doesn't affect me. Hearing how you bedded every woman from one town to the next, washing down the experience with booze and drugs. Oh, stop. Riggs laughed. I did not bed every woman. It was a lot, Barry said. He told me you had a sickness. It was, but it was me trying to bury the hurt. Man, too bad for you there weren't zombies. It's great therapy. Judging by you, I'd say it is. Well, Rachel stood. I'll let you finish your meal. Barry's going to tell a Christmas story if you change your mind. What are you working on, anyhow? Oh, just planning the streets and stuff for tomorrow. Command said no stiff killing on Christmas. Riggs laughed. Like observe not slaughtering the dead for religious reasons? No. Rachel playfully smacked him. A day off for us. You don't have to go out. I will. But the dead don't take the day off. Why should we? Did you... Did you really just say that? I did. I'll go out, Rachel shrugged. It'll be a new tradition. Think about joining us later. I'll think about it. Rachel began to leave. Hey, Rach. She stopped. Merry Christmas. She smiled gently. Merry Christmas, Riggs. Rachel returned to the festivities in the living room. She also wanted to monitor the snow. It was going to be interesting. No snow plows, no removal. It was the first time they'd hunt the dead in snow, and the demented side of her looked forward to it. Chapter 3. Frosty. December 25th, day 250. A blizzard blew in some time during the early morning hours. The house grew cold, prompting Barry to kick the fire into overdrive. Everyone wore their coats and gloves until the house warmed up. Barry sat there watching everyone open the little gifts that Rachel and Casper handed out. He thought about the first Christmas Jeremiah joined his family for the celebration. He remembered the day Jeremiah was born, having lived next door to his grandmother, Jane. Jane was so proud of her first grandchild. She always had him over, babysitting, spending nights. Jane was a young grandmother and a young widow, not much older than forty, and Jeremiah became her life. He then became her purpose when his parents were killed. He wasn't even two when that happened. Jane never told him what happened to them, and Jeremiah never asked. Barry was always prepared to tell him if he did question the death of his parents. It was tough on Jane losing her daughter like that. It would be tough on Jeremiah no matter how many years had passed. His father was an investment broker, young and eager. Apparently, someone lost a lot of money because of the elder Jeremiah Riggs. It was a home invasion that took his parents' life. His father, the intended target. They were brutally murdered, all while Jeremiah slept in a crib. He climbed out of his crib the next morning, and the police found him sitting by his mother's body. The neighbor in the next townhouse called the police when she heard the baby screaming, Mama, over and over. She never went over to check. Jeremiah was a tragic story. Barry tried to bring him into his family's fold. He and his grandmother never missed a holiday dinner or barbecue. Barry's son, Len, and he were inseparable. He looked at Jeremiah with such gratefulness. He always looked at him like a son, and at that moment, he was so happy he still had him. Riggs was the last one to open his gift. Barry had already put on the cardigan sweater that not only still had the tags on it, 
It was in a Christmas bag left over from the previous year. Casper said it was in a closet, either a gift someone didn't want or one they never gave out. Riggs's gift was small, and he lifted it up. Wow, this is a unique keychain. Casper nodded. Dude, it is. It's like the mini Swiss Army knife for personal stuff. Bottle opener, nail file, baby screwdriver. He stood up. Tiny knife. You never know when you're going to need it. Thank you guys very much. I feel bad I don't have anything to give you. It's not about getting them, Casper said. Seriously, it was fun just looking for things. He walked to the window. Hey guys, we have Christmas company. Barry turned around. Command or another Eliminator team? Neither, replied Casper. Even better. It was like nothing they had expected to see. From the window of the house, it was the words to the song White Christmas. No threat could be seen by anyone. In fact, at first glance, no one saw anything. They all argued with Casper. Ha ha, Belinda said. Very funny. Casper, Sandy said, there's nothing out there. Look. I'm looking, Barry told him. I won't look much longer or all I'll see is green when I turn around. Everyone, grab your coats. Casper walked to the chair where his coat hung. He put it on and handed Rachel hers. You're really going out there with him? Riggs asked. Casper doesn't prank me. Rachel put on her coat. Oh, wait, Barry said. I see. Oh, my goodness, I have to get a closer look. Riggs hurried to the window. I still don't see... Oh, shit. Language, Barry scolded. Riggs scoffed and grabbed his coat. Sandy and Belinda were the last to jump on board the bandwagon, and they followed Casper outside. At least two and a half feet of snow had fallen. It blanketed the entire area, white and perfect, a sweeping snow glistening from the morning sun. In fact, it was what Casper would call virgin snow. It would have been picture perfect had it not been for the undead. There were twenty of them, and they came from somewhere close. That was what Casper figured. They couldn't have been far, and had it not snowed, they would have been in trouble. They herded close, in a dangerous formation. They were fast ones. Casper could tell by the way they waved their arms, reaching, or more like swimming in the air. Not a single one of them moved forward. They couldn't. They were covered with a thin layer of snow on their heads, all of them sticking out of the cold white substance like snow bunnies. The undead at some point in the night became human snow plows, pushing through the snow, moving it forward until each of them had created a barricade wall for themselves. It was such a spectacle, Casper laughed hard. It had a deadened sound to it, acoustically muffled by the snow, but it reached the dead because they all started groaning. This is too fucking funny, Casper said. Riggs looked at Barry. Not going to yell at him about language? Casper language. Casper turned to Riggs. Dude, you are such a tattletale. He spun in the snow. Rach, have you ever seen or read anything like this? Never. This is a first, she replied. I think the closest thing I saw was a zombie tornado, which was entirely unbelievable, but cool. Visually cool for television. I need to see where they came from. It's a lot. Casper said. Too big of a horde for the sweep teams to miss. They had to have been placed somewhere. Rachel snapped her finger. Like Herschel's barn. Exactly. Wait, Riggs said. Who's Herschel and why did he have people in the barn? They were family and friends, Casper replied. One was even his wife. He couldn't bring himself to admit they were the walking dead. He thought they were sick or something. Did he not watch the news? Riggs asked. Yeah, but the news was calling it a virus. Casper replied. Rachel added, He was a good man, really good, a Christian man. His family loved him, but Shane opened the barn and shot them all. I like Shane, Casper said. Dude, you know, if he wouldn't have died, they would have found that prison in a week. I know, they walked around in circles. Rachel waved her arm. For what, seven months? Stop, Riggs held up his hand. Why don't I remember meeting this Herschel? Did you guys meet him at command or something? Casper snickered, reached out, and gave a swat to Riggs. It was a TV show. Oh, Riggs grunted. I hate when you guys do that. Let's go see where they came from. TV show or not, you have a point. 
It stunk as bad as the dead, and Riggs wasn't genuinely bothered by it. It was evident that Casper's theory was right. An old detached garage a block and a half up the street was the starting point for the mob. It set in the backyard of a home. The double, wooden, barn-style doors were open, one of them broken. Riggs felt the wood. It was old and must have gotten damp when the temperature dropped. It froze, making it easier to break. In a dead, silent night, the sound of the generator carried, maybe even voices, he wasn't sure, but they broke through. Just like Herschel's barn, they had been in there a while. Bones of animals scattered about, old memorabilia like pictures and toys, items placed in there with the dead. There were two remaining in there. They wriggled without lower limbs, barely able to inch forward, belly crawling their way to Riggs and Casper, arms reaching out. Casper raised his honing rod above the head of the one. It crunched. Wow, that wasn't easy, Casper said. It was like stabbing frozen meat. So they won't decay. Not while winter's here, Riggs stated. Not up north. Casper put down the other one. Basically, the winter gave them extended life. Swell. You know, if it weren't so cold, they would have swarmed the house. They were coming our way. I know. Let's go back and take them down. Casper headed out of the garage. And Casp, really, I'm sorry I didn't get you a Christmas present. No, but Santa did. What? Riggs chuckled. The stiffs in the snow, like Frosty the freaking dead man. Riggs just shook his head with a smile. And like the song goes, the sun's hot today. Casper returned the smile. Let's go before they melt away. Rachel had been up close to the dead before, close enough to smell how foul their breath was, how a sour iron odor emanated from them. But in all the months she had been taking them down, it was the first time she could stand so close and truly get a good examining look. Despite Casper's Frosty the Snowman warning about the sun, Rachel knew better. She lived in the area. It was cold, at least below 32, and while the sun would melt the snow, it would only cause it to get hard like ice, making it more difficult for the dead to move. She inched close to the woman's stiff. Her arms were frozen, barely moving, and two of her fingers had broken off. The dead woman looked to be about 30. Her hair was long and brown. Blood had matted it along with dirt. She could see chunks of something in her hair, but the snow and ice mixed in, giving her a weird Game of Thrones White Walker appearance. The color portion of her eyes were a milky gray with no pupils whatsoever. The whites had a strange blue tint. Her face had decomposed some, not much, parts of flesh peeling back on the bony portions of her face. Her neck was the source of her infection, a gaping hole right over where the jugular would be. The dead woman's mouth moved in a chewing motion, like those people Rachel's father said used to chew gum like a cow. Her teeth were impeccably perfect. It looked like veneers. Strange the things Rachel noticed being so close. She was dressed in a t-shirt and jeans, probably just going about her day when she was attacked. Rachel had heard from so many about how fast the virus hit and how rapidly it spread and took lives. Did this woman know? Was she scared? Did she have a family and were they mourning the loss of her? She believed so. Someone that knew her and loved her put her in that garage. Rachel hated the dead woman. She didn't know her name or anything about her, but she was one of them. One of the types of creatures that ripped her daughter from her grip. Senseless, mindless, murderous beings. Rach! Riggs called her name. Rachel jumped. You gonna take that thing down? Yeah. I was just looking. Why? Because I can. Without saying another word, almost as soon as she finished her sentence, Rachel shoved her honing rod under the woman's chin, aiming it toward the back of her head. The woman stopped moving. She didn't drop. Her head just fell back in an unnatural tilt. Almost seems too easy, Rachel said. That's because it is. It's like a team-building exercise. Only, did you notice which team member isn't joining us? Sandy? Rachel guessed. Sandy never joins us. Belinda went inside with Sandy. Maybe they're making breakfast. Maybe, Riggs replied. Let's finish these off. We should actually test our skills, Rachel suggested. Rach, I don't think you have a single skill that needs to be tested. Aren't you sweet? 
Rachel moved to another one. Did you contact command? I did. I told them about this. What did they say? Rachel asked. To let them know when we're done. Who knows what they'll do, if anything. Probably just tell us what to do. Nothing we can do with all this snow. Rachel stopped at the undead man. He was larger, heavier. He wore a dress shirt that was ripped apart. None of these looked like virus victims. They were all bit, but the neighborhood cared enough about them to herschel them. After staring down the undead man, she put him down the same way she did the woman. Kind of mind-boggling. What is? If you think about it, every one of these stiffs, everyone we see, fight, kill, they were all someone's child. They were someone's mom, father, husband, wife. They were people, Riggs, like you and I. You never thought like that before? Riggs asked. If I did, I don't remember. To me, they've always been monsters. Do you feel differently now? No. Rachel shook her head. They may have been someone's child at one time, but they're monsters now. She allowed Riggs to take down the next one frozen there, and together they moved on. It didn't take much or long to eliminate the undead snowbound on the street. After warming up and eating, they began to head out, and the question of how command would handle the frozen snow bunny dead was answered. They handled it like a dystopian movie from the 70s. A big dump truck with a scooper on it not only plowed the street, it plowed and lifted the dead, tossing them in the back end of the truck, much like the riot garbage truck in the old classic Soylent Green. Scooping up the bodies, tossing them in the back, Another similarity of how life imitated art. In all the fictional apocalypse tales that Rachel encountered in her life beforehand, as far-fetched as they seemed at times, there wasn't a single one of them that didn't get something spot-on correct. Chapter 4. Unit. January 6th, Day 261. It was by far the fastest elimination stop they had made. If it weren't for the snow, Riggs figured they'd have been done two days earlier. Then again, the snow made the eliminations easy. Command had the roads pretty clear, and the temperature increase made them passable. He pulled the RV to the temporary command post to hand over his reports and get their next assignments. He didn't say much to the others, but he was hoping for something south— even if it meant a long drive there and a stop at another temporary command. It was only two weeks, but he was over the snow. As usual, command was set up in a school, the check-in table right in the main hallway, and he walked up to the woman there with the reports. E-Team Division 1, Unit 4. He handed her the reports. Team name? We don't have one. We're working on it. It's been eight months. Yeah, I know, but it has to be something we can live with. We don't want it to divide us. Riggs said. Unit 4, Unit 4. She nodded and pulled forth a small slip of paper. Where's the rest of your team right now? Well, Barry and Sandy are at medical supply. Casper's at food. I think maybe Rachel and Belinda are there. Not sure. They might be doing girl things. She cleared her throat. Okay, we'll find them. You'll get your assignment after you get a new team member. As of now, you have to go see the inspector, Ralph Conway. Wait, what? A new team member? That's what the note says, and to see Mr. Conway. Who's that? Riggs asked. The inspector. Of? Internal Affairs. Riggs was shocked. I have to go to Internal Affairs? Right down the hall, she pointed. Do you know why? She held up the paper. Do you think this little slip of paper tells me that? No. You can't miss his office. It's the guidance counselor room. Internal Affairs? Riggs walked to the office but couldn't figure out why he had to be there. His mind raced as he walked there. He poked his head in and looked. No one was there. Oh, good, you're here first, the male voice said. Riggs, I take it? Yes. Have a seat. He walked in the office and stepped behind a desk, taking a seat. We're waiting on Rachel and... Casper, is it? I suppose. What's going on? Riggs asked. The man clearly wasn't military. He wore a button-down dress shirt, had a neatly trimmed beard, and just something about him screamed to Riggs that he was some sort of attorney before the virus. "'We are replacing a team member due to complaints of a serious nature,' Conway said. 
Oh, my God. Who complained? I can't tell you that. Can you tell me what the complaints are? Riggs requested. Sexual innuendos, sexual harassment, bigotry, bullying, aggression, misogynism. Riggs groaned out, sitting back and shaking his head. Look, I know Casper can be annoying, but he didn't mean anything by it. What are you talking about? Conway asked. Isn't it Casper the complaints were directed against? Isn't he the one you're replacing? No, Riggs. It's you. Before Riggs could even shake off his shock enough to be surprised, he heard Casper's voice. Oh, we're in trouble, Casper said jokingly. Look, Rach, we're called to the principal's office. It's the counselor's office, Rachel said. They're trying to thwart trouble. She was smiling, and the smile dropped from her face when she saw Riggs. What's wrong? Riggs widened his eyes. He couldn't speak. He literally couldn't talk. A lump formed in his throat. Have a seat, Conway directed. Casper sat down. Uh-oh. Rachel sat on the other side of Riggs. Someone has filed a serious complaint against Commander Riggs, Conway said. Someone meaning someone on our team? Rachel asked. Yes. Well, that's an easy deduction. It isn't me or Casper, Rachel said. Barry is like your dad, and Sandy would never say anything about you, I don't think. Would she, Casper? Nah, Sandy's cool, Casper said. What's the complaint? Complaints, plural, Conway replied. Sexual innuendos, sexual harassment, bigotry, misogynism, bullying, and aggression. Fucking Belinda, Rachel stood up. I'm finding her and kicking her ass. Rach, sit down, Riggs said. No, what the fuck, Riggs? I don't care how big she is or tough. She's going to hear it from me, Rach. Riggs grabbed her arm. Please sit. That, Conway pointed at Riggs, is exactly the type of thing that is in the report. Get your hand off her, Riggs. Riggs removed his hand. Rachel grabbed it and placed it back on her arm and sat down. This is bullshit. We're one of the best teams you have. Are you saying none of these are true? Conway asked. I'm saying exactly that, Rachel said. So, Conway looked down to the report. Riggs doesn't tell you how to do your hair? Rachel laughed. He says to pull it up so a stiff doesn't grab it. You can't count that. If I worked at McDonald's, they'd tell me to pull up my hair. Next, he refuses to let Sandy fight and orders her to cook and clean. Another laugh from Rachel. Sandy wants to cook and clean, and she's 70. She doesn't want to fight. Rachel shook her head. Next, forced a Christmas celebration? Ha! Casper barked. Wrong. Riggs hates Christmas. That was everyone else. What was the big deal? She's Jewish. Oh. Rachel waved out her hand. What else? Conway read. Stated, and I quote, Break out the bikes. We have three chicks now. They're going to cycle together. Riggs brought his hand to his face. Rachel asked, how can you read that with a straight face? That wasn't Riggs. She pointed to Casper. Casper raised his hand. Me. And I thought it was funny. Was it also you, or was it Riggs who demeaned a woman for being postmenopausal? Me again, Casper said. But it wasn't demeaning. It was educational. Yeah, Rachel added. How about he had no idea women stopped getting periods and went into menopause? Dude, Casper said. They sweat, get hot flashes, and gain weight. It sucks. I told Sandy I feel bad for her. Did you know that? Yes, Casper, I knew that, Conway replied. What about Riggs boasting about his sexual prowess and then asking her to engage? Rachel reached over and smacked Riggs gently. I told you that you shouldn't have shared your sordid past, did I? Ass. She looked at Conway. He was sharing his past with her in hopes to get her to talk, or... Engage, as he put it, not engage sexually. Why would he wait eight months to hit on someone on the team? Have you seen her? Conway said. She's beautiful. As if Rachel's not, Casper asked. I'm just saying Belinda is beautiful. Oh, my God, Rachel gasped. You're more of a sexist than Riggs. So, he's a sexist. No, I was just saying that, Rachel defended, and he doesn't bully anyone? Well... That's true, Rachel said. Thanks, Riggs grumbled. But only Casper, and it's only to keep him in line. I defend him, that's fine. I'm sorry, Conway said. These accusations are serious. 
Then kick her off the team, Rachel said. Get us someone new, because if Riggs goes, I go. Rach, you don't have to do that, Riggs said. I do. I will. So will Barry, and you know Sandy only hangs around because it's us. And if Casper doesn't quit, it's only because he wants to stick around and bug the fuck out of Belinda. So there you have it, Mr. Conway. Find a new member or find a new team. Riggs reached over and squeezed her arm. As much as I'd like to stick around and bug Belinda, Casper added, I leave with them, too. Doesn't matter where we are, dude. We aren't just a team. We're a family. And one way or another, he said, we will always be together. Getting the Band Back Together Chapter 5. Home Base Present Day, April 20th, Day 366 Flaming Saffrons! The guard at the bridge greeted them as they pulled up. Welcome back. Nice rig. Is this the EPEV-1? Wait, what? Yates, upon hearing that, rushed up front and leaned over Barry to the driver's window. What exactly do you mean, EPEV-1? It's the original one. It's the only one, Yates replied. Well, the guard winced. Not exactly. There are two more models launching next month. Are you fucking kidding me? It's my patent! Sit down, Yates, Barry told him. Now, please, we will deal with this. Fine. Yates stormed back to his seat. Can you believe they stole my design? I'd be pissed, Rachel said. I am. Rach. Riggs looked back as they started to drive again. Can you not instigate? It's not instigating, it's agreeing. It's his design, his patent. In the apocalypse, Riggs argued. And that makes thievery any better? Rachel asked. Fred shook his head. Them stealing that is as wrong as a left hand is right. Yates blinked several times quickly, looking at Fred. Okay, if you're gonna defend me, can you not do so with the country bumpkin phrases that no one gets or ever heard? Absolutely. I'll stop doing that when you stop being meaner than a wet panther. And what does that mean? Yates asked. Why exactly does a wet panther get mean? Is there some sort of zoological reasoning for that? I hate him, Fred replied. Rachel laughed. Riggs looked back again. Okay, so first stop is to see Liz, then she'll tell us what exactly we're going to be doing after that. With Casper? With, well, whatever, Riggs replied. We should go see Penny, Sandy said. It'll be nice to stop and see her, say hello. You know, this whole Casper thing from a doctor's perspective has me fascinated. I thought Casper donated his body to be studied when he turned. He did, Rachel said. But Casper's heart is still beating, although slow. He's breathing, although not much, and his brain is firing. Dr. Stevens has been giving him therapeutic injections, and he seems to be coming back. Riggs scoffed. Rach, you can't bring someone back from the dead. But technically, Casper never died, Rachel argued. So really, it's helping him be more alive. He was rotting, Riggs. Technically, he never died? Yates asked. I bet I know what happened. There was this author, David Wellington. Monster series. Fred added. Yes, Yates nodded. Monster Island, Monster Nation, Monster Planet. Anyhow, he theorized that if a person is fed oxygen when they died or turned, kept at a lower body temp, that they never really die when they turn. They stay alive, something like that. Fred snapped his finger. Cognizant. It kept them cognizant. You're right, Yates. But it's something like that. Casper was in a hospital setting, right? Probably had him hooked up to all kinds of machines when he turned. And whatever this doctor's given him is healing him. Can you imagine? Yates asked. If Casper was cognizant and they didn't know, and it took time for him to fight through the physical challenges to be able to get him to a point that they want us to bring him along. He would have heard and understood everything everyone said and did, Fred said. And he couldn't have said a word. Do you guys think that's it? Rachel asked. Yates nodded. It's the only scientific thing I can think of. Sandy, what do you think? If he never technically died and the brain didn't die, you're onto something, Sandy replied. Guys, Riggs said. I'm sorry, Rach. Casper isn't there, okay? Not the way you think. He's like a parrot, only mocking what he sees and hears. Only a small portion of his brain is working, and it's only memory and reaction. You're wrong, Rachel said. Why else would they want us to bring him? 
Not because he's back. Because he's a trainable, for lack of a better word, zombie, Riggs replied. Sorry, guys. As much as you want it, Casper isn't going to be the same Casper. Not at all. Dude! His words were slow, but Casper knew what he wanted to say. He just had a hard time getting the words out. Sometimes it came out as a stutter. Other times the words dragged. Dr. Stevens knew this. I have to interrupt, but if you want to continue to play video games, you need to have your daily injection. He held up the syringe. How's the game going? Casper nodded. He placed the needle to Casper's flesh. Did you feel that? S um. Good. Return of nerves. Before you know it, you'll almost be the same. You can still infect people, though, those not immune. What? When? Stevens asked. Maybe six months at the longest. Uh, 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 d dude. I know. All done. Carry on with the game. Rachel. Today, my friend. Today. So sweet. Not as sweet as the news she's going to give you. Have fun, my friend. Dr. Stevens smiled at Casper. The sounds of video game music and noise played as Stevens left the room. Once out in the hall, he looked through the observation window. He watched Casper with the game controller in his hands. His dexterity was the one thing Dr. Stevens worried would not come back. But it did. He was confident that perhaps Casper could be almost normal. He didn't look normal. In fact, his coloring wasn't dead-looking, but it was far from healthy. His eyes remained their normal shade of blue, but his complexion was so pale he looked like a terminally ill patient. In the months since Casper's accident, Dr. Stevens had tried several times to recreate what he did with Casper, trying to stop others from going over the edge. Problem was, he got them too late. He needed to have them the moment they turned, which was nearly impossible considering he saw very few bites and most people opted to lose a limb. But the truth was, he didn't quite remember, and until he did, Casper would remain an anomaly. This is new, Barry said, just as they entered the perimeter of Center City. Another checkpoint. I guess Liz is invoking new rules, Riggs said. A small orange fence was set up, one of those plastic ones. From what Barry could see, they weren't military. At least they weren't dressed that way. They all wore black t-shirts, and most had on blue jeans. All of them were armed. When they stopped, one of the security men knocked on the door. Riggs opened it. Afternoon, folks. We need you to step out. Everything okay? Riggs asked. We're eliminators. We know that. But everyone, even eliminators, have to be screened. Just a precaution. Against? Riggs questioned. The virus. Wow. We were here six weeks ago. Was there an outbreak? Since opening the border to folks, we've had some small incidents. Nothing that can't be handled. Then, absolutely, we'll step out. Riggs stood and turned around. Okay, guys, we just need to step out a moment. Riggs was the first out, followed by Barry. As soon as they stepped out of the EPEV, they saw two of the security holding dogs. They were German shepherds. If I can just get you folks to line up and then you'll be on your way, the security man said. Are they drug-sniffing dogs? Riggs asked. No, sir, virus-sniffing dogs. Just a precaution. They lined up. Riggs, then Rachel, Sandy, Yates, Barry and then Fred. At first, the security man scanned each of their foreheads for a fever. When he was satisfied, he stepped back, and then another man brought forth a dog. Were the outbreaks bad? Riggs asked. They're popping up everywhere, the security guard said. Until there's a cure, we're going to have that. We just all have to be vigilant. Eventually, we'll eliminate it. I agree, Riggs said. The dog moved closer to Riggs. It brought its nose to Riggs's shoes, then to his shins. Riggs started feeling nervous about it. The dog spent what seemed like a lot of time on him. He had drug dogs sniff him, and it didn't take nearly as long. You're good, the guard said, moving to Rachel. After a minute, he dismissed her, then Sandy. The dog seemed to snub Yates. Come on, boy, give him a whiff, the guard encouraged. Maybe it's my cologne, Yates said. You wear cologne and fight zombies? I don't fight zombies, I kill zombies, Yates replied. 
And yes, I wear cologne. Do you know how bad those things smell? It's like fried food. It sticks on you. I just wish others realized that. He turned his head and looked Riggs and Rachel's way. Which one of us is he implying smells? Riggs asked Rachel. Probably you. He'd tell me. You're good, the guard told Yates. You do know having a virus-sniffing dog isn't a good idea. They aren't immune to the virus. And have you ever seen what happens to them when they get infected? No. I hope you never do. Yates walked away. He approached Rachel with a low voice. Virus-sniffing dogs. It's just a recipe for disaster. They won't know how to handle it. Do we know if someone bit by a growler gets infected? Rachel asked. Yates shook his head. There's usually nothing left. He stepped on the EPEV. Riggs was ready to board and turned when Barry was told he was good. Just as he did, he heard the dog go nuts, barking like mad, growling as if he sensed danger. It showed its teeth, neck extended, ready to tear into Fred. It happened so fast. Yates flew out of the EPEV, hand on his pistol. The barking dog caused the other to go just as insane. The guard holding the second dog wasn't ready for the animal's reaction, and the leash slipped from his hand. The dog raged forward. Riggs saw through the corner of his eye Yates raising his gun. Fred didn't run. He didn't have time. Barry backtracked quickly, perhaps to stop the dog, but the dog had no interest in him. His idea was a good one, but it didn't execute as Barry hoped. In an attempt to halt the animal, Barry moved forward, slamming his foot on the leash. It slowed the animal for a second until it lunged, and when it did, it caused Barry to flip up in the air. It was apparent he tried to stop his own fall, only to slam down with his legs collapsing under him. Fred would have been a dead man had Yates not fired. The animal went down with a yelp just before it attacked Fred. The gun going off was too close to Riggs's ear. He pushed his forefinger to his ear, pressing against the tragus in an attempt to lessen the painful ringing that entailed. Riggs opened his mouth wide, an automatic response to what was happening with his hearing. He could see the guard, red-faced, yelling something at Yates. Sandy ran to Barry. Rachel grabbed Riggs. Her words were muffled, but he could tell she was asking, Are you okay? Riggs nodded. The pain stopped, but the ringing wasn't going away any time soon. Why didn't you... Her words faded, but her mouth moved. What? Riggs yelled. Why didn't you block your ears? Rachel shouted. I knew he was going to shoot. You had to see that. I don't know. It cleared up enough for him to make out the shouting. What the fuck, asshole? You shot the dog! The guard yelled at Yates. I nipped him in the ass, Yates yelled back. He's fine. I was stopping him. You could have killed him. No, I'm too good. If I wanted to kill him, I would have. It was then Riggs saw Barry was still on the ground with Sandy by him. He rushed over. Barry lay there, propped up by his elbows, and he looked as if he were struggling. Barry, are you okay? I, you, ah, uh, me. What? I said, why are you yelling at me? Barry shouted at his loudest, then red-faced. He cringed. Son of a bitch! I heard that! Riggs shouted. What's wrong? Sandy looked over her shoulder. He couldn't hear a word that came from her. What? She shook her head. Then Riggs read her lips. With her soft-spoken nature, even yelling made her words inaudible to him. But he knew what she was saying. Call for help! He didn't know what, but Barry had broken something. Chapter 6 From All Sides Rachel's head spun. All she wanted to do was meet with Dr. Stevens and discuss Casper, yet there she was, in the aftermath of the check-in gate, playing acting leader, which she was by default. According to team rank, she was third, and since Barry was injured and Riggs was labeled injured because he couldn't really hear anything, it fell on Rachel. There were three situations she had to deal with. Yates's insubordination, Fred, because they took him before they could do anything, and Barry. She delegated the issues that she couldn't handle on her own and which ones she wanted support with. Fred's situation she did not want to face alone, mainly because she had no idea what was going on. Barry's wasn't too serious, at least she didn't think so, and that ranked at the bottom. Yates was first.
He was detained at once in what was called Charleston, West Virginia South Regional Jail. He was basically arrested right away, on scene, and taken in handcuffs. That was just about the same time they took Fred, and an ambulance showed up for Barry. Insanity. She was able to get a hold of Liz, who put a call into Sheriff Norton, a longtime resident of Charleston, who now ran the corrections division. There were eight prisoners in all, so Rachel figured he was pretty excited to get another. A corrections officer was on duty. He was pretty laid back, and when Rachel told him who she was there about, he laughed. Oh, the guy that keeps bitching about his patent being stolen, and that's the reason he's here? That's the one, Rachel said. You would think he has bigger fish to fry, the officer said. He shot a dog. He nipped a dog. Same difference. I beg to differ. The dog was going after an infected. See, that's where you're wrong, Rachel said. Fred was tested for immunities. We all are as eliminators, so your dogs were wrong. Not my dogs. I don't give a shit. Good. So when does Sheriff Norton get back? Rachel asked. Soon. He just went to Starbucks. You want to see your friend? Am I allowed? He shrugged. I guess, I don't know. No one ever comes to see these guys. He reached to a control panel on the counter before him. The door buzzed. Last cell on the right. I'll let the sheriff know you're here when he gets back. Thanks. Rachel opened the door and walked to the back. She walked by the first cell. The inmates stood up, but said nothing. She kept a steady pace, hoping the men, and from what she saw, one woman, wouldn't do that holler-out catcall thing she saw in movies. It was a long hallway, lots of old-fashioned cells. The inmates were spaced out. She just wanted to get to Yates. "'Hey, yo, babe!' called the deep, booming male voice. Rachel stopped and looked. "'Babe?' "'Sorry. Eliminator chick.' "'Chick!' The man in the cell emerged forward. "'Woman?' Oh, my God. He grabbed onto the bars. He was big, really big, with long, dark hair. His arms were heavily tattooed and muscular. He looked as if he could have been a biker at one time. He just looked rough. Hey, I'm an eliminator, too. I'm sure. No, I am, see? He wore overalls that were down to his waist and tied with his sleeves. He lifted one of the sleeves to show an E. Rachel! Yates called out. Excuse me. She held up a finger to him. No, he yelled. Get me out of here. She took a few steps and stopped. Why exactly are you in here? Rachel, Yates called out. You aren't going to believe anything he says, are you? Shh, Rachel told Yates. I put down a FUD. I'm sorry, a what? FUD. Fucked up dead thing. Sorry, he said. My name for them. A stiff? He laughed. Oh, my God, such a Disney name for them. Yeah, well, we're not all R-rated. Rach, stop talking to Lunk, Yates hollered. I'll be right there, Rachel said. So tell me, Lunk. That's not my name. I don't care. Why, if you put down a stiff, are you in here? If you're an eliminator, that's what we do. I know, exactly, right, he said. It's illegal in Center City. It's illegal to put down the dead, Rachel asked. Yeah. You have to incapacitate them and take them to the peace center. That's absurd. I know, right? He said. We eliminate. That's our job. I came here for R&R &R and I think I'm doing good. I get arrested. Nice hair. Thanks. What happened to your team? I was supposed to get reassigned. We got hit pretty bad by marauders. Two of us were left. He decided to quit. Team name? Rachel asked. Gorillas, he replied. Not gorillas as in... He proceeded to imitate an ape, complete with sounds. Gorillas, as in, I get it. Rach! Yates called out. Can you please stop talking to him? Well, it was nice meeting you, Mr. Lunk. He laughed. That's not my name. I'll stick with knowing you as Lunk. Rachel walked away and to Yates. Hello, Yates said, holding onto the bars. Please tell me you're here to get me out. I'm here to try. Oh, Lunk hollered. Can you get me out, too? Yates replied. No! Shut up! He exhaled. How's the dog, Rach? Fine. It was just a scratch. The bullet only grazed him. Oh, man! Shouted Lunk. You shot a dog? That's so wrong. Shut the fuck up! Yates told him. Good thing you're in here or I'd put you down. It's not easy, 
he replied. Rachel snickered. It's not funny, Yates said. He's driving me nuts. Yates, you've been in here for like an hour. It seems like a lifetime. Rachel turned when she heard the door open from down the hall. The sheriff walked in. He wore a cowboy hat, blue jeans, and a blue T-shirt, all while sipping a pink Starbucks. He wasn't old, not at all, and not anything like she depicted. Rachel, the sheriff approached. I am. Are you the flame and saffron commander? he asked. Acting commander, our commander is temporarily incapacitated right now. I see. What can I do for you? I need him out, Rachel pointed to Yates. He shot a dog. He nipped a dog, Rachel corrected. Only because he missed. Rachel stifled a laugh. No, if he wanted to kill the dog, he would have. Trust me, it's what we do. Hit moving targets dead on. No pun intended. Still, he willfully shot at an animal. A government animal. I get that, Rachel said. I really do, but... Wow. She tilted her head. Do you work out? Rach, Yates scolded. Are you flirting? Why would you flirt? That's not you. She's flirting? Lunk asked. I thought she was gay with that hair. We all did, Yates said. Will you stop? Rachel blasted at Yates, then spun nicely to Sheriff Norton. So, as I was saying... As nice as the compliment is, Norton said. Yes, I do work out. The flirting won't work. Married? Rachel asked. Yes, and gay. Oh, okay. Anyhow, Rachel said, I need him out. Yes, it may have seemed intentional, but as you know, we are eliminators. And right now he suffers from PZSD. Don't we all? Well, you know, eliminators more than anyone, Rachel said. Plus, him and I, not that long ago, we were taken prisoners by these marauders. Taken hostage, put in a gladiator-style fight, and made to fight against growlers. Do you know what growlers are? Norton nodded. I've never seen them, but I have heard. Yeah, well, five of them. Whoa, Lunk commented. Did you win? Obviously, you idiot, Yates shouted. Rachel waved her hand out to Yates to shush. So you see, Sheriff... We just came off of that, not even two months ago, and I think he saw that dog, heard the growl, and just went into defensive mode. Makes sense. Yes. So, can you let him go? I really need him. Okay. Norton shrugged and walked by her to Yates's cell. Just like that? Rachel asked. Really? Yeah. I hate those virus dogs. They get things wrong all the time. I can't tell you how many non-infected people they've bitten. He slid a card down a card lock and opened Yates's cell. You're free to go. So, no judge? No hearing? Yates asked. I'm the judge until that gets sorted out. Go. Good luck in whatever you do. Thank you, said Yates. And, uh, thank you guys for what you do. Rachel nodded and walked with Yates. What about me? Lunk asked as they walked by. You're on your own, Yates told him. Bye. Nice being your cellmate. They got to the end of the hall, and Yates opened the door for Rachel. That was easier than I thought. Tell me about it. What now? Yates asked. Fred, we need to find out what's going on with Fred. It has to be a mistake, Yates said. Happens a lot, according to the sheriff. That is exactly what I am thinking. Fred's an eliminator. He's been tested for immunity, Rachel said. It has to be wrong. For as normal and pre-virus the world of Charleston appeared, there was something odd about it. Maybe it was just the fact that it still existed as an organized civilization in a world that was torn apart by the undead. People moved about, walking, talking, working jobs. She could see them in diners and cafes, laughing and eating as if nothing ever happened. Granted, it had been a year, but surely they carried emotional scars. Everyone lost someone. From the high-tech science labs of Dr. Stevens to the grand opening of the second Starbucks, it just didn't make sense. Something was off. There were rules and regulations that were just odd for the times, like it was illegal to kill a zombie. That was assuming that Lunk was telling the truth. Rachel guessed there were more of those strange laws than she cared to know about. They had to spend two weeks in Center City before heading off to save the missing Eliminator teams. 
Rachel was so wrapped up in Casper, she didn't pay attention to Charleston, except, of course, the Starbucks. It wasn't easy finding out what they did with Fred. At first, she feared they had killed him. Then she remembered Lunk was in jail for taking out a zombie. If that were true, then there was no way they killed Fred based on a bad nose by a temperamental dog. They went back to the check-in point and had no luck. Rachel even thought about Barry and checking on him when they passed the hospital where she knew he was, but she decided to find Fred. She was sure Barry was in good hands. Fred, not so much. So they returned to Sheriff Norton. He told them exactly where to go. Those infected or suspected of being infected were taken to the former Memorial Hospital, which was located on the other side of the river. The bridge with the first check was one of the only unblocked ways into the town. The rest of the roads and bridges were heavily guarded and with good cause. Memorial Hospital was located in a not-so-protected part of town, a part not really considered Center City. It was complicated and too much bureaucracy for a post-apocalyptic zombie world. She had to get passage papers from command that allowed for her and Yates to cross the bridge and into that section of town, papers that stated they knew the dangers and were able to handle them. A huge fenced-in barricade closed off the bridge with a single thick gate door to pass through. It slid open wide enough for a vehicle, but Rachel and Yates were on foot. It wasn't that far to walk. They were asked twice if they were sure they wanted to go through and were aware of the dangers both physically and psychologically. To Rachel, it was a joke to even ask that. They were eliminators. They had seen it all. But one thing Rachel didn't see was the downfall of society how the virus swept the globe. She saw it happen in a remote Bahama resort. She had been to major cities after sweep teams, but crossing that bridge brought her face to face with the reality of what happened. Charleston was a small city. She could only imagine what the bigger ones looked like before cleanup. Crossing that bridge took them to a part of Charleston that didn't get swept by a sweep team, an area that wasn't cleaned up. A war broke out there between the dead and the living. There weren't any stiffs roaming about, none that she could see. Those she and Yates could handle, and Rachel was pretty sure, with the warnings, they were there. They came across the 35th Street Bridge and could see the six-story hospital set two blocks away. From where she stood, even at a distance, the top floor was charred with broken windows. In fact, every building in the area had broken windows. Blood stained the streets, wrapped bodies still in bags and blankets, long since past the stage of odorous decomposition. But the carefully wrapped bodies set out were not the only bodies they saw. Remains scattered about, some skeletal and older, while others seemed fresh. There was a Kentucky Fried Chicken there, and from the front window hung a body. Trash and debris scattered everywhere. As an eliminator, Rachel was used to going into barren areas, places where the dead owned the streets— but they were also places where remnants of a human versus zombie battle had all been erased. She was seeing it for the first time. Instead of being scared or being sad, it stirred something in Rachel. She needed to see more. There were so many places in the United States the sweep teams hadn't touched. Those were the areas the eliminators needed to go. Not safe zones set up for execution teams to slip in. Rachel wondered how many towns and cities were like that small pocket of Charleston, how many still not only housed the dead, but the living fighting to survive. If those who guarded the bridge expected Rachel and Yates to be negatively affected by what they saw, then those who guarded the bridge hadn't been out in the world. They walked the two blocks to the hospital grounds. White FEMA tents were erected everywhere in the parking lots, but they weren't in use. Most of them sustained damage. No one walked around. They saw not one human being until they approached the front doors. The entire first floor was boarded up for safety, and four armed guards stood out front with two dogs. Walking to the guarded area, she saw a truck and two men carrying a body to it. The dogs didn't bark. One put its nose to Yates's leg as they were let through. "'Thanks for coming with me,' Rachel told him. "'Thanks for getting me out of jail. For what it's worth,' The flirting worked. They entered into the former hospital's lobby area. The furniture had been cleared out, except for the reception desk no one was at. There was a phone in plain sight with a note that instructed a person to pick up the phone. 
Yates walked up to it and lifted it. It's ringing, he told Rachel. Yes, hello. We're here about an inmate. Sorry, yes, patient. Fred. He paused. Fred. Fred. He covered the receiver. What's Fred's last name? I don't know. Shit. Yates then returned to his call. I'm sure you don't have many Freds. Oh, you have three. How odd. Must be because it's West Virginia. His name is Fred. He was brought in just a little bit ago. He's an eliminator. We're part of his team, the Flaming Saffrons. Thank you. He hung up. What did they say? Rachel asked. Someone will be right out. He's being processed. A few minutes later, a man in a white lab jacket came out of the door behind the desk. I'm Dr. Jones. You must be the Flaming Saffrons? We are. Rachel shook his hand. Then Yates did. Casper's friends, Jones said. You know Casper? Rachel asked. I do. He's a card. Come with me, Jones instructed. My office is right inside here. He opened the door and led them down the hall. Yates leaned down to Rachel. Is he speaking about Casper before or after he turned deadish? Rachel shrugged. After, I hope. Jones stepped in the second door on the right. Have a seat. He walked around the desk and sat down. Now, what can I help you with? Rachel sat down at the same time as Yates. What's going on with Fred? Can we take him? As you know, you can't. We cannot have the infected mixed in with the population. It's too dangerous, and we're having a hard enough time locating all those who have it. We're trying to make Center City an infected-free zone, he explained. Other cities and towns, not. But we can concentrate the manpower here. Charleston's too big. A lot of the residents pre-virus are still here. We can't kick them out. I understand that, Rachel said. I know that, but there has to be a mistake. Sheriff Norton told us the dogs aren't always right. Yates said. They're not. That's why the individuals brought here. We immediately test. If they test positive, then we keep them, test them further, and relocate them to a town where they're set up to handle the turned. New laws by President Nazinski. We have a couple of towns they're equipping with scanners taken from EPEV technology. Yates huffed and looked at Rachel. Another one of my patents. He shook his head. Oh, you're Yates? Jones asked. Amazing humanitarian invention. Thanks, but the EPEV is a weapon, Yates said. Just like those virus dogs are a danger. You have them around infected. They get infected, they turn like that. He snapped his finger. And watch out. Fortunately, we only have four, Jones replied. Well, three right now. Someone shot the fourth dog and he's recovering. Bastard, Yates said. Yes. Anyhow, as you know, there are two strains and two ways the virus affects people before they turn. One, they get sick, fevered, vomit blood. Two, they turn. They turn without warning. Like Bill, Rachel said. Who's Bill? Yates asked. He was a temporary eliminator, but he kept his wits about him enough to kill himself before he hurt anyone. Rachel explained, then faced Jones. But that's what I don't understand. Bill wasn't an official eliminator, so he wasn't tested. All eliminators are tested to see if they're immune. And Fred was. Jones folded his hands on the desk. Was, Yates asked. As in, he lost immunity? Was, as in, he was immune until he got bit. Fred was bit? Rachel asked. Jones nodded. Several times over the last six months. He didn't turn, didn't get sick, so he figured it was his immunity. When the truth is, he's a carrier. He has it. And like your friend Bill, he can turn at any time. Are you sure? Rachel asked. I mean, is it possible he won't? It's possible, but he's still a carrier. We're running more tests now. He's fine, and we'll let you know as soon as we know anything. I'll get in touch with command. How are his spirits? Rachel asked. His spirits are fine. Thank you for your time. Rachel stood, extending her hand again. I'll hear from you soon. One thing, Yates said. What happens after testing? He'll be moved from here to a community, or, if he wants, Dr. Stevens has a little apartment set up over at his lab for those who want to be part of beating this thing. Rachel nodded and left the office with Yates. No answers, really, she said as they walked down the hall. At least it seems organized. Liz is on the ball. We can talk to her. She's supposed to meet us either at the hospital with Barry or after. Good, 
Yates said. I need to talk to her about the EPEVs and things they're taking from it. You're really upset about this patent thievery. I mean, I get it. It's your thing. It's more than that. In the wrong hands, the EPEV can be dangerous. But it's not in the wrong hands, Rachel said. They'll be going in the command hands. And who's to say in six months those hands won't have a different agenda? Let's hope you're wrong. You're still learning me. Soon you'll find out. He opened the door for her to step outside. I'm never wrong. Chapter 7 Broken Man It was a totally different story at the other hospital back on the safe side of the river. Rachel and Yates approached the emergency room entrance. It just screamed pre-virus normal. A security guard out front, a man off to the side smoking a cigarette. Rachel figured they'd ask where they could find Barry, but just as she was about to, they heard Riggs. His voice was loud and booming. "'What is he yelling about?' Yates asked. "'Something must be wrong.' Rachel turned and ran, ignoring the "'You can't go back there!' warning from the receptionist. She followed the sound of his voice, turning a bend to see him standing outside of a treatment room. A doctor stood before him, and she looked frustrated. Riggs was shaking his head, and while doing so, saw Rachel. His shoulders dropped in relief. Rach! he said so loudly it frightened Rachel. She jolted and cringed. What's wrong? What? I said... She raised her voice slightly. What is going on? I don't understand what you're saying. Why is he talking so loud? Yates asked. The doctor answered. He suffered what's called acoustic trauma. And like any inflammation, it's worse now. He needs to block the ear to prevent any noise from getting in. How did that happen? Yates asked. Rachel spun on him. You shot your gun right by his head. Oh, I did, didn't I? But you were there. I saw you raise it. I blocked my ears. What are you guys saying? Riggs asked. This is going to be annoying. Rach, I'm trying to find out what happened with... Rachel put her hand over his mouth, stared at him, slid her hand from his mouth, and made a shh signal. Then she signed to him. You are talking too loud because you can't hear. Wow, Yates said. I'm impressed you know sign language. All Indiana soccer moms do. For some reason, Yates said. I'm thinking there's an inside joke there that I'm not getting. There is, Rachel replied, but he can't hear. What? Rach, I don't know sign language. Rachel looked at Yates. Get paper, please. Tell him he's talking too loud. Again, Rachel held up her finger, shushing him. She faced the doctor. How long is this going to last? At most a few days. The damage isn't too bad. He just sounds upset because he can't hear what he's saying, the doctor explained. I wrote a note. Yates held up a pocket-sized notebook. Good, please show it to him, Rachel instructed. So, doctor, we'll get through to him. Otherwise, he's fine? He is. What do you mean, shut up? Riggs blasted at Yates. Why are you telling me to shut up? Oh, my God. Rachel snatched the paper from Yates's hand and the pen and wrote down. She then showed the note that said, You are too loud because you can't hear. Whisper. Oh. Riggs's voice dropped to slightly below normal. Okay, but I can't hear what I'm saying, so I probably sound weird. Rachel shook her head, but behind her, Yates nodded. Riggs grimaced. She signaled that she would write things down for him, and Riggs gave a thumbs up. Exhaling, Rachel returned to her conversation with the doctor. Now, our friend Barry was brought in. Oh, yes, Mr. Bix. He's on the other side of the hall, treatment room 30. We're moving him to a bed upstairs until we get our one and only ortho doctor in here tomorrow. He's in the service, so he's out in the field. Is he okay? Rachel asked. He broke his tibia in two places. We don't think he needs surgery, just set properly. In fact, the president is with him and the other woman now. Then that's where we have to head. Thank you. Rachel took hold of Riggs's arm and tugged. No, the doctor nodded at Riggs. Thank you for getting him out of here. Not letting go of Riggs, Rachel led him to room 30, where Barry lay his leg wrapped and elevated. Sandy stood on one side and Liz on the other. Acting commander, Liz said, walking to Rachel and hugging her. Taking care of business, I hear. Trying. You know Yates, don't you? 
I do. We met six weeks ago. That's right. Rachel walked over and kissed Barry on the cheek. Don't ask Riggs anything. He's loud. Oh, I know. I heard him. The whole hospital heard him. No hellos or handshakes from Yates to Liz. Just, why are you building more EPEVs? I didn't, Liz replied. The previous president did. They were already in the works before the world went to shit. He copied your patent, and I'm just trying to figure out how to safely use them. That bastard, Yates quipped. You have to watch who gets control over them. I know. Trust me. Liz folded her arms. So this isn't exactly how I envisioned the meeting to go. I need to talk to you about the special mission, but half of you are out. Rachel slightly shook her head. I don't understand. Half? Riggs is fine. Not Riggs, Liz said. He can resume command as soon as he can hear, but Barry is out for at least three weeks. He can't put any pressure on that leg, cast and all. Going to the potty, Sandy said, is the only walking he's going to do. This is all bull, Barry argued. I can go. No, you can't, Sandy replied. I'm staying with you. I hear we have four babies due. So neither one is going, Rachel asked. Liz shook her head. We'll put Barry and Sandy somewhere nice where he can get care. A nursing home again, Barry argued. Bet me. Well, Mr. Bix, Yates spoke pacifyingly. You are getting up there, Barry grumbled. It's not long, Liz said. They told me you can go back out before the cast is off, but for the first few weeks, no. And Fred's out, as you've heard. Yes, Liz replied. And I heard someone shot our dog. Nipped, Yates corrected. And they shouldn't have been created anyhow. Riggs tapped Rachel on the shoulder. He shook his head and raised his hands. Rachel lifted a finger, then wrote on the notepad, Fred is out. Explain later. Barry can't go. Leg broke. Sandy staying with him. Half the team out for mission. Riggs nodded his understanding, then looked at Liz with a questioning look. Oh, what's the mission? Liz asked. We're opening up Moundsville as a safe town and part of rebuilding civilization. There's a small survivor town in Illinois, self-created. They've done really well, but are ready to move to safe ground. Moundsville. We need you guys to escort them here. Oh, that sounds like fun, Rachel said. Very interesting. A change of pace. What do you think, Yates? I'd rather eliminate, but I suppose we'll have a chance to do that on the road. He grabbed the notepad and wrote down words, showing it to Riggs. Oh, please tell me you didn't lie to him, Rachel said. No, I didn't. See for yourself. Rachel looked at the note he showed Riggs, and she grimaced when she saw it simply said, Lame mission. But there is a slight problem, Liz said. With Barry, Sandy, and Fred out, your team is short. Now you'll have Casper, who understands everything. We're still working on communication, and you'll have to give him injections daily, but he can do it. Can we go with four? Rachel asked. I'd prefer you have one more. I'll pull a list of eliminators that are available. You can look and choose. So, while I'm still in command, can I choose for the team? Rachel asked. Sure, I'll hurry the list. No need, Rachel smiled. I know exactly who I want. The ringing was still there, along with the pressure, and Riggs only felt pain in his ear when he opened his mouth wide or chewed. Other than that, he was sure that his hearing would come back fully. It was already better. The muffled words were slightly clearer, and if he looked at the person talking, he could understand by reading their lips. It didn't bother him that he couldn't hear Yates bitching at Starbucks. Riggs didn't even bother looking in an attempt to read his lips. He only nodded as if he were hearing him. Rachel looked as if she enjoyed what he was saying. Obviously, she agreed with him, so Riggs mimicked that. They had to wait to hear from Dr. Stevens to see Casper. When the summons finally came, Yates went to secure their housing for the next couple nights while they waited to go on their mission. The new person would be joining them. Riggs didn't have a clue who he or she was. Rachel didn't say. He was okay with that. Rachel had good judgment. If he argued with that, Rachel would be pissed and say he only argued because she made the decision as temporary leader. Plus, Riggs would meet him or her soon enough. There was some paperwork to process, and after they talked to Dr. Stevens and Casper, they'd go get the temporary eliminator. Riggs was surprised, though. Liz didn't insist on a medic. Riggs asked about that. One of the survivors they were escorting was a doctor. They made their way to Dr. Stevens' lab and to the area where they kept Casper. Riggs was nervous and excited. 
so he could only imagine how Rachel felt. To him, she looked nervous. The last time they saw Casper, he looked like a freshly turned stiff. Eight weeks had gone by. It was possible that he was pretty decayed, and Riggs wondered how they'd handle the smell. Dr. Stevens entered the waiting room. Rachel! Riggs! So wonderful to see you! He shook their hands. This gives me a chance to talk to you both. Excellent, Rachel said. But I need you to speak a little louder, nearer Riggs's left ear, and try to let him see your lips. What happened? Stevens asked. He has some acoustic trauma. It's getting better, Riggs told him. I'm making out words. Bet you don't hear yourself well, Stevens said. Too loud? Stevens held his thumb and forefinger close together. A little bit. Gotcha. Riggs held a thumbs up. Anyhow, Stevens continued, before you leave, I'd like to make sure you understand the treatment at injections, how the process works. He's needing a lot less. Is he safe? Riggs asked. Yes. No desire to bite or attack. He's... he's Casper. He talks a little slow, but he knows. He doesn't look healthy, so be prepared for that. Rachel nodded. Liz mentioned you needed us to take him out, test him. Are you afraid he might get violent? Is that what you mean by test? No, Stevens replied. Since getting infected, Casper has acquired some special skills. We'll go over those and how you can work on them. One of them is, like our dogs, he can sense or smell the infection in someone not showing it, which is helpful. There's a whole document I have for you to take and read tonight, but for now, he walked to the door. Casper's anxious. I'm excited, Rachel said. Did you say he can smell the infected? Riggs asked. Apparently he was loud because Stevens cringed. Yes, like the dogs. He opened the door. Speaking of dogs, did you hear someone shot one of our virus dogs? Oh, no! Rachel faked concern. Yep, what kind of sick, twisted individual shoots a dog in the ass? It's just wrong, so wrong. He walked through the door. There were certain things Rachel expected to see after two months away from Casper, and things she didn't expect to see. Like the fact that he wore jeans and a 1980s ACDC t-shirt. She wanted to cry the moment she laid eyes on him. Oh, man, Riggs said. He looks good. A little white, but good. Can I hug him? Rachel asked. Dr. Stevens nodded. It's fine. She ran to Casper, immediately embracing him. Oh, my God, I missed you. Rachel, you smell like food. Rachel pulled back. Kid, ding, ha, ha, ha. Oh, my God, you're joking. Dude, he said slowly and reached out to Riggs. He's a little hard of hearing. He's old. Yeah, well, Riggs said, you're pale. I look like Edward from the vampire movie. Oh my God, you do look like that. Just as white, but better looking, Rachel said. And no, even though Riggs is getting old, that's not why he can't hear. Yates shot a gun by his ear. Ow, oh, ow, oh. who... Is Yates? Casper asked. New guy. Not a red shirt. Like a definite member of the team. We have a new, new, new guy coming. He may be the red shirt. Fred was a new guy, but... Long story. How is Barry? Good. He won't be on the mission with us, Rachel replied. Neither will Sandy, but you can see them before and when we get back. They're really anxious to see you. Unfortunately, Dr. Stevens said... They'll have to visit here. We can't have him out in public in Center City. Not yet. It sucks. I need a tan, Casper said, then laughed. Oh, man, did they tell you about Penny? No, Rachel shook her head. What happened? Riggs asked. Stevens answered. She turned rather quickly after you left. We have her here. She'll miss Casper. See, that's another thing about Casper. He can walk among the dead and they don't attack. Rachel was excited. Like Brad Pitt in World War Z. That could be so useful. 
What about the growlers? Casper looked confused. Growlers? Zombie dogs, Rachel said. Really nasty and fast, and I'm assuming since you never heard of them that you don't know if they'll attack you or not. We'll just pretend they will to be safe. Let's not stand in the hall, Stephen said. You're here for an hour. Let's go sit somewhere and chat. It was a lot for Riggs to take in, and he heard much of what was said. It was going to be interesting with Casper. Riggs was happy to see him not be a zombie. Despite what Stephen said, Casper wasn't really 100% himself. Riggs attributed that to the fact he had a hard time expressing verbally. However, once Casper overcame that obstacle, Riggs had no doubt in his mind that the old Casper would return 100%. Whether that was a good thing remained to be seen. He sat on his bunk, staring at the bars of his cell. He heard the jingling of keys and didn't think much of it until they grew closer to him. Then Sheriff Norton stood at his cell. You're free to go now, Mr. Porter. Norton opened the cell door. Charges were dropped. You've been assigned to a new eliminator team. He looked up, his frame towering over the sheriff. Really? Yep. Your new commander's waiting outside. I think tomorrow you'll go to command with some of your team, pick up your weapons. I'm sure the team will tell you all about it. This is great. Thank you. Good luck out there. Appreciate it. He nodded and walked down the aisle to the last door. He opened it. He didn't have any belongings on him. He didn't see anyone in the lobby of the jail, so he went out the main door. As soon as he did, he saw her standing there, arms folded, leaning against the building. He recognized her right away by her short Captain Marvel-style hair. So, he said, you're my new commander. Rachel looked up to him and extended a hand. Rachel, I'm the temporary team commander. Ours should be back on full duty in a day. I know your name's not Lunk. What do they call you? Zeus. Zeus? Your nickname is Zeus? No, that was my professional name, he said. It fits, except your hair is dark. I used to have long hair, then a dead grabbed it, and now it's short. You didn't wear it up? he asked. That's what Riggs always said. Your hair, he pointed at it. It looks different. Good, but a little shorter. Thank you for noticing. Rachel touched her hair. I got a trim before getting you. I wanted to do it before we went back out. I'm glad to be going back out. Thank you for this, he said. I won't let you down. Being an Eliminator has become my life. I know that feeling. Now, let's go meet some of your team. I'm ready. Good. And I'm sure, Rachel said, they're ready for you. Where is she? Riggs paced back and forth in Barry's hospital room. He paused to push on his ear. At least you aren't talking at loud volume anymore, Yates said, staring down to what looked like a phone. I can almost hear again. The ringing's still there, thank you very much. What are you looking at? Oh, just trying to tap into the other EPEVs. They aren't hooked up yet. You're seriously obsessed, Riggs said. I'm seriously concerned. Yates looked up. You know, we went to try to see Fred. They talked about moving him to designated survivor towns for the infected. They talked about a scanner. I wonder if they'll be using my tracking program. It measures pulse, temperature, and breaths. That's actually a really good way to track if they turn. Riggs stated. If they aren't doing it, maybe you should suggest it. No, I suggest it. They'll be putting eliminators in these towns. Barry spoke up. Would that be bad? Sounds like it could be interesting. Yates shook his head. I heard from the guy in the cell next to me you can't just put them down. All town residents that turn have to be brought to something called peace centers. You have to incapacitate them. How? Riggs asked. Beats me. Riggs sighed out. Sounds dumb. He looked down to his watch. Where is she? Who? Barry questioned. Sandy or Rachel? Sandy went to Starbucks. What is it with you guys in Starbucks? It's the apocalypse, Riggs said. But I was talking about Rachel. She told us nothing about the new Eliminator and was supposed to be here. She went to get her hair done first, Yates replied. A trim before we go back out. Maybe highlights. For real? Riggs shook his head. That is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. Absolutely. Yates agreed. I mean, if she wants people to stop thinking she's gay, she has to lose the Captain Marvel hair. She can keep it short, just pixie cut it or something. Are you seriously encouraging the hair thing? Again, like with Starbucks, it's the apocalypse. Why? Um, 
Just because it's the apocalypse doesn't mean you have to look bad, Yates said. High humidity days, I can take up an hour to straighten this mess. He pointed to his hair. Am I the only one who doesn't give a shit about how they look now? Riggs asked. Um, yes. Yates put his device in his pocket. Even Fred cares, and that's saying a lot. The man is as laid back at... Wait, let me think of a Fred-type thing. He's as laid back as... He snapped his fingers. A prostitute on a Friday night! Oh, my God, Riggs said. I thought it was good, commented Barry. No. Yates's eyes shifted. No. No what? Riggs asked. Rachel walked in with the new eliminator. You did not get the jailbird, Yates said. Tell me I'm dreaming. Please tell me I'm dreaming, Riggs said in a daze. Oh, my God. Zeus Porter! His voice crept up. It's Zeus Porter! You know him? Rachel asked. You know him? Rachel repeated. Yes! Yes! Riggs extended and shook his hand. And you're on our team? Yes, I am. Thanks to the commander here. Riggs laughed through the excitement. She's temporary. I'm the commander. He chuckled again. Someone like himself. He spun to Barry. Look, it's Zeus. Len would have lost it. My son, Barry said, and Riggs were huge fans. Okay, stop. Yates made a T with his hands. Fans of what? Football? Not basketball. You're too thick. Zeus laughed. Wrestler. Zeus here, Riggs pointed out, was a 12-time heavyweight champion. He's a god of pro wrestling. Like Zeus, Yates said facetiously. Sandy's voice entered the room, and she spoke slowly and with shock. Oh, my God. God. Yates faced Rachel. Is everyone a wrestling fan? Rachel shrugged. Zeus turned around to the door. His eyes widened. Aunt Sandy! Eugene! Sandy raced to him. Both Yates and Rachel hurriedly looked at each other. Eugene? Oh, my sweet boy! She placed her hand on his face. My sweet boy! Her voice quivered. You survived! I can't... I can't tell you how happy I am. I thought you were in London. I was. We were doing a promo cruise. The yearly cruise with the superstars. And that's when it hit. FYI, Zeus said. Important tip. Don't be on a cruise during a zombie apocalypse. Actually, Yates said, that sounds fun. There are still ships out there, Zeus said. People they sent out for safety. Who knows? Maybe it'll be a new Eliminator thing. That would be cool, Rachel added. How did you find me? Sandy asked Zeus. I didn't. She, he pointed to Rachel, found me. Purely by accident, Rachel waved her hand. I can't take credit for finding your nephew, just for finding an Eliminator. Riggs spoke up. He's the newest member of the Flaming Saffrons? You're on our team? Sandy asked with excitement. And Sandy, you're an Eliminator? I am, Sandy nodded. Well, pseudo. I'm the medical person on the road. I don't actually go out and eliminate those things. But this trip, honey, you'll have to be without me. This is my friend Barry. I'm going to stay back for this mission. It's a short, easy one, so we won't be missing much. It'll be nice to hang back. In a nursing home, Barry griped. They tried this once with me. It didn't work. You aren't staying there for good, Sandy defended. A couple weeks, and it's an assisted living. We'll be fine. Barry shook his head. I won't be fine until I'm back on the road, cast or no cast. I feel bad for you, Riggs said. Seriously, we now have the coolest team ever and you're going to miss it. Casper's back, we have the tech guy with all the toys, and a superstar professional wrestler. What am I? Rachel asked. You're... Rachel. Riggs paused. With the... Wow, your hair. It looks nice. Did you get a cut and highlight it? Oh, my God, Riggs! Rachel smiled and touched her hair. I did. Thank you for noticing. Don't be too impressed, Yates said. I told him you went. And by the way, he smiled smug. He made fun of you. He walked to the door. I'll see you at the house. Rachel gasped. I can't believe you made fun of me. Probably because you're such a freaking sexist. She followed Yates out. Why? Why would he say that? Riggs asked. Because he's a dick, Zeus answered. He's threatened to beat me up in jail.
Riggs laughed, as if he could. He turned serious. What house? Chapter 8 Uneasy It wasn't a bad walk, and it was convenient. Four blocks from Dr. Stevens's lab to the place where they'd spend the night. She even got a glimpse of the facility where Barry and Sandy would be staying. It looked nice and was in a residential area. The housing given to Rachel and the others was on the same block as other eliminators, either taking a break or waiting on a team. While in town, if not on a break, they worked security. But it was a nice night, and Rachel didn't mind walking. She spent longer at Dr. Stevens's lab than she should have. Fred was moved there. He would be tested by Dr. Stevens at his virus hunters, trying to cure not only the sickness, but the aftermath as well. Rachel didn't have the heart to tell him that Casper was just a freak occurrence. Once dead and turned, they stayed dead and turned. Fred was sad. Rachel didn't blame him. But he looked forward to going back out as an eliminator or working some sort of job in the infected survivor city. They talked a while. Rachel looked forward to the day when Fred and Casper would be out with her. She knew they'd get along. Perhaps she spent longer than she should have there. They would be leaving the next day for the mission, a little sooner than they expected. She just felt so bad leaving Fred behind. Finally, she left to walk home. As odd as it was, being around the normalcy of Charleston, or at least the facade of normalcy, it made her think of her family more. Her son Brad suffered from the sickness part of the virus. How he died alone in that stadium, even though she tried to get to him. Sammy, her daughter, was still alive, screaming when the dead pulled her from the bus and out of Rachel's grip. Her legs chewed apart, crying out, and even though it didn't happen in her memory, all Rachel heard was her daughter screaming, Mommy. Cliff, her husband, in some sort of vain attempt to save his daughter, rushed from the bus, sealing his own fate. Knowing now all that she did about the dead, she knew the chances of them turning was slim. There was a point where a person was torn apart so much they didn't turn. Her husband and daughter had to have been one of those who never turned. They were two people thrown into a mass crowd of hungry, raging dead. There were times before it all happened when things were sane and normal, that Rachel would take a drive in the car and her mind would wander. Things she had to do, or envisioning things she wished would happen. Then, suddenly, she found herself on a wrong street. It was a dangerous habit she had of getting lost in thoughts, much as she did that night. She was walking down the peaceful street, reliving those memories so vividly, they sucked her in, as if she were actually back there. Feeling those moments she spent with her family, totally sucked out of the reality of where she was until she felt it under her foot. A squishing feeling. Rachel stopped. She pulled out her flashlight, turned it on, and lowered the beam to the sidewalk. She knew exactly what it was when she saw it. Zombie excrement. It lay in a big blob in the middle of the sidewalk. From the color of the dung, at least what she could see in the dark, it seemed fresh. It had excreted from the body of an undead. Usually when they ate too much, it just plopped out of them hours later. A pile of zombie excrement not only meant there was a stiff around, but it also meant it fed. Staring down to it, she heard the soft growl. Lifting her head, Rachel saw it. The male stiff stood right before her. Quickly, she grabbed for the honing rod, grasped it in her hand, and lifted it, ready to impale the undead. Before she could, blue sparks came from nowhere, and the undead jolted, shook, until it dropped to the ground. As her eyes cased from the undead upward, she saw a man in a police uniform approach. "'Sorry, ma'am,' he said. "'We should have been faster.' "'That's okay,' Rachel said. "'You're an eliminator.' "'I am.' On R&R, &R. getting ready to go out tomorrow, she answered. She watched another man approach. So a taser actually works. For a couple hours, long enough for us to get them to the peace center. I'm on the road, Rachel said. What exactly is that? Folks register dead they haven't seen. If we can't match the dead to the missing, we try to identify them. Wait for people to have a farewell before they're put down humanely. The other guy joined him, and they lifted the stiff. Have a good night, he said to her. Yes, thank you. 
She returned her honing rod to her belt and watched as they carried the stiff to a truck. She had been so caught up in her thoughts, she didn't see the big garbage truck there. The two men loaded the stiff in the back end, then got in, and the truck drove away. Rachel wasn't far from the house, and she'd continue on. It struck her as odd that not only were they proficient in getting the stiff, but they also needed such a big truck. She couldn't help but wonder why. Were they even playing? It was the fourth time Rachel had passed Yates and Zeus in the dining room, and they looked frozen in time. They both were seated at the small dining room table, a chessboard between them. Yates sat back, arms folded, staring down, while Zeus leaned forward, arms on the table. Both men had a look of studious intent. The house was small. It had a second floor, but from outside, it only looked like windows. It was so tiny that the Epev completely blocked it, but it had a nice side deck. Riggs was out there when she got home. She thought about sleeping in the Epev. It was nicer than the plain old home, and it didn't have that vibe that Rachel picked up. The sadness that something horrendous happened there. The fresh white paint and neutral decor told her they whitewashed the tragedy of the home. Then again, how many homes were spared the tragedy? Her home back in Indiana was spared. They were away, the first ever vacation out of the country they had ever taken. She was bored. Everyone was busy. The first time she walked by Yates and Zeus was when she came in the house. When she asked what they were doing, they hushed her. The second time, they were still in the same position when she went to see what was there to eat. After her shower, they still looked the same. She even sat on the couch watching them. Yates moved his hand to a piece once, then pulled it back. Finally, when she retrieved a beer, she stood over the table for a few minutes. "'Do you need something?' Yates asked. "'You've moved like six pieces,' Rachel said. "'And?' Yates asked. "'Your point? Aren't you bored? No, go bother Riggs.' There was a thought. What was he doing on the side deck, anyhow? It was something to do, and, toting her beer bottle, she walked out to the side deck. His feet were propped up, a bright lantern perched on the table, a bottle of the beer in one hand, and he read from a folder. Busy? Rachel asked. Yes, but you can join me, he said, dropping his feet. Did you try that? Try what? The beer, he asked. Not yet. It doesn't have a label. I think they made it here, Riggs said. I think it's probably the best beer I've ever had. Rachel shrugged and gave it a try. She was surprised how smooth it was. Wow, you're right, and I'm not a beer drinker. Have you been back long? About an hour, and long enough to realize if a game of chess takes that long, it's not for me. They started a while ago. How was Casper? Good. Fred's there. They hit it off right away. Rach, did you find out what he eats? Riggs asked. You mean like, does he eat humans? Riggs nodded. He does not. Well, that's good to know. Riggs brought his beer to his lips. I saw a stiff tonight. Riggs paused in drinking. Where? About two blocks up. Some sort of in-town eliminator crew stunned him and took him to a peace center. Well, that's close. Yeah, I know. What have you been doing? Well, all these... He pointed to the stack of folders are twelve eliminators in town looking for a team. That's just stupid. If there are twelve, make them into two teams and send them out. Why are you looking at them? Trying to figure out why you picked Zeus, Riggs said. Not that I mind, just trying to see what made him stand out. Nothing, really. I didn't look at those files. He was in a cell next to Yates, driving him nuts. Plus, he was arrested for killing a stiff. I thought it would be funny to annoy Yates, and obviously he knew what he was doing. Well, you made the right choice. Riggs pushed the folder toward her. He's pretty qualified, and it says in there that he got his experience on that cruise line tossing the stiffs overboard. Rachel flipped through the folder. Can you imagine? I think we should talk to Liz about those ships out there. I asked around. The government put them on them to secure their survival. They had plans to bring them back. Just like they did in the remake of I Am Legend. Put them on boats and everyone died but they haven't, not from what they said in command. They're out there floating, trying to get back. I just think it would be an interesting change of pace to do a cruise elimination, Riggs said. 
or monitor a town if the infected are using Yates' bracelets, Rachel said. Can you imagine having to find the turned before they cause damage? It would be a test of skill, like the guys tonight. Do you know how many security are in this town by chance? No, it's not a lot, though. And they're all concentrated on the borders. It leaves them weak, Riggs. This is a disaster waiting to happen. What do you mean? Riggs asked. I mean... Rachel took a drink and stood. Tens of thousands of people here. Most of your security is posted around town, and they don't have more than a thousand. Liz said this is like thirty square miles. She walked to the railing of the deck, looking out to the open area behind the yard, the lights of homes in the distance. How do you keep this big of an area safe? I saw that stiff just wandering the streets. The dead are out there, a lot of them. They'll never go away, Rach, not until the virus is cured. I know, but here it's scary. People have a false sense of security. I hate the thought we're leaving Barry, Fred, and Sandy behind. Riggs stood and walked to the railing to join her. It's a ticking time bomb. Yep, and I just have this feeling, Rachel said. It won't be long before it goes off. Chapter 9 Rabid Fire April 21st, Day 367 It was his new team. Zeus had been on two other teams the previous year, and he honestly already felt like he fit in. Maybe it was something to do with the fact that his Aunt Sandy was a founding member. The team, so far, was solid. He couldn't wait for his aunt to be on the road with them. Or Barry Bick. Zeus was excited when he learned he was the founder and owner of Big Barry's Beef. He had yet to meet Casper, but heard lots about him. The jury was still out on Yates, and Zeus could see himself constantly at battle with him. However, he was a worthy chess player, so that made up for any shortcomings he had as a human being. Rachel? He would never have anything bad to say about her. If it weren't for her, he'd be in that cell and not reunited with his family. Riggs, visually to Zeus, didn't fit the commanders he had before. Usually, they looked hardened, bigger, and stern. Riggs was just some everyday average guy who wore his hair short and probably never combed it with more than his fingers. The big bonus was the team name. He didn't tell the others, but when he found out they were the Flaming Saffrons, inside he freaked because he was always a closet boy band fan. They were about to hit the road and were getting the EPEV ready. It was an awesome, high-tech piece of machinery, and the envy of any Eliminator who heard about it or saw it. Zeus said his farewell to his Aunt Sandy. She was getting settled into her temporary home. She seemed to like it, and Zeus didn't have the heart to tell her the place was only two steps above a nursing home. It had warmer lights, a cooler recreation room, and didn't smell quite as bad as other nursing homes he had been in. His aunt and Barry didn't really fit in. They were youngsters there and Sandy was mobile. He closed the hatch to the storage area of the EPEV. He and Yates had picked up the food. Riggs had already hit the armory and was at a meeting with the president. Okay, any time now, Yates said, looking at his watch. Was that for me? Was what for you? The any time comment. No, don't get so defensive. It's in regard to Riggs and Rachel. We still have to pick up Casper from behind the labs. That doesn't make sense, Zeus said. Did they tell you about him? No. Yates snickered. Well, let me have the honors. There are, Liz said, as she sat at an outdoor table at Starbucks with Riggs. That was all part of my predecessor's movement. Put as many people on ships as they could to clear the area, slow the infection. But wouldn't it spread faster on the ships? We assumed. We lost contact with many of them. We know of three that are still moving. So Zeus was right. They're out there, yes. And did you think about what I suggested in regard to putting trained Eliminator teams on site at the infected towns? Riggs asked. We prefer to call them ACCs, Asymptomatic-Centered Communities, Liz answered. Remember, there are people in those towns not infected and immune. They choose to be with their families, and I'll get to that as soon as... Ah, here she is. Liz lifted her head. Sorry I'm late, Rachel sat down. This is nice, so normal. Riggs pushed a drink her way. I got you a cold drink since it's warm today. Wow, thank you, that's so nice. Rachel smiled and sipped it. So good. wonder if they'll sell me some of that mocha syrup. 
She faced Liz. Yates has an espresso machine on the EPEV. Rach, Riggs said. Don't you think that's a bit much? No, Riggs, I don't, but thank you for expressing your opinion. Liz chuckled and opened a folder. Okay, now that I have you both, I'll give you the rundown so you can be on your way and... Madam President! A male eliminator stopped at the table. Sorry to interrupt. I'm Commander Stowell of the Triumphants. I just wanted to congratulate you on becoming president. This is our first time back in a while, ma'am. Thank you very much, Liz replied. Did you have a safe trip back? We did, ma'am, although I have to speak to command about the Eliminator Team D-1 Unit 7. The Hallmarks? Liz asked. Makes sense for the name, he replied. What happened? Apparently they eliminated in a town called Minerva and left a bunch of zids, Stowell said. A whole group of them running around, and the town was marked clean. Excuse my language, but that was an asshole move, leaving it to someone else. Riggs and Rachel looked at each other. We were in Minerva two days ago, Rachel said. Passed through to pose with the cow, but we didn't see any kids. Lucky you. Those little bastards are fast. Anyhow, I'll leave you to your Starbucks. I want to check in with the animal unit before I start my R&R. &R. See about getting a virus-sniffing dog for the next outing. Liz cringed. Not sure that's possible. One of the dogs was shot. He's injured and recovering. Someone shot him while he was sniffing out an infected. Who does that? The man asked, annoyed. I mean, what kind of person shoots a dog? In the ass, Rachel said, and sipped her drink. Sick. Just sick. I'd like to get my hands on that person. Man, Rachel replied. It was a man. Maybe I'll point him out if I see him. Rach, Riggs warned. Please do, and... Wait. Stowell stopped. You're an eliminator, he spoke to Rachel. I am, Liz added. Probably one of the best. I just don't see many women eliminators, Stowell said. If you're ever looking to change teams, she's not, Riggs cut him off. Does he always speak for you, Stowell asked. No, Rachel replied. But sometimes the sexist in him slips out and he thinks it's 1955. But thank you, Commander, for the offer. I'll keep that in mind. Ma'am? He nodded at Liz, then Rachel. Ma'am? Okay, Riggs exhaled. Now that he's gone, we can get back to this so we can hit the road. Liz nodded. Agreed. Rachel, is Casper ready to go? He is, Rachel replied. He has his things. I have the med case and I stopped to pick up his medical marijuana. Good. What? Riggs blasted with a laugh. Why does he need medical marijuana? I thought for sure that habit would have died when he almost did. He doesn't need it. It's bad enough we're bringing him in his condition. We don't need him stoned. You stopped complaining about that, Rachel told him. What's the issue with it now? You like Casper. I liked him better before, Rachel gasped. My God, you are a bigot. How is saying that bigoted? Riggs asked. You don't like Casper anymore because he's a Humby. A Humby? Riggs asked. What the hell is a Humby? Part human, part zombie. And you don't like him because he became one. It would be the same thing if I converted to being Jewish and you stopped liking me. No. No. Riggs shook his head. It's not the same thing. Bigoted is hatred or intolerance based on age, sexual orientation, nationality, religion, those sorts of things. Then you're racist. Riggs laughed. I hardly think a Humby is a new race. You don't think? Rachel asked. You know there are more of them out there. You wait. You'll see. Just like in the one TV series, the one main guy was a Humby. Shoot, I have to tell Casper he's like that guy. He'll love it. Riggs shook his head. I have no idea what you're talking about. Rachel waved out her hand. Liz continued. If we're done fighting, Riggs... You had mentioned putting an Eliminator team on site of the ACCs. I'm thinking of having Casper monitor a town. He would be very beneficial. One of the reasons you're taking him is to see how he fares around a lot of people. What happens if he doesn't? Riggs asked. Do we shoot him? What the hell? Rachel blasted. That's my friend! We don't think he will, Liz stated. And if Rachel is right and there are other Humbies, then we can station them at ACCs as well. But it's our hope it won't be long. The mission isn't just to escort any survivors who want to leave from the town and take them to Moundsville. It's to retrieve a doctor, or rather a scientist there, a scientist who has what we hope is the cure. Rachel nearly shrieked. Oh, shit, for real? Liz smiled and nodded. Not many know this, but from all data, it is promising. 
This person was top in the virology field who just so happened to be visiting family when the outbreak occurred. I mean, I even heard of Stephanie Levine's work. It's a woman? Riggs asked. Problem with that? Rachel asked. No, I just assumed it was a man because Liz said it was a doctor top in the field. Rachel shook her head. Such a sexist. Sounds like she might be Jewish. Want to play that card, too? Rach, enough, Riggs said. Anyhow, Liz spoke brightly. If it is a viable cure, then the mission of a lot of eliminators may change. Some will continue to clean towns. Others will go out distributing the cure. Oh, oh! Rachel snapped her finger. Like the TV show, The Last Ship. Only we'll stay on task and not veer way off course and go to China or something. Both Liz and Riggs stared at her. It really isn't fun talking end-of-the-world movies and shows when no one knows what I'm talking about other than... Rachel jumped up, as did Riggs and Liz, when a blood-curdling woman's scream ran out, one cut off in what seemed mid-cry. Stay here, Riggs told Liz, and along with Rachel, they followed the scream. Yates actually heard it before he even comprehended the woman's scream. In the middle of arguing with Zeus over what was considered technically cheating in chess, Yates caught just a snippet of the sound. Perhaps it was some sort of post-traumatic disorder that tuned him in, or just a connection, but as soon as he recognized it, his hand went to his gun. "'What is it?' Zeus asked. "'Where, where, where?' Yates spoke to himself, stepping out farther from the EPEV to get a view of the town. "'What are you talking about? We're in the middle of a goddamn town, it can't be!' Yates, you're worrying me. You're not making sense. His eyes shifted left to right, hoping to hear it again. And then he did. It was a low snarl, something no one else would have thought twice about. But Yates knew. There. He spotted it. But as soon as he did, the transformed dog sprang forward toward the woman. The woman screamed, but not for long. The growler locked its jaws onto her throat and tore it away quickly, causing her instant death. It was so fast, Yates didn't see the growler until it attacked the woman, but he set his sights and aimed on the undead animal before it could take its next victim. The growler, flesh from the woman still dangling in its mouth, jumped for its next victim, an unsuspecting man who looked like an eliminator walking out of Starbucks. The man turned, and Yates fired. It took one shot. He hit the growler in the head, and it dropped to the man's feet. "'Holy shit!' Zeus said. You're fast. I've had practice with them. Yates walked towards Starbucks. Rachel and Riggs raced out. Riggs looked down to the growler and then to Yates. You? Yates nodded. Yeah. Good job. So, Stowell. Rachel nudged the stunned man. Bet you're thinking twice about the man who shot the dog in the ass. Him? Stowell asked. Yep. Liz emerged from Starbucks with a shocking gasp. Her hand shot to her mouth when she saw the dog and the woman nearby. Was this one of ours? Yes, Yates said. This is why you don't have virus-sniffing dogs. This could have been worse. Next time, it will be. Put them down. All of them. Get rid of them now. Yates turned, took a step, and saw the woman on the ground begin to rise. Without missing a beat or breaking stride, he fired a single shot into her head and kept on walking. He's all yours, Sheriff Norton said, stepping from the back. Good luck. Riggs nodded, standing with folded arms, trying to look intimidating and firm. Yates stepped from the back room. Thank God. You have got to stop getting arrested in this town, Riggs said. Tell me about it. They have the strangest laws. I was actually worried, Riggs told him as they began to leave. They had you down for two violations. I had to speak to a judge. For real? Yep. You're officially banned from this town. Oh, please, I highly doubt that'll stick. They'll need our team. A dog nearly attacked an Eliminator commander, and he didn't react. I can believe that. It was the same guy that asked Rachel to join his team right in front of me. I wonder why, Yates said. I mean, like, she's really great at what she does because she likes cheating death, but to look at her, she looks like a soccer mom with Captain Marvel hair. I know. Riggs pushed open the door. The EPEV was parked right there. We're ready to roll. Couple hours of red tape getting you out. We may have to stop for the night, but not a big deal. It'll be good to get on the road. Oh yeah, Casper's already on board. Just prepare yourself. 
I'm fine. Yates stepped inside the EPEV and absolutely froze when he saw Casper. We're ready. Riggs clapped his hands once. I'll take first leg. He looked at Yates, who didn't move. He was just locked into a stare with Casper. Hey, Rachel introduced. Casper, this is Yates. Yates, this is my friend Casper. No response. Riggs chuckled. This is the quietest I have ever seen him. Yates! Rachel snapped her finger. Why are you staring at my friend? I'm just... taken aback, Yates replied. I didn't expect him to be so... so... white. That's really rude, too, staring at someone with a disability. That snapped Yates out of it. What? He doesn't have a disability. Yeah, Riggs said. He's dead. Dead-ish, said Yates. No, Rachel argued. He's a Humby, Zeus stated. A human and zombie mix. A hybrid. Yes, Rachel nodded. Exactly. Um, no. Yates shook his head. To have a hybrid, something would have to be created merging two different breeds or species. Maybe Dr. Stevens is a mad scientist, Rachel said. Either case, he's a hybrid. Thank you, Zeus. Just like Murphy. Who? Yates asked. Don't get her started, Riggs stated. At least Casper's too slow to jump in. Rachel inhaled sharply. So now he has a physical deformity and mental limits. Oh, my God, Riggs faced Yates. I told you not to get them started. Me? Yates asked. I merely questioned who this Murphy was. Dude! Riggs' eyes widened. Casper's blurting of the single word was too normal-sounding. Dude! Murphy! Z Nation! Yes, Rachel nodded. You're Murphy. Admittedly, I stopped watching. They jumped the shark with the tornado. Ha! Casper laughed once loudly. Funny! Shark! Tornado! Both Casper and Rachel said at the same time, Sharknado! Casper shook his head. You jumped too soon. You never seen the full Murphy story, did you? Admittedly, no. I'll fill you in. Are you two done? Yates asked. No, probably not, Rachel answered. That's what I thought. Yates walked toward the front. I'm driving. Hey! Riggs followed him. Rachel smiled. It's good to have you back, Casper. Casper returned the smile. It's good to be back. Chapter 10 Left Field Some sort of Billy Joel song converted into elevator style piped through the building's speakers. Most of the residents really didn't notice or hear it, but Barry did. He honed in almost immediately when he arrived after having his legs set and saying goodbye to the team. To say he was grumpy was a massive understatement. Barry couldn't walk. They wouldn't allow him to use crutches. The only good news to come out of his orthopedic appointment was the doctor said ten days would suffice and he could use the crutches. By then, hopefully the team would be back. For the moment, he was stuck at Resting Meadows Retirement Home. They had slapped on a fancy name, but it was still only a nursing home. They had nurses, health aides, and even a floor dedicated to memory care where they locked those folks in. Everyone there had been moved from another facility or had been deemed too old to take care of themselves. Liz told him it was a way for the older generation not to worry. At least it was nicer than the last place they tried to put him. That place had fake leather chairs lined up in a room that was converted from a sitting room to a dining area and activities area. Resting Meadows looked a little like a hotel, a dining room, a separate sitting room with really nice chairs, and a television. His room still looked too much like a hospital room, with a handicap-equipped bathroom. But Sandy's room looked homier, even with the disguised hospital bed. He was waiting on Sandy, who again went to Starbucks. She truly was taking advantage of the Eliminator free drink perk. The health aide wheeled him into the television room. The TV was mounted on the wall, and Pretty Woman was showing. "'Would you like to sit near the television, Mr. Bick?' the aide asked. She spoke to him like he was a child. "'Or are we hungry for a snack?' "'No snack, no green jello. she giggled. "'We don't have green jello until Thursdays.' "'Swell!' Then he noticed him. 
He could tell, or at least it looked it, that the man in front of the television in a wheelchair was younger, younger than Barry. A woman who sat next to the younger man had white hair, with that bedhead look in the back, all pushed up from laying down. You know what? Barry said. I'll go near the TV. Perfect. Barry figured misery loved company, and surely if Barry hated being there and thought he was too young, so did the guy in front of the TV. When the aide rolled him into position and locked the brakes, Barry saw he was correct. The man was young, maybe thirty years old tops. Enjoying pretty woman? Barry asked. He gave the man a once-over. He was missing a left leg from the knee down. Agnes wants to watch it. He pointed to the woman next to him. It's a good film, Agnes said. Richard Gere's hot. I'm sure, Barry said. But he's dead now, you know. No, I don't, she snapped. Barry turned to the man and extended his hand. I'm Barry. Lance, he replied. Nice to meet you. I'm here as well, said Agnes. Ma'am, Barry nodded. So, he glanced at Lance. I take it your injury is why you're here. Yeah, they have therapy here. Hopefully in time I can go back out again, he replied. What do you mean? Barry asked. I'm an eliminator. No shit, so am I, said Barry. Freak accident on duty's how I broke a leg. Being old is how you broke your leg, Agnes quipped. Lance laughed. I was bit on the ankle. They amputated yesterday. Sorry about that, Barry said. Hey, I'm alive, and I hear they have a cool prosthetic program started. Well, that sounds great, Barry said. And I have to tell you, I am really glad to see you here. Someone younger to talk to. He looked over at Agnes when she laughed. What? You act like you're young, she said. Younger than you, Barry retorted. Not by much. Barry smiled. With a fellow eliminator and a sassy older woman, things were going to be a lot more interesting than he had thought. At least he wouldn't be staring out the window all day. They were nearly through the state of Ohio, and Yates was still driving. Riggs was pretty certain he wasn't giving it up. Everyone stayed near Yates to keep the conversation going. Thinking about this, Yates said, it just hit me. What's that? Riggs asked. This mission, right? We're headed to some small Illinois town to get people who have survived pretty decently out there. In fact, they started their own survivor camp. A small town way out near Iowa, a tourist town where people gathered. Yates! Riggs cut him off. Get to the point. They aren't overrun. Yates! Okay, okay. All because some doctor has a cure, or a highly probable cure. Riggs nodded. That's right. What's your point? Did anyone stop to think, if she was working on this cure... Where the hell in Galena, Illinois, is she finding a lab high-tech enough to work on a virus? Silence. Holy shit, Rachel said. That's a valid point. Dude! Yates looked in the rearview mirror to Riggs. What do you think? Nothing right now, but you have me thinking. I know, Zeus said. Maybe she found a meth lab. Did you just say, a meth lab? Yates asked. I did. You said a meth lab, Yates stated. The man who is almost an equal match for me in chess suggests a meth lab. You asked about a lab. Do you honestly think she's curing a virus in a meth lab? Yates asked. You never know. I can pretty much say with all certainty that isn't happening, Yates said. So, dude, Casper spoke up. Do, do you th think she's lying? I think something is up. Hating to agree with Yates, Riggs said. He brought up a valid point. But it makes sense, Casper said. It's the apocalypse. Anything to make it a road trip. Oh, Rachel blurted out. You are so right. What? Yates asked. What is he right about? Rachel answered. Every apocalypse story, or almost every apocalypse story, is a road trip story. No. Yates shook his head. Yeah, name an apocalypse movie that isn't technically a road trip, Rachel said, where the story doesn't involve the characters going somewhere as part of the storyline. World War Z, Riggs said. Road trip, Rachel said. I mean, truest form of road trip, Yates guessed. Armageddon, road trip. How? Casper explained. They went on a spaceship. I got one, Zeus said. The road. Really? 
Yates snapped. The road? Remind me to never assume someone is intelligent because they play a good game of chess. Dude, don't make fun of our strong man, Casper said. Technically, the road isn't a road movie. What? Yates blasted. See, Zeus said. I knew it. No, it's a road movie, Yates argued. It's called The Road because they are on the road. He noticed Casper trying not to laugh. Casper's just being an asshole. Riggs snapped his finger. I got it, he nodded arrogantly. Night of the Living Dead. Go on, Rach, how is that a road movie? Because they... they... Rachel stammered. They were on the road when they all met up. No, Riggs laughed. It's not, and you know it. Rach, Casper interjected. He's right. Rachel exhaled. Fine, he named one, but that will be the only one he can name. And Casp, I'm so impressed at how well you're talking. Dr. Stevens said it would come back. I still st stutter at times. Was that real? Riggs asked. Did you just stutter or were you making a point? Rachel spun and faced Riggs. Are you making fun of his speech impediment now? What's next, his glaucoma? My mother had glaucoma, Zeus said. Early, too, when she was young. You know what, Riggs said. I quit. I'm going to go in the back and work on learning more about the EPEV, so when we arrive in this tourist town to get this supposed cure, we're ready in case they actually are overrun. Which makes no sense, if you think about it. Why would they send us out to get them when St. Louis Command is closer? To kill Yates, Zeus said. Everyone looked at him. What? Yates asked, startled. Kill me? Why does everyone want to kill me? Dude, Casper said. Not to be disrespectful, but sometimes you aren't likable. I don't disagree, but that's no reason to kill me, Yates replied. Riggs asked Zeus. Why did you say that? Do you know something? No, just makes sense, Zeus said. He throws a fit every five seconds about the EPEV and his patent, and what better way to get him to shut up than to just send him somewhere dangerous to have him killed? They would have killed him in jail, but you kept getting him out. Yates looked at him. That is smart, coming from a man who thinks they're curing a virus in a meth lab and the road isn't a road movie. Do you have an intelligence off and on switch? Because that makes total sense. Don't flatter yourself, Riggs said. They aren't trying to kill you. Admittedly, now that you brought up the cure thing, there's some doubt, but I still say it's a rescue mission. I know they wouldn't go through all that trouble to kill you. Casper sighed out. If only Big Barry was here. He's the older, wise voice of wisdom. He would tell us what's going on. No offense, Riggs. And with that, Riggs said, I'm going in the back. As he walked away toward the back of the EPEV, he listened to the voices of his team until they faded to a level barely understood. Once in the back control room, Riggs took a seat. At that point, he really couldn't hear them. He couldn't help but think of what Yates had said about the virologist. He made such a point. Where would this woman get the resources to work on curing a virus? Did she carry them in a case, just able to use a notebook? Maybe there was something in the small town that aided her task. Yates had the satellite images hooked up, and Riggs was able to pull up an aerial view of the town. He started zooming in to look closely, to see if there were any building that the virologist could be using. Hey, Rachel tapped on the door. Riggs spun around. Hey, what's up? Can I talk to you? Uh-oh. No, no. She smiled and sat down. Nothing bad. What's going on? We're in Ohio, and I know you want us to stop for the night in Indiana. Riggs nodded. Right. Well, I just think... I was wondering, can we go to South Bend? I think it's time. I want to go to my house. Rach, absolutely. Thank you. I just lost my phone when me and Yates were taken hostage. I don't have pictures of my family. I want to... Rach. Riggs stopped her. You could have told me you wanted to go home and sit on your couch. I don't care. You want to go? We go. Riggs stood. I'll make sure Yates knows. Thanks. Riggs tapped her on the shoulder as he passed. Alone in the back control room, Rachel noticed Riggs had pulled up a map of Galena. It was odd. For him to immediately pull up a map of their mission town... 
made Rachel wonder if Riggs was suddenly more suspicious than he let on. Rachel really wasn't. Conspiracy theories tossed by Yates and Zeus put aside, Rachel was confident it was nothing more than a rescue and retrieval mission. Chapter 11. Cul-de-sac. Each person who worked with Liz in rebuilding had a job. The problem was, the previous president was so concerned about giving people back their sense of normalcy that he failed to strengthen the forces that had to defeat the dead in order for everything to truly go back to the way it was, or at least somewhat. She saw the flaming saffrons off to the assignment, and Liz was so hopeful Stephanie had the key to the cure. She needed that. If they could cure the virus, it would stop people from turning and give the eliminators and sweep teams a chance to catch up. After the Saffrons left, she made sure that Dr. Stevens got to work on finding space for Stephanie. She needed lab space. It was as insane a day as it could get. It started out well, then the attack of the dog. Not only did that happen, but Yates proceeded to break not one law, but two when he fired his weapon in public and then put down a woman that deserved her farewell. The peace centers were a good process. Those who turned, even though they didn't respond to their loved ones, were able to get a send-off before they were put to rest. Just when she got that settled, she had to work on the lab, and the moment she returned to her office, Riggs called. That's a hell of a pit stop, Liz told him. That's actually out of the way. Yeah, it's the first time in a year Rachel had expressed any desire whatsoever to go back to her home. I understand that, and I'm for it, but you should know... South Bend was never swept. How's that possible? Riggs asked. We cleaned Elkhart not four months ago. We never got to it. So chances are Elkhart is overrun. Again. Riggs, we want everything cleared as much as anyone, but we just don't have the bodies. Well, then maybe it's time you drafted people and trained them. There are a lot of people pretty much doing nothing but drinking Starbucks, Riggs told her. Riggs had a point. There were more dead than there were those alive and the number of soldiers of the undead paled in comparison to the number of physically capable people that could join the fight, but didn't. They spoke about it a little bit more before Liz ended the call when General Morrows walked in her office. "'We have a situation,' he said. "'What now?' Liz asked. "'A holding center for those who come in asymptomatic, Sector 19. "'What about it?' "'We had an outbreak there. Fifteen turned, and another dog.' "'Jesus,' Liz said." We have over a hundred people in that facility, Morrow said. How many men over there? Liz asked. Two dozen. That's not my concern, Morrow said. What is? We've integrated several dozen in town. Even though they are watched, they can turn on a dime. It seems strange to me that so many turned at the one-year mark, making me believe that is as long as the asymptomatic phase lasts. If that's the case, we may be facing a hell of a situation on our hands in town. And we have how many troops in town? Sixty. Liz exhaled. What do you suggest? Honestly, Morrow said. Forget Sector 19. The infected would have to cross the bridge and we can stop them. Pull all available men and station them in town. If you think that's best, Liz said. Right now, being proactive is our best option. Good. We only have to wait a few days. The scientist will be here with the cure, and soon enough we can put this behind us. Are you sure about that? Morrow's asked. That there really is a cure? I hope to God there is, because if there isn't, there's no point in doing this anymore, Liz said. Let's face it, we can't keep up. South Bend, Indiana They stopped, just on the outskirts of the city, two miles from Rachel's neighborhood. Already they started to see the dead, and they weren't even in the city. Well, Riggs stated as he stepped off the EPEV, looks like everything we did in Elkhart is for naught. They never got to South Bend. Rachel asked, Do we know how bad it is? Did she say? Zeus answered, It isn't that bad. The dead don't stay where there isn't any food, unless there's zids. Then it's as if they don't know any better. Isn't that strange? Rachel said. How every team has a different name for things. Wait. She snapped her finger, lifted it up to tell them to hold on, reached in her back pocket, unfolded a sheet of paper, looked at it, and said, now that's stranger than a trap door in a canoe. Yates shook his head in confusion. Did you just look at a cheat sheet for a bad Fred saying? I did, Rachel replied. I didn't learn them all yet, but I promised Fred I'd say them. Isn't it funny? Casper laughed. So, 
funny. No, Yates said. No, it's not. Can we... Riggs stated. Can we get back to letting Zeus finish his thoughts? Yes, please, Yates added, before that intelligence switch goes off. Zeus grumbled. Anyhow, what I was saying... He paused. Riggs nodded once at Zeus. You were saying... I was saying... Off, Yates blurted out. Rachel and her dumb Fred sayings made him completely forget. Shut up, Zeus snapped. I remember now. We were talking about South Bend, how the Zids would still be there, but the others probably dispersed to look for food. Yates tossed up his hands. How is it going to be possible to get all the dead from all over the country? They're going to have to clean sweep, like they do in major cities, Zeus replied. Dude, we've seen... What what happened in St. Louis? Casper said. 25% of that city is burnt out. Have you seen Los Angeles? Zeus asked. I saw it before the virus, Casper said. Yeah, then you know how many people lived there and you know the amount of zids there had to be, Zeus explained. The brain's what's controlling the undead, so you have to massively destroy the brain. They use thermobaric bombs. How does that work out? Yates asked. They suck the oxygen out of the air. But, Zeus lifted a finger, it creates a vat of pressure that pretty much destroys the brain, causes enough damage to put them down. Tall buildings have some burns, but nothing like St. Louis. Bombing cities is above our pay grade, Yates said. I could bomb South Bend with the EPEV. And you wonder why everyone wants you dead, Zeus said. Yates laughed, then turned to get back on the EPEV. He stopped. Okay, we have company. Rachel turned her head to see four undead making their way quickly to the EPEV. She reached for her honing rod. Riggs stopped her. Hold off. They're coming, Rachel replied. You want us to just stand here? No, Riggs replied. I think it's time to put Casper to the test and see what he can do. If they go for him, he's skilled enough to take them out. If he truly can walk among them, then he's fine. We need to know. Casper didn't say anything. He merely pulled out his gladius and walked toward the oncoming group of dead. Fred walked alongside Liz down the corridor of the Resting Meadows retirement home. I'm really glad you let me come to see Barry. He'll be happy to see you, Liz told him, and I'm happy to escort you. I know y'all think I'm going to change your turn. You do know there's a freeze. Liz stopped walking. What do you mean? I mean, I've seen people turn that had the dormant virus... It's not like they're walking down the street and suddenly they're a zombie. There's a freeze. They literally just stop. Like this. Fred didn't move. His eyes didn't blink. His hands froze. Then they do this. He went back to his frozen position. Then his head dropped forward along with his arms. Then they stay that way about 30 seconds before they turn. I've seen it about a half dozen times. Always the same. Then what? How do they act? Like a pro. I'm sorry, what? Liz asked. Okay, so when someone that's bit or got the fever virus, they turn and move slow. I mean, like a herd of turtles. I call them beginners. That lasts a couple days. After that, they run. They run. Don't get winded, just vicious. Until their body starts to break down and then they move slower. But a dormant virus person, Fred snapped his finger, they go from zero to sixty. That's really good information, Liz said. When I was out there early on fighting them, fighting for my life... I encountered both fast and slow. Never paid attention to the stages and time frames. Somewhere in the journey, I went back to being political. Any time I can be of insight, just let me... Fred paused at the doorway to the recreation room. Good Lord, on a high mountain in Nevada! Who is that vision of beauty in such an ugly world? I apologize, ma'am, if my forwardness is offensive. Not at all. Liz was curious as to what Fred was talking about, or rather to whom he was referring... The second she peeked inside, the thought that crossed her mind was, I should have known. Liz cleared her throat. Yes, Gretchen, she's... she's different. She's amazing. All Liz wanted to say was, not really, but she refrained. Liz was never a shallow woman. She never let petty jealousy mark her view of another woman. In fact, if she saw a beautiful woman, Liz would always comment on beauty. She judged beauty not by the exterior, but interior of a person as well. Gretchen was a nice and good person, but her appearance certainly never warranted the reaction she got from so many people. Gretchen was odd, 
a young woman of maybe thirty, if that. Her age was hard to tell. When Liz first saw her, the first thought that went through her mind was Gretchen reminded her of the character Fran, the Romanian champ in the movie Dodgeball, only much, much thinner. In fact, Gretchen was rail thin, with short, dark pigtails and a near unibrow. Gretchen had worked at Resting Meadows before the virus as an activities assistant, and still remained in the position of lifting people's spirits. She wore her scrubs quite differently. The top was cut short and tied above her belly, exposing the hawk tattoo, and the pants rested at her bony hip bones. She spoke with a slightly nasal meets slushy style of speaking. But if there was anything Liz envied about Gretchen, it was her self-confidence. Perhaps it just shone through, because almost every single man that came in contact with her was mesmerized. Hey, everyone! Gretchen stood before a group of six. Look, it's the president! Yay! She jumped a couple times and clapped. Mrs. President, you're just in time for charades. Care to join us? No, no, Gretchen, thank you. Liz waved her hand back and forth. I just came so Fred here could visit his friend Barry. Fred. Gretchen walked to him. Fred extended his hand. So nice to meet you. Gretchen turned her hand slightly sideways and daintily shook Fred's hand. Pleasure. So, Barry's your friend. He doesn't want to play with us. Barry's a serious guy, Fred nodded. I'll speak to him. Don't bother, a woman in the circle called out. He's just nasty. Oh, Agnes, Gretchen playfully scolded. We all remember how moody you were when you arrived. Barry's over there behind the confessional wall, Fred, sitting with Lance. I'm sorry, the confessional wall. Gretchen pointed to the flowered folding partition. Our priest comes in weekly to hear confessions over there. In a nursing home? Fred asked. Assisted living, Fred. Assisted living, Gretchen corrected. Okay, still, Fred said. Once a week confessions? I mean, what kind of sins do they commit where they need to confess once a week? You'd be surprised, Fred, Gretchen said. You'd be surprised. Okay, well then, that's good to know. Thank you, Fred nodded. Liz smiled. Continue, Gretchen. Sorry to interrupt. Gretchen spun with a bubbly nature, arms waving in the air, and ran back to the group of six. Fred, I'm going to let you visit with Barry. I'll wait in the hall, Liz said. You don't want to do charades? Might be good for you to get involved with the constituents. Liz chuckled, then looked over as the excited group shouted out wrong answers to Gretchen's charades. Um, maybe. Go visit. I'll do that. Fred walked toward the confessional area. Jen, Barry laid down the card. You okay? Yeah, just got a headache. Lance rubbed his temple. If she wasn't so beautiful, I'd get annoyed with all that yelling Gretchen does. She is a beaut. Barry gathered the cards. Wish I had someone like that to pump up morale at my restaurants. Although, he began shuffling the cards. I had pretty good morale. You had the best roast beef sandwiches. Thank you. Knock, knock, Fred called out. Barry set down the cards. Oh my goodness, Fred! Hiya, Barry. Fred shook his hand and placed a hand on Barry's shoulder. You look good. Pain isn't bad, Barry replied. Hate being laid up. Wish I was out with the others. Me too. Sorry to hear about your condition, Barry told him. We could handle you, Fred, if you, you know, turned. Lance groaned out and... Oh, you're one of the unfortunates. Unfortunates? Fred asked. Fred, Barry introduced them. This is my new friend, Lance. Lance, this is Fred, one of my Eliminator members. Unfortunates, Lance explained. People that have the dormant virus and can change on a dime. But how did you get to be an Eliminator if you aren't immune? I was bit. Several times, Fred shrugged. Never turn. Good for you. Lance said, then nodded down to his amputation. I didn't turn, but I wasn't fortunate enough to just walk away. Between you and me, I wasn't letting them chip off anything. I just lucked out. I had that attitude, Lance said. Then I saw what they were doing with prosthetics, and it changed my mind. I'll keep that in mind. Fred pulled up a chair. They only let me out a short spell. You know what? Lance inched back. I'm not really feeling too hot, so I'm going to let you two visit. You sure? Barry asked. Maybe you should call a nurse. Nah, I'm just tired. He wheeled back from the table. Enjoy your visit. Get some rest, 
Barry told him. Once he was gone, he reached over and grabbed Fred's hand. Good to see you, Fred. Really, it is. I miss you guys. I know it's only been a couple of days, but I miss you. I wish I was still part of the team. You will be again, Barry said. I promise. No one is supposed to know this, but... He dropped his voice. A cure's coming. That's where the team went, to escort it back. So you see, in no time, you'll be right back with us. I hope. I can still be useful, Fred replied. They just need to see that. They will. Barry spoke with confidence, and he believed it. The whole thing would be over soon. The threat of the virus would die out as soon as the team returned. Then it would just be a matter of cleaning up the dead. Chapter 12 Life Trophies South Bend, Indiana Strangely, watching Casper walk up to the dead didn't breed excitement. It bred fear and worry in Rachel. It was perfect, and she was certain in his mind he was saying, Look at me, I'm Murphy! But her mind didn't scream any excitement. They were all prepared to fire upon the few dead that moved at a moderate pace. Casper held his weapon, extended out, ready to strike, ready to be pummeled. But the pummeling never happened. The dead didn't even see him. He was able to slaughter them with ease. They never saw it coming, never even attempted to attack. It just looked so easy. It was for Casper. The dead were focused on the living. So what did that say about Casper? Watching was reminiscent of the feeling Rachel experienced when she learned that Casper had been infected and would turn. A weeping sadness she hid. Placing on a brave face, then leaving the Center City Hospital, racing to her dorm room, and sobbing into a pillow so no one would hear. Not again. Not another person she loved. It was horrible. But then Casper never really left. Not really. He was in there still, and he found the strength and the spirit to return. As he took down the dead, it only made Rachel fearful that maybe his return, their time together, was temporary. It was a strong gut instinct. If that were the case, she was going to enjoy every second she had with Casper. No regrets, but nothing lasts forever. He returned to the EPEV and was greeted with congratulations and good job. Yates was still curious about Casper and the dogs. Rachel hugged him and asked him if he was okay, and he was. She thought about it the rest of the way to her neighborhood, her thoughts drifting on how different things would have been had Casper not succumbed to spear injuries, how they probably wouldn't even be pulling onto her street. It was also Rachel's way of dealing with the nervousness of going back home. She looked out the window of the familiar neighborhood. Cars were dirty, untouched for a year. The grass was incredibly high. Undead wandered the streets, just like when they were alive. One woman still clutched a shopping bag. Well, this is not what I expected, Yates said. Rachel felt the EPEV come to a stop. We're here? This is the address, Yates said. Is this not your street? Yeah, it is. That red house is mine. Her portion of the street was a small cul-de-sac with eight houses, all of them the same. Cape Cod-style houses constructed in the 1950s. Small homes with a triangular roof. Each house had two windows on the first floor, a door in the center, and from the roof protruded two dormers. Rachel's house was red, center of the cul-de-sac. The driveway went to the back of the house, and the flat front yard had a walkway that led up two steps to the small front porch. It was an inconsequential, modest home with a budget white screen door they had purchased from Home Depot. The EPEV pulled directly in front of the house, and Rachel stood slowly, then walked to the door. "'Are you all right?' Riggs asked her. "'Yes, thank you.' "'Okay, everyone,' Riggs called out. "'We don't want to draw any dead if we don't have to, so... "'Silencer's on in case you have to shoot.' "'Rach,' Casper said. "'Finally get... get to see your house. "'See the Rachel before all this.' Yates mumbled. Doesn't look like you'll learn much. Dude, don't be rude about my friend's house. I'm not, Yates defended. It's just not what I expected to pull up to. I mean, I had this vision in my mind. Rick said you met at a resort in the Bahamas. Oh, you thought I was rich, Rachel said, then chuckled. Far from it. My husband was a school teacher. I was a homemaker and volunteered a lot. I won that vacation. 
Trust me, we couldn't afford vacations. So you didn't have a job outside the home? Yates asked. I did. Many. None that lasted or are worth talking about. It was best that I was always there for the kids to take them where they needed to go. Cliff worked part-time at the grocer. The Eliminators is the longest job I've held. For what it's worth, Zeus said. It's a great house, just like the one I grew up in. And your kids, they wanted you more than a bigger house. Bet me. My kids. Rachel shivered a breath, then puckered some. They would have rather had an iPad, but, hey, we made the best of it. She reached for the door. Anyone coming? Riggs turned around. Yates, Zeus, you guys want to keep a watch out here? Only if I can go inside after. Yates stood and put the silencer on his rifle. I'm curious, too, to see who Rachel was before all this. You guys are going to be so disappointed. I was just a housewife and a mom. She opened the EPEV door and stepped out. There was a smell to the neighborhood, damp, sour. A slight chilly breeze moved the air. Rachel stood outside the vehicle, waiting for the others to exit. After Casper and Riggs, Zeus stepped out, looking left to right. Then came Yates, both ready to protect. Do you hear that? Yates asked. It was the sound of a clinking metal, like a dog chain on a backyard runner line. Yeah, Riggs said. What the hell is that? The sound picked up in pitch, which told Rachel the chain was unraveling quickly. There! Zeus pointed to the house next to Rachel's. Rachel turned. Sure enough, a stiff moved hurriedly from the side of the house, but he was attached to a chain. What the hell? asked Zeus. Pete Watson, Rachel said. Pete Watson reached the end of the line with the chain. He tried to reach them, his arms extended, legs moving and not making any progress. His wife probably chained him up, Rachel said. Look at his neck. He was bit. She knew he would turn. She probably let him suffer out there. I don't blame her. She shrugged. He was such a dick. I never liked him. He was always complaining and bothering us. Pop. Pete Watson took a shot to the head and dropped. Yates lowered his weapon. Now he bothers you no more. Dude, Casper faced him. I'm seeing a pattern with you. You just shoot anything without hesitation. Problem with that? Yates asked. May maybe it's not always a g good thing to be f fast. May maybe it is, Yates replied, then grunted, nearly doubling over when Zeus backhanded him in the gut. Sorry, Zeus apologized. My hand slipped. Almost with a stomp, Yates turned to him. You think because you're this oversized macho rustler that no one can take you on and beat you? Yes, Zeus replied. Don't tempt me. Yates pointed his finger. Gentlemen, Riggs said with a soft warning. Cut the shit. Language, Casper said. Riggs raised an eyebrow and slowly looked at Casper. Really? Dude, he shrugged. Someone has to be the moral compass. Let's just... Rachel held up her hand. Let's do this. She walked up the pathway to the house. There was a frog-shaped flower pot on the porch with fake flowers, and she reached into it. Don't tell me you leave the keys in there, Riggs asked. Yeah, it was for the neighbor, not Pete, to check my cats. Oh, Casper groaned out. Man, you know they're probably dead. Yeah, I know. Rachel propped open the screen door with her body and brought the key to the door. Cats are pretty resourceful, Riggs commented. They may have been alive. Unfortunately, Rachel unlocked the door. Jaggers and Snaps were pretty lazy house cats. Casper snickered. Jaggers and Snaps. Did your kids pick out those names? No, I did. Even better. Rachel stepped inside the house. There was no foyer, just a direct entrance into the living room. It wasn't a big house. The kitchen doorway was in direct eyesight as soon as they stepped into the home. On the first floor was the typical Cape Cod layout. Living room, large eat-in kitchen, bathroom, and bedroom. The other two bedrooms were on the upper level. Rachel didn't walk too far into the house. She stopped just behind the couch. Her heart beat so fast and chest felt so heavy, too heavy, making it hard to breathe. It's okay. Riggs laid a comforting hand on her back. I've been in this position. Take a breath. Remember all the good. 
Rachel nodded. Oh, man, Rach! Casper walked around her. He pushed aside a couch pillow, then lifted a blanket. Oh, man! He walked to the kitchen and closed the open cabinets. Oh, man, I'm so sorry that looters or squatters messed up your house. What? Rachel asked. What are you talking about? They came in and just made a mess, Casper said. No, this is the way we left it, Rachel replied. We were in a hurry. We had the flight times wrong and had to rush. Oh, Casper replied, then opened up the kitchen cupboard again. So no one stole your food? No, we didn't buy much before we left. We were saving money to spend on the trip. That's cool. Casper wandered further into the kitchen and out of sight. Ignore him, Riggs whispered in Rachel's ear. He's super desensitized to stuff. It's fine. My house wasn't always this messy. It wasn't always perfect, either. Hey, Rach! Casper called out. Your cats may have lived. There's a hole in the screen. See? Riggs gave her a gentle nudge. Cats are resourceful. Um, never mind, Casper said. Found jaggers or snaps. Rachel rushed into the kitchen. Casper stopped her. Don't. It's not pretty. Casper, please. I'm an eliminator. I've seen it all. Rachel stepped forward when Casper moved out of the way. Okay, maybe not. The former feline lay on its side. It had decomposed to a point where all that remained were a thin layer of fur on the skeleton of its head and rump. The entire midsection was nothing but bones. Clearly, it had been eaten by something. Dude, Casper said. I think we know now why we don't see any cats. There's not much left of them after they were eaten. Casper... Riggs scolded. Be sensitive. Sorry. Back door is unlocked, Casper said. So someone was in here. Probably the neighbor feeding them, Rachel replied. Or on them. Casper, Riggs mourned again. Sorry. Rachel sighed and walked back to the living room. Speaking of open doors, Riggs pointed to the front door. Want me to close that? Doesn't matter. Which one was it? Casper asked. Jaggers or snaps? Jaggers, Rachel answered. I named him after Mick Jagger. The other one's gold, or was gold, like Sugar Snaps, the cereal. Wow. Riggs stood by the door. I loved Sugar Snaps. He's still gold, Casper said. Briefly, Rachel felt excitement. If Casper was saying he was still gold, that meant he saw Snaps. Maybe the cat was truly resourceful and alive. Until she heard it. Almost as demonic sounding as a growler, Rachel heard the screeching meow, and knew before she even turned to look. It was Snaps, all right. One eye missing. It arched its back in attack mode. Its tail, or what was left of it, was straight up. Dude, Casper said. It looks like the yellow version of the pet cemetery cat. Snaps didn't really notice Casper, which sort of answered the question of whether zombie dogs would attack him. But Snaps did see Riggs, and the moment the cat noticed him, he raged forward. Riggs was fast. He lunged for the screen door, pushing it open with his body, and Snaps ran right by him and out. Pop! Quickly, Riggs did a double-take and looked out. Rachel and Casper ran to the door as well. Yates stood outside and gave a thumbs up. All's good, he yelled. Man! Casper shook his head. That dude is fast! There was a fireplace in Rachel's living room. It obviously didn't work. It was blocked with a decorative screen. Rachel had taken the photographs from the mantel, along with a few knickknacks, but it surprised Casper what she didn't take. On both sides of the fireplace were two older cabinets with shelves. They were built into the corners of the walls and had see-through cabinet doors. The one on the right had books, stuff Rachel and her family not only never read, but never touched. The dust was thick in there a lot thicker than a year's worth. On the left, that cabinet had other things on the shelf. It was like the Rachel Achievement Cabinet. Everything in there was about Rachel. Casper knew right away she hadn't done that herself. Rachel wasn't full of herself. But the picture frames with the words, My Wonder Wife and Amazing Mom, told Casper her family was proud of everything she did. In one of the pictures, she was in a hospital holding an award stating she was a volunteer of the year. The other, she was with her kids and husband. 
Casper opened the cabinet and grabbed that picture. Rachel know you're taking that stuff? Yates asked. Dude, you're supposed to be guarding. Dude, Zeus is a one-man army. Yates walked toward Casper. Where's Riggs? Upstairs with Rach, the kids' room. Ah, Yates nodded. What did you take? I need a box. I'm not leaving this stuff. Casper handed him the picture. Apparently they were all there when she got that. Rachel's a black belt? Yates asked, shocked, looking at the family photo. Well, that proves to me a theory I had, that really it's not practical. I've never seen her use it. Yeah, me neither. Probably just an exercise thing. But this... Yates reached around Casper and grabbed a small trophy. This doesn't surprise me. First place marksmanship. All this stuff. It's a part of Rachel she never shared. I mean, why is she leaving this? Her husband was, like, mad proud of her. Why does she want to leave some of it behind? You answered it, Yates said. It's a part of her she doesn't want to share, and... and she doesn't want to remember. All of this is a reminder of a life she had and lost. This Rachel, Yates pointed to the cabinet, is gone. You're right. Still, I'm keeping this. He lifted the picture, then shut the cabinet. You know... Sometimes you aren't that b bad. You could be n nice. Th thanks, asshole. Casper shook his head with a smile and walked away. He paused, looking up the stairs before going outside. Riggs stood in the tiny area at the top of the stairs that separated the two bedrooms. He watched, arms folded, head down, listening to Casper talk while waiting on Rachel, who was in her son's room. He didn't want to rush her or bother her. He had been in that same position. One year after losing his family, he too went back to his house. It brought the feelings of devastation back to the surface. The painful heartache was played out all over again while he tried to figure out what he was going to take and keep. The truth was, no number of photos were going to bring them back. It took a couple years before they brought him comfort instead of pain. More than anything, he wanted to tell Rachel that. Like he had done, she sat on the unmade bed, holding a toy in her hand. It was a Lego model of a Star Wars ship, and she stared at it. A bit of dust caused a tickle in his throat, and despite trying to stifle it, he coughed. "'You don't have to stand out there,' Rachel said. "'I don't want to intrude or bother you. "'You're not a bother, Riggs. Come in.' Riggs walked into the bedroom. "'He kept his room neat. "'Yeah, he did.' He used to lecture us on how to load the dishwasher, Rachel chuckled. Smart kid. He was, but different, you know. She handed him the Lego model. Brad loved his Legos. All boys do, no matter how old. Riggs sat on the bed next to her. How did you decide, Rachel asked. How did you decide what to take? I took some pictures and a couple things like this. He touched the model. The rest, I hired a moving company boxed everything and stuck it in storage. It's still in that storage unit. That was smart. You can go back any time, Rachel said. So can you, Rach. You don't need to pick and choose what part of your life was worthy enough to take with you. This is going nowhere. We can come back any time. It's not like you're selling it or new tenants are moving in. Is that why you put everything in storage? Rachel asked. Because you sold the house? Oh, hell no. I used the insurance money to pay off the mortgage, and then I had the house torn down. I never wanted to see it again. The house murdered my family. At least in my mind, that was the case. So I tore it down and sold the lot. Do you ever regret it? Sometimes. You know, it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to cry. Rachel chuckled sadly. I cried enough. It's just a private thing. I get that. Plus, crying is for the living... When you cry, you cry over your own losses. It's not bringing anyone back. Nothing brings them back, unless they're the undead. True. Well... Rachel reached behind her and pulled forward a backpack. She took the model and placed it inside, then stood. I'm done. Are you sure? I'm positive. She shouldered the bag. I have what I want to take. And like you said, I can come back. Absolutely. She stepped from the room, pausing on that little landing. 
She gazed into Sammy's room, standing there for a moment in reflection, before taking a deep breath and walking down the stairs. I'm ready, she said when she hit the bottom of the staircase. Casper turned around. Dude, like, this is a shrine to your accomplishments. Your husband was proud. He was corny. None of that was worth making that big a deal out of. I'm ready to go. She walked to the door and opened it. Once outside, she and Riggs paused when they saw the small mound of bodies. She glanced to Riggs. They were eliminating. That's our job. Did you want to stay for the night in the neighborhood? Riggs asked. No. Rachel shook her head. Let's make some distance, stop for the night, and get to Galena in the morning. Sounds good. Riggs whistled once to catch Zeus's attention as he stood on the porch of the next house. Hey, we're headed out. Zeus gave a thumbs up. Clearly, he was spray-painting the E marking. In fact, when Riggs looked around, nearly every home in the cul-de-sac had been marked. After finishing, he made his way to them. We're not staying, Zeus asked. I cleared the street. We're going to go, Riggs said. But good job. Thanks. Rach, Casper called out. I locked your back door. Do you want this closed and locked? Yes, please. Thanks. Rachel replied, then looked to Zeus. Can I have that? She pointed to the spray can. Sure. He handed it over. I'll be right back. She shook the can as she walked to the door. Casper stepped aside. Using the wall space next to the front door, Rachel painted an E. She put the unit and division code down as well. Then, before she stepped back, she gave it a personal touch. Perhaps her way of making a memorial or leaving part of herself there. She painted a heart around the E. At the bottom, she painted an X and O, and the word, Mom. Then she turned, stepped off the porch, handed the can to Zeus, and, saying no more, got into the Epeth. Chapter 13. Floodgates. April 22nd, Day 368, Center City, West Virginia. Carson had been in the Navy two years before the outbreak. Fairly new in the military, yet with enough experience to be handed a weapon after the world went to shit and started to rebuild. Carson wasn't old. In fact, he just turned old enough to legally drink when it all went down. How so many survived was still beyond his comprehension. The virus spread fast, and all those that died turned at once. Now it seemed as if those who were asymptomatic were turning at the same time in large numbers. Until everyone that carried it was either cured or dead, sadly the world would not return to normal, no matter how hard they tried. Center City was a different entity. One of six safe cities in the area, it, like the others, was easily barricaded. The only problem with that, while there were few ways to enter, it also meant there were very few ways to get out. Progress to return to normalcy had made great leaps and bounds, even if at times it was a facade. Carson was on early shift. The sun wasn't even up yet when he arrived at his post. It was an important post. There were six bridges over the Kanawha River that connected the west to Center City. Two of them remained. The others purposely destroyed. One bridge was a checkpoint, and the other was closest to the area that held the asymptomatic research, testing, and holding facility. The 38th Street Bridge was barricaded by a fence, and vehicles were placed in front. Nothing ever really happened there, a straggler undead here and there. For that reason, only four soldiers took post each shift. He could hear the sound of music, something old and 80s playing, as he stepped on the bridge. Only two were there when Carson arrived. They were some 50 feet before the barricade, playing poker on a card table set up. The music, Carson figured, came from the jeep parked near them. Where are the others? Carson asked. They went home about 20 minutes ago, the soldier answered. It was quiet and we knew one of you would show up soon. Well, I'm here, Carson said. Early, too, the soldier added. As soon as someone else shows, one of us can leave. Carson nodded and took a step to the jeep. The wind blew and he caught the scent of the dead. Don't you guys smell that? One of the card-playing soldiers shrugged. Once in a while, it's coming from the river. Smells close, Carson said. The river's close. No, I mean closer than usual. Carson found the music annoying and distracting. They weren't supposed to be playing it at all, but he wouldn't say anything to command. He reached inside the jeep and shut off the music. Hey, one soldier yelled. We were listening. Too bad. 
dick growl. And it wasn't just one. It carried like a choir of an unintelligible mesh of voices, harmonizing in a demented way. One of the soldiers jumped up from his seat, knocking over the chair. Carson, remaining calm, reached into the jeep, turned on the spotlight, and turned it to aim in the direction of the barricade. He didn't flinch. He should have. Packed against the fence like sardines was an enormous horde of the undead, all snapping their jaws, pushing into the fence and trying to reach through. Carson lifted his radio. Command, come in. We have a problem. Galena, Illinois The strange but pleasant and overwhelming smell of bacon was what woke Yates from a sound sleep. He caught the aroma while he slumbered in his small tent on top of the EPEV. At first, he thought maybe it came from Galena, since they were parked right down the road. Then he realized it was Zeus, who was playing master chef on the exterior pull-out stove. They arrived the night before. It was late, taking the rare chance and driving into the night. But there was a debate between the Eliminators if anyone was even in the town. Had they all died since they communicated with Center City? Galena was, like Center City, located ideally for secluded survival. Nestled between a river and a large hillside, a huge floodgate, thick and high, blocked the entrance where they had arrived. It was late, sure, but not past midnight. They knocked, called out, and even beeped. Not only did it not summon any dead, it didn't summon a response from the town, either. Riggs placed a call to Center City Command in hopes they could find out, which included a call to command in St. Louis. St. Louis had been in constant communication with them and didn't understand what the issue was that they weren't opening the door, especially since they knew the flaming saffrons were arriving. Command, too, wondered if things fell apart. It happened that way in towns, fast and furious. Perhaps the dead were locked behind the gate. Surely someone would be on watch. They discussed it for a while before all of them turned in. With the smell of bacon, Riggs knew it was time to get his wits, and with the rest of the team, attempt to get into the town. If Zeus made bacon, maybe he made coffee, Yates thought. It was hard to tell. The smell of bacon drowned out all sense, and Rachel, smoking like a chimney the night before, doubled his normal morning stuffiness. Chilled, Yates grabbed his jacket, crawled from the tent, and climbed down the EPEV. He jumped down the last two rungs of the vehicle's ladder. Your cooking woke me. Am I the first one up? Yates asked Zeus. No, I am. I mean, Riggs, Rachel, Casper. Casper doesn't really sleep. Zeus paused in turning the bacon and used the tongs to point. Yates looked and jumped. Casper just stood in the shadows, staring. Fucking freaky, Yates said. Casper laughed. I knew it would get you. He walked near Zeus. Good call, dude. Asshole, Yates said. He looked to the sky. It was starting to get light. So what's with the pre-dawn feast? I'm hungry, Zeus replied. We all ate an early supper, and I figured... He started to put the bacon on a plate. If there are people in there, they'll respond once they smell the bacon. Wait, are you... Are you telling me the reason you're making bacon is to lure the survivors of Galena? Yep, Zeus nodded. Nothing carries like bacon. That's absurd, Yates said. Dude, it's a good idea. No, it's not. Yeah, it is, Casper argued. Everyone loves bacon, Zeus said. No, no they don't, Yates shook his head. There are people who not only dislike it, but hate the smell of it. Who, Zeus asked. I don't know, Yates replied. People. People love the smell of bacon, Zeus said. My idea will work. The smell carries. There was a squeaking sound, and the side door to the EPEV opened. Riggs walked out. Man, that smells good. Tell me you made coffee. I did. Zeus smiled and looked at Yates. See? Everyone loves the smell. Oh, my God. Rachel groaned out as she stepped from the EPEV. Why am I smelling bacon? I hate that stuff. See? Yates said. Still, Zeus said. Love it or hate it, the smell is waking people. Dude, Casper said. It woke you. Yes, it did, but... Yates swung out his arm, pointing to the closed floodgates. No one responded last night. They're all dead in there. So unless zombies suddenly acquired a love for bacon, those gates aren't opening. The loud clanking sound precluded the long squeal of metal. Yates turned his head to see the flood doors of Galena open. A man sheepishly walked out. 
Morning. Is that bacon I smell? Yates dropped his arm and looked at Zeus. Zeus grinned widely. Center City, West Virginia. Liz knew it was an abuse of power, but she wanted to get started for the day. It was the anniversary of her family's death, and she wanted to get her work done, then go back to her apartment and sulk. Starbucks had just opened its doors, and already the line was twenty people deep. The sky was barely light, and the golden glow of the lights inside of Starbucks was welcoming. Excuse me, Liz said apologetically. I'm so sorry. Can I just get up front? I have so much work to do. Everyone knowing that she was the president graciously stepped aside so she could get her latte. It was wrong. She knew it. She should have waited in line, but perhaps fate played a role in her selfish decision to cut the line. She received her vanilla latte and asked for a straw so her lipstick didn't smudge. Sipping the drink, she pushed the door, stepped outside, and stopped. The wet slurping sound caught her attention, and lips still encompassing the straw. Liz shifted her eyes to her left. On the sidewalk, not ten feet from her, an undead dined on the midsection of what Liz figured was a potential Starbucks customer wearing a bright purple blouse. Her reaction was a barely audible gasp, but in the early morning, it was loud enough to draw the attention of the dead. The creature lifted its head; guts and blood dripped from its jaw. The poor woman who lay victim on the sidewalk was still alive. She turned her head and coughed out blood. Help me! Liz would have had the undead creature not decide to stop mid-meal and lunge for her. Still clutching her latte, Liz spun and raced to the door. She flung it open and raced back inside. She had no choice but to drop the latte and grab the door handle, holding it with all her might as the undead fought to get inside. Someone! Liz shouted. Someone help! The door rattled. The independent acoustic-sounding music played, and Liz held on. Eventually, someone would help hold that door, because she knew it wouldn't be long before she lost that battle, and Starbucks would become a feasting ground. Chapter Fourteen, Midwest Unrest, Galena, Illinois. Riggs found it amusing. He stood in his standard pose, arms folded, watching the back and forth between Zeus, Yates, and the Galena man. Just one piece, the Galena man requested. Zeus would lift a piece of bacon, and Yates would grab it and eat it. Just one tiny piece, the man asked again, and again Zeus tried to give him one, only to be intercepted by Yates. What is your problem, Galena man asked Yates. My problem? My problem is we tried to get in here last night. Yeah. We yelled, we beeped, we radioed. Hell, I even pulled out my guitar and played "Hunk a Burn in Love." Good job, by the way, Galena man said. Why didn't you answer? In case you were marauders. Are you kidding me? You're kidding me, right? Marauders. If we were bad guys, would we have knocked, played music? Hey, now, who knows what tactics the bad guys of today use? You're right, Yates nodded. And I'm a bad guy because there are three pieces of bacon left, and he swiped them from the plate. You're out of luck. You're in luck, Rachel said brightly as she stepped from the epev. I just checked supply. We have plenty, so no groveling to these assholes. She extended two packs of preserved bacon. Yates intercepted. No, no, you don't. Yes, yes, I do, Rachel said. There are ten packs. Five of us means two packs each. I hate bacon, so we can have mine. Riggs, Yates called his attention. Your commander, make the decision. Technically, it's the food person," Riggs replied. "Zeus picked up the supplies. He makes the call. Then I say, Zeus took those packs from Rachel. Give it to him. Yes. The Galena man clenched his fist and happily took the packs. Yates groaned. Can we at least go and see your town? No. No. Yates repeated. No. They said no strangers. Galena man said, especially one of those. He pointed to Casper. Rachel gasped. "You bigoted dick, discriminating against my friend, dude. You suck," Casper said. Galena man gasped. "It talks? Holy shit!" Again, Rachel gasped in offense. "It, it." Yates nodded at her, and you freely gave up the bacon. Rachel reached for it. "Can't." Galena man pulled back. "No give backs," and I'm sorry, guys. Take the scientist. 
This not letting you in isn't my call. I'd let you in. It's out of my hands. Yes, it is. Zeus took a step forward and grabbed the bacon. He moved closer to the man. Try to get it off of me. Aren't you the bully? Galena man shook his head, reiterating why we don't let people in. Okay. Riggs waved out his hand. All right. Everyone on the EPEV. We'll head out. Sir, if you could just hurry Miss Levine along. Doctor. The deeper woman's voice corrected. It's Dr. Levine. Riggs turned to the woman walking toward the EPEV. She was middle-aged with long, gray-blonde hair. It was wavy and wild. She had a stern face and didn't smile. She carried a large duffel-style bag over her shoulder and a silver briefcase that looked identical to the one Casper had with his injection. It had to be medical. Stephanie Levine looked ready to go. She didn't dress like a doctor. In fact, she wore those stretch pants that clung to her legs and a longer T-shirt to hide her apple shape. The first thing that crossed Riggs's mind when he saw her was, thank God, a woman who isn't vain in the apocalypse. He wouldn't tell Rachel he thought that. Surely she would call him her stock name of sexist. Can I help you with that, Dr. Levine? Riggs asked. Thank you. She handed him the duffel bag. Can I carry the case? No, no thank you. She clutched it to her chest. I have this, thank you. The cure? And recipe, she replied. Is this my transportation? It is. Very nice. She walked to the door. And you are? Riggs. Jeremiah Riggs, the commander. I look forward to meeting you all on board, Commander Riggs. Just please. She looked over her shoulder. Get me away from this place. Hopefully to some place safe and somewhat normal. Absolutely, Riggs replied, and watched her board the EPEV. If safe and somewhat normal was what she wanted, then Setter City was about as close to normal as she was going to get, and without a doubt, it was safe. Center City, West Virginia It started out as one undead, turned into ten. All of them formed a wall, pressing against the window at Starbucks, their mouths gnawing at the glass, as if they could actually bite those inside. The door was barricaded and locked, and Liz stood there watching. It reminded her of the one time her son worked at Starbucks, and they let Liz in early to get her drink. The customers lined up outside that day, staring in the windows, angry that Liz was in there. Mrs. President? A young barista handed her a cold, frothy beverage with whipped cream. Here you go. Ah, thank you, Stephen. Liz accepted the beverage and took a drink of the frozen delight. Wonderful. This is what I needed right now. She turned from the undead at the window and faced the crowd in Starbucks. They looked at her for answers, and Liz just didn't have any. Has anyone checked the back? A patron asked. Maybe we can get out that way. No, Liz said abruptly. Leaving is not safe. It's not safe for you or anyone that remains in here. What happened? Someone asked. I don't know, but we all knew this was possible. I wish... She felt the vibration come from her handbag. She knew it was the satellite phone. Give me a second. Maybe I'll have answers now. She pulled the phone from her purse and answered it. This is the president. Ma'am, this is General Morrow's. Liz walked to the window, out of earshot of the others. She knew they didn't want to get anywhere near the window. What's going on? Talk to me. The breach originally occurred at the 38th Street Bridge. We got overrun. More than my men could handle, Morrow's told her. They weren't all from the holding center, either. How many are there? There were a couple hundred. Were, as in, you've been taking them out? Liz asked. We're trying, but I have no idea where the other ones in town are coming from. We have the bridge ones, the river ones. The river? Yes, ma'am, Morrow's replied. We have them coming from the river, and there seem to be some that originated in town. Fresh, very fresh. We think someone turned last night and did some damage. You know how fast this thing moves. Could it have started at Dr. Stevens? We thought that. We've just sent a man over there. He's not answering. It's early. He's probably sleeping. Do you know what you want to do? Liz asked. Our plan is to corner the outbreaks and try our hardest not to destroy the town. We've warned people to stay inside? She asked. Yes, ma'am, but I know that. I just... Liz sighed out when the undead man at the window caught her attention. He was fresh, like Morrow's had mentioned. His face had a huge, gaping hole from the cheekbone to his jaw. His teeth showed. His shirt was saturated and his bloody hands squeaked against the window as he looked like he was trying to talk to her. But she knew he was biting air. You look familiar. Ma'am, 
I'm sorry, General. I'm at Starbucks. I'm trapped inside and we have undead blocking us in. Shall I do a rescue? General Morrows asked. No. Concentrate on the hordes and block the source, Liz replied. Get a hold of the eliminators that are in range. Pull them in to help. Sweep teams as well? Liz paused before answering. Once again, the undead man drew her attention. Why do I know you? Ma'am, I'm sorry. What are you talking about? I asked if you wanted sweep teams. They're destructive, so hold off on sweep teams unless needed. I just... There's a stiff before me. His face is gone and it's hard to tell. Fuck. Fuck! Liz stomped her foot. What's wrong? Forget about Dr. Stevens, she said. I found him. Suffice to say... Liz stared at the revived and undead Dr. Stevens. I think it started at his place. Go check on Fred the Eliminator there. Roger that, ma'am. Liz hung up. She was sad that such a good man like Dr. Stevens had succumbed to a violent form of the virus, but she was also angry and frustrated. Dr. Stevens worked hard on that virus. He was a source of hope for those who turned. Now that was gone. With any luck, his research wasn't. At least the flaming saffrons were retrieving the brilliant Stephanie Levine. Hopefully, when she arrived, not only would she be able to make heads or tails out of Dr. Stevens' research, but there would be a center city left for her to work in. Stephanie Levine lowered the stethoscope, then placed it on the kitchen table in the EPEV. Well, thank you, Casper, she said, for coming out of the shadows and letting me examine you. I wasn't sure how you would handle me. Please, I'm a professional. As a professional, Rachel said, what do you think? He has a heartbeat, blood pressure, respiration. By all intents and purposes, he is alive. But still, Yates added, dead-ish. In a sense. She looked at Rachel. You said he gets injections. Yes, every day, Rachel nodded. I have a case, like yours actually, but it has his daily doses. And you don't know what's in them, Stephanie asked. No, I don't. I just know he can't go very long without one. Then, Yates said, he'll go from dead-ish to rather dead. Dude! Casper shook his head. Unless, Zeus said, you cure him. Yes. Rachel smiled brightly. We picked you up because Liz, the president, said you have a cure. I've been working on one, yes, Stephanie said. Unfortunately, my cure doesn't work on a virus caused by virus-laden blood or saliva. It only works on the organic virus, the pure strain. Rachel nodded. Like the one in the people that can turn instantly. Yes. Stephanie looked at Casper. But that doesn't mean I can't beat your strain. I haven't worked on that one, just the organic one. Speaking of which, Yates said, you've been working on the cure since when? Actually, I've been working on the cure long before the general population knew about this virus. It was around nearly a year before it broke boundaries and got out of control, Stephanie explained. It was quite easy to contain until it mutated enough that people were asymptomatic and it spread like that. She snapped her fingers. Yates continued, So you were working on the cure when all hell broke loose, and you just so happened to be in this small town. No, I was trying to make it to Chicago, and I took refuge in the town, Stephanie said. They were battling the dead inside, but the gates were able to stop more from coming in. Trust me, they didn't take too kindly to strangers and wanted us out. The strangers did all the work. We farmed, we cleaned. The only reason they didn't abuse me was because they knew I had the cure. I cured one of them to prove it. She looked around. He was asymptomatic, and he wasn't after I gave him the injection. How did they know? Yates asked. I mean, if he was asymptomatic, how did they know you cured him? I don't know. They took my word for it, Stephanie said. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't a prisoner. I could leave any time, and good riddance, they would think. I had no safe way to get across the country. The only way my cure was found out was a few of your men from St. Louis were headed toward a survivor camp. I gave them a copy of my data, and the next thing I knew, someone was coming for me and anyone else that wanted to come along. How did you work on the virus in that small town? Yates asked. I mean, I would think it would take a lab. It does, Stephanie answered. Surprisingly, there was a huge lab under the library. Clean, brilliant, illegal. A meth lab? Zeus asked. Actually, yes. Oh, yeah, Zeus boasted. See, I told you. Are you kidding me? Yates asked. You're really going to tell me that you used a meth lab to cure the virus and expect me to believe that? Yes. Yates laughed. The smile instantly dropped from his face when the EPEV slowed down. Hey, Riggs, something wrong? Um, this is interesting, Riggs replied. 
His response caused everyone to rush to the front of the EPEV to look out the windshield. They had moved off the main highway to a secondary route, at least for 50 miles, because outside of Indianapolis, the stopped traffic on the highways due to an exodus was insane. It didn't hamper the phenomenal time they were making. Such good time they contemplated driving straight through, but now they stopped. Fields with high grass and unharvested crops lined both sides of the four-lane road. A man stood on the side of the road in the westbound lane. He moved backwards, staring at the field, appearing not to notice or care about the EPEV a hundred feet away. He wore dark pants, a blue long sleeve shirt, suspenders, and a hat. "'Well, there's something you don't see every day,' Yates said. "'An Amish zombie,' Zeus asked. "'Will we call him an Ambi?' "'Wow,' Rachel added. "'I never even thought about the Amish communities.' "'He's breathtaking,' added Stephanie. Everyone looked at her. "'Quick, Yates!' Casper said. Shoot him. We know how fast you are to take down something that's dangerous and unseen. Riggs shook his head. I don't think he's a zombie. I've never seen one walk backwards. He keeps looking at the field. He looked over his shoulder when he heard the sound of one of his eliminators prepping a rifle. Yates had opened the door, assault rifle ready. Yates, what the hell are you doing? He may not be, Yates said. But that is... He pointed as he stepped out. A horse came from the fields. He moved toward the Amish man, the sight of it clearly torn apart. The horse jerked its head left to right. The only thing that stopped the horse from charging the man was its bitten and gimp leg that kept giving way with every step it took. Yep, Casper commented. There he goes, the zombie animal slayer. Riggs was going to let Yates go and do his thing. He watched as Yates moved down the road, strutting with confident arrogance, moving for a closer shot at the horse. The Amish man just stood there, waiting to be a victim, maybe his way of committing suicide. That was when Riggs saw it. The high grass on the left side of the road began to move quickly. Shit! Riggs jumped up from his seat. Everyone arm up! We're under attack! Was the Amish man insane? Yates wondered, just frozen there, waiting on that horse. It amazed Yates that animals weren't immune at all, which in turn made him think of rats and how they probably were the culprits spreading it so fast. He hated the thought of putting down the undead horse. He liked horses, unlike cats, which were easier. Yates knew he had to get closer. He lifted his rifle to get the animal in his scope as he moved even closer. The Amish man backed up even more and for the first time looked at Yates. Go, he said. Go now. Yates, Riggs yelled. Incoming! We need you to run the EPEV system! Yates heard his request, then he heard something else. The rustling of grass and weeds, and slowly he shifted his eyes to the field. He could see them emerging, fast and agile. The undead. Another shift of his views, he saw his team. Riggs and Casper on the road, Rachel and Zeus emerged on the roof of the EPEV. He wanted to be part of the battle on the road, but knew he was the only one experienced enough to effectively take down a horde. He turned his sight to quickly take out the horse. Base of Halden! shouted the Amish man as he lifted a sword hidden on his right side, raised it high, and with a mighty swift swing forward, he beheaded the horse. The head of the animal popped up and slammed to the ground as the first of the undead emerged from the fields, and Yates shot him. He had to make it back to the Epev and quickly. Riggs was right. There were too many. But it happened so fast. Riggs shouted. The Amish man yelled and beheaded the undead horse. The first undead raced forward, and just as Yates shot him, a crowd of shouting voices came from behind. Just as Yates turned to run back to the EPEV, from the fields on the opposite side of the road emerged a massive army of Amish, all armed with swords and other weapons. Dudes! Casper shouted it. Yes! Yates! Riggs hollered again. The EPEV! Oh, hell no! Yates replied. I'm joining this fight. And he did. He stopped backing up and turned, weapon raised. The Amish had become in their own way an old school army like something from the medieval days. They moved skilled and ready, poised for battle. So many of them. They engaged with the undead without hesitation. Yates only wished he had his sword on him because they were slicing through heads left and right. In all his time on the road as an eliminator, it was something he had never seen, nor did he think he'd ever see, and Yates wasn't going to miss the undead slaughter party. 
he stayed on that road and fought right alongside them. Chapter 15 Overpowered Someplace in Ohio Casper and Rachel giggled like teenagers, sitting in the control room of the EPEV watching the video replay of the battle. Wait, 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 Casper pointed. Watch Yates' face when he realizes the Zeds are coming, Rachel laughed. Then he smiles. He never smiles. I'm so mad I was on the roof. But dude, you got a front row seat. I did. It was pretty awesome watching the Amish emerge from the fields. Rachel turned quickly to the knocking. Riggs stood in the open doorway. You guys coming? he asked. The dead are cleared from the road and burning. Eli said they're setting the table for a meal. They've invited us to join them and stay if we need to. Rachel looked at Casper. Go ahead. I'm going to stay here with Casper. They... they won't accept him. You're wrong, Riggs said. Eli even asked about the pale boy... He said to bring them. They aren't going to slaughter me, are they? Casper asked. I won't let them, but the food smells good. I mean, real good. Okay. Rachel stood. We'll go. Should we bring something? Rach, this isn't like a neighborhood dinner party, Riggs laughed. It's bad manners, Riggs, to go empty-handed, Rachel defended. I totally agree, Rach, Casper said. Let's look through the stash to see what we can bring. What are you watching, anyhow? Riggs asked. Oh, the camera view of the road battle, Casper answered. Dead to the left, Amish to the right, and the Eliminator's not looking anywhere as cool as the Amish. I bet. I think I'll watch it. Riggs stepped forward. I'm trying to get a hold of command. He took a seat. You haven't yet? Rachel asked. You think something's wrong? Riggs shook his head. No, it's fine. Just a bad connection. I'll get through, eventually. After all, he said... What can be wrong in Center City? Center City, Resting Meadows Sandy tried her hardest to hide the fact that the dinner was served with a silver tin cover. She wanted to cook for Barry, but everything was on lockdown and they couldn't go out. He was going to complain. She left the covers in the hall, then knocked once on Barry's door before opening it. Room service, she called out, pushing the card in. Barry stood at the window, balancing on a crutch. "'What the hell are you doing?' she asked. "'You're not supposed to have weight on that.' "'I don't. I'm using a crutch, and I'm trying to see what's going on out there.' "'Well, you won't see much. We're off the main road.' Sandy put the plates on the table. "'This is all the kitchen had. Staff is short.' "'Do we know how bad it is out there?' Barry asked. "'Maybe we should go, Barry, sit, eat. It smells like hospital food.' Well, yeah, that's because it is. Sandy sat down. Looks yummy. Chicken, peas, potatoes, and juice. Barry groaned and hobbled over. He stopped before sitting down. You're kidding me. I promise to make you real food once the crisis is over. Sit. Barry reluctantly did. What is this? Dinner. He glanced down to the plate. Visually, it was all right, but he knew that chicken leg and mound of peas was an optical illusion. He poked his fork into the chicken. It's pureed food, molded to look like what it's supposed to be. That's all there was. He lifted a forkful into his mouth. Ugh, this is tasteless. Sandy placed a salt shaker on the table. Douse it. I swear I'll get us real food soon. Fine. Did you want to go into the rec room and watch a movie? Sandy asked, really trying to act as if she enjoyed her meal. Fagnus doesn't dictate. He exhaled. You know what? Gretchen's working. Bet she can steal us some snacks from the bingo prize closet. Make you a deal. Eat one of those mounds and I'll eat one and we'll go search her out. Deal. They both muddled through the meal as best they could, and Sandy allowed Barry to use crutches, but only if he used both and not just one. They made their way down to the recreation room. Other than the occasionally high-volume television, the hallways were quiet and void of anyone. "'Wonder what's going on,' Barry said. "'They have bingo tonight. Maybe it ended early. Maybe it didn't start yet. Look.' He pointed down the hall. Gretchen carried a tray of bingo balls and waved before stepping into the recreation room. "'God, I hope she doesn't make us play for snacks.' Wow, Gretchen said as she walked into the recreation room. 
There were four residents there, all seated at different tables. Everyone is so quiet and still. I'll get things passed out. We were short-staffed in the kitchen, so I'm a little late. Maybe we can watch an old episode of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman after... Mr. Peach? She called an older gentleman. Mr. Peach stood by his walker by the window, his back to Gretchen. Mr. Peach? She walked up to him, tray of balls in hand. We're going to play now. She reached out to tap his shoulder. When she did, he slowly turned his head and looked at her. Gretchen screamed. It wasn't a normal scream, Barry heard. It was definitely Gretchen, and she cried out short spurts of frightened ahs over and over. As best he could, he vaulted his way on the crutches to the rec room. By the time he and Sandy got there, Gretchen stood center of the room, throwing bingo balls at the residents. A man in a walker clearly had turned and inched his way to her. There were two women seated at the tables. They too had turned, but were having a hard time getting up. They'd rise and fall back down. There was another man there and a woman. They hadn't turned. They watched the events as if it were a live production of something entertaining. Gretchen! Barry called. Help! Gretchen cried out. She'd take a few steps toward the walker man, throw a ball, and back up. Get back, Marv! She yelled at the man. I'm warning you! Back! My God! Sandy said. They're moving so slow! Gretchen! Barry hobbled to her. Calm down! Get out, Mr. Bick! They're deadly! Gretchen cried. She turned when one of the women again tried to get up. Gretchen screeched and hit her with a bingo ball. Gretchen! Barry tried to reason with her. It's okay. They can't get you if you just move. He's coming! She pointed to the man using a walker. Marv! Yes, he is, but it'll take him a while. Let's you and Sandy get the two out of here that haven't turned. And take them where? Gretchen asked. Anywhere other than here, and we'll get in touch with command, Barry said. Sandy, can you help? This has got to be the strangest thing, Sandy said. They're so slow. It's not even dangerous. As long as none of the young workers turn, we'll be fine. Boom. The door to the recreation room opened with a bang. A male aide wearing bloody scrubs stood in a lunging manner. His arms held out to his side as his head went left to right. Sandy looked at Barry. You were saying? Gretchen screamed. Barry saw the bingo ball whiz by and hit the undead aide in the forehead. That's not going to do it. Barry balanced on one crutch, reached behind to the holster he carried concealed on his hip, pulled out the pistol, loaded the chamber, aimed, and fired. The aide went down. Gretchen screeched again, this time short. She turned to Barry, and like a light switch, her demeanor changed. Why do you have a gun? Someplace in Ohio. What it needed was a single scoop of vanilla ice cream, but beggars couldn't be choosers, and Rachel loved that warm and gooey apple pie, ice cream or not. She savored every bite, even though her belly was full beyond belief. It was the first time since the outbreak that she just didn't want to leave. Roasted chicken, potatoes, fresh carrots, and pie. Along with coffee, brewed in a tin pot with fresh-from-the-cow milk. Everything was amazing. Of course, when she told Riggs about wanting to be Amish, he just laughed. He couldn't see her in the clothes. The Amish community had it together. Only one family from that particular area had survived. The massive grouping of Amish were the accumulation of many communities across Ohio and Pennsylvania. They joined up as they sought a safer area, and for the previous nine months they remained in that one place, making a home and keeping the undead away. At least twenty tables were set up outside, in the community circle around the houses. It wasn't that they always took meals that way. They did it for the guests. Zeus nodded when Eli, the leader in his fifties, told of how the undead always found their way to them. But Rachel knew Zeus was more into the pie. Forkful after forkful. We knew we had to rely upon the skills that God has given us, Eli said. So we learned as best we could. I hear you, Zeus said, then lifted his head. Why is he staring at Casper so much? Rachel looked to see what Zeus was talking about. The man at the next table kept looking over. Is he scared? Zeus asked. Because there's no need to be. No, no, Eli stated. I would believe it's because we did not think there would be another like Mary. Mary? Zeus asked. 
Is that like a religious thing? Yes, as he is. Eli nodded at Casper, then looked over his shoulder. Mary, please come here. A woman stood up at the next table. Rachel hadn't noticed the hooded cloak that she wore. It covered most of her face, and she stood at the end of the table. Mary, Eli said, there are others like you. Make acquaintance. Show your face. Mary lifted the hood, exposing her face. She was young like Casper, and her complexion was ghost white, as were her hands. Rachel quickly faced Casper. Dude, Casper said slowly. Whoa. Mary had been hit by the beast several times, Eli said. May I ask, Stephanie spoke up, what did your physicians do to keep her from completely turning? Eli shook his head. Nothing but care. She grew terribly ill, the fever raged, we believed she passed, and then she did not. We realized she was not one of them when she failed to attack and spoke within two weeks. Like Casper, Rachel added. Do the creatures see her? We keep them from her, Eli replied. She is a gift that God has shown us. All hope is not lost when one receives a bite. Yates spoke up. One of our team was bit several times. He never got sick. However, the dead do see him, and the dogs go mad, unlike with Casper. That's because, Rachel looked at Stephanie, and I'm no doctor, so correct me if I'm wrong, but Fred has to have a different strain. For some reason, he has the asymptomatic strain that makes people turn fast and without warning. The dogs are only trained to sniff out that strain. Stephanie nodded. I really can't wait to examine Fred. If Fred has the main strain, Yates said, our original, whatever you call it, does that mean your cure will work on him? Yes. Eli's eyes widened. You have a cure? Rachel answered. Oh, she does. She has the cure to the strain that makes people sick, not the strain Casper and Mary and the others, you know, walking around eating people have. We're taking her to Center City to mass produce it. Right now, Zeus said. She has limited doses, and it's crazy to think she has the answer to all this kept neatly in the silver case. So you brave this land, Eli said, to retrieve her. Yep, Yates nodded. Or else we'd be in Center City sipping Starbucks and having some R&R. &R. We, Zeus emphasized, would be sipping Starbucks. You were banned from Center City. Where were you banned? Eli asked. Their virus-sniffing dogs turned. I shot them, Yates replied. Fast, too, added Casper. He shoots everything too fast. There is no too quickly when it comes to animals, Eli stated. Any animal that transforms exhibits strength and speed beyond imagination. If you have not seen an infected raccoon, I pray you never do. Yates cringed with a, yikes, I bet. Why would they train animals to find a virus? Eli asked. They sniff the humans, Rachel explained, to see if they're infected. It's more efficient than a blood test. But animals have zero resistance, Eli explained. They go from fine to bad in seconds. That was not wise thinking. Exactly, Yates held out his hand. I said the same thing. They went nuts when they sniffed Fred, but they don't around Casper, Rachel explained. The infected animals don't even bother him. Again, different strain. Dr. Levine... Rachel turned to her. If Mary didn't need anything to keep her from transitioning, maybe Casper doesn't need anything either. That is possible. Dr. Stevens may have been proactive. His work will be very intense for me, and I look forward to reviewing it and meeting him to find out his reasons. In fact, Stephanie peered up to Mary. I bet Dr. Stevens would love a sample of your blood for his work. I sh shall g give it, Mary replied. If you so shall need. Ha! Yates barked out a single laugh. Casp, she's your soulmate. Dude, you're rude, Casper replied. Stephanie sighed out. Unfortunately, I don't have the means for a blood sample. Do you, Eli? We do not. I do, Rachel said. I mean, we do. In Casper's case, there are two venipuncture kits. Dr. Stevens wanted us to take blood if we were out longer than ten days. We're on our way back. You can use one. That would be fantastic. Casper stood at the same time as Rachel. I'll get it. Are you sure? Rachel asked. Positive. I want to see what's taking Riggs so long. Top portion, Rachel instructed. Casper gave a thumbs up and walked to the EPEV.
He could hear Riggs even before he opened the door. Command One, this is Flaming Saffrons. Come in. Riggs paused. Command St. Louis, this is the Flaming Saffrons. Come in. Casper walked into the EPEV. Riggs was in the communication room. He could hear him as he walked to the medical area. This is St. Louis. Hey, any word from Center City Command? Riggs asked. Over. That's a negative. Maybe comms are down. Over. Casper stepped into the medical area, still listening. He saw the case under the counter, and he reached for it. Maybe, Riggs said. I tried satellite comms. No reply. Over. We'll keep trying. Over. Me too. Thanks. Out. Casper lifted the case and placed it flat on the counter. He listened as Riggs kept trying to call out. Riggs sounded concerned, and that worried Casper. Just the fact that no one was replying gave him a bad feeling. Dr. Stevens had his own satellite phone. The number was in the case. He'd get it for Riggs. Maybe he could reach him. Casper popped the latches and lifted the lid. The second he did, he froze when he saw what was inside. He stared for a second, eyes shifting, and knew right away he had the wrong case. It had to be the one that belonged to Dr. Levine. Quickly, he closed it, replaced it, and saw the other case. He opened it and looked for the kits, along with Dr. Stevens' number. Casp? Uh... Casper jumped and slammed the lid to the case. Riggs laughed. What are you doing? Oh, phew, dude. He shook his head and lifted the kit. Just getting this for Dr. Levine. She wants to pull the blood from Mary. Who is Mary? Oh, she's a... Give me a second. To think of a name. Casper snapped his finger. Humishby. Humishby? Riggs asked. Yeah, Part human, part zombie, and part Amish. Whoa, there's another you? Riggs asked. Yeah, but I'm not Amish. Casper fiddled with the kit. I need to get this out there, and I got this for you. He handed Riggs a piece of paper. What is this? It's Dr. Stevens' sat phone number. I thought maybe you could try that. Thanks. Riggs looked down at the paper. Casp, you okay? Um, yeah. You coming out? We had pie. You might want to get out there before Zeus eats it all. Yes, I will. I want to try just once more. You know, get a hold of command and now Dr. Stevens. Riggs, if you don't get through, something's wrong. We've driven five hours, right? Casper asked. It's like five hours more to get back. Maybe we should just go. Yeah, Riggs nodded. I'm thinking the same thing. Good. See you out there. With the kid in hand, Casper left the EPEV. Rachel watched as Stephanie took the blood specimen from Mary, with Casper overlooking like a nervous father. She didn't get why he watched or felt the need to be overprotective. So, you know what you're doing? Casper asked. Stephanie chuckled. Of course. You know, Zeus pointed, Mary could be very helpful to you guys in fighting the dead. I mean, she could lead them instead of having them chase you. Better yet, Yates added, really, you people are skilled. Ever think about joining the force and becoming eliminators, or at least have a team represent you? Could we? Eli asked. Oh, yeah, Yates replied. You get cool weapons, all the food you want, a vehicle, and a map of places to go. You said you want to rid the world. That's a way to help. Plus, booze, if you like booze. I don't think you do. Eli rubbed his beard. Would you place a good word in for us? Yes, Yates nodded. I will, and I can guarantee they'll love to have you. So start thinking of a cool name. It could be, Rachel suggested, the Amish. Yeah, um, no. Yates shook his head. Something like the Om Squad. Or, Casper added, the Amishators. What about, Zeus asked, the Flying Amish. The what? Yates snapped. The Flying Amish? What in the world does flying have to do with killing the dead or being Amish? What does Amishators have to do with anything? Zeus asked. Uh, it's a ship word, said Yates. Amish mixed with Eliminators, Amishators. Oh, yeah, Zeus nodded. Ah, I have a better one, Eli said. The name can be, They who slay the minion of hell that walk the earth. Yates was going to say something, but instead just pressed his lips together in a closed mouth smile. Then he saw Riggs. Well, it's about time, Riggs. You missed dessert. Sorry about that, Riggs said. No worries, Eli replied. You are a busy leader. My wife has made a pie for your road trip when you leave, and a chicken. Oh, wow. Cool. 
Thanks, Riggs said. And we'll take it. But we have to go, guys. I can't get a hold of Commander, and I have a really bad feeling. He quickly looked at Yates when he heard him laugh. That's funny to you? Yes. Yes, it is. It's a high-tech, highly guarded area, Yates replied. Really, how bad can it be? Chapter 16. Sealed. Center City. Okay, that's bad. Barry clicked the receiver on the phone. No signal. The phones aren't working. The phones never worked, Gretchen said. Why did you let me come in here to call? I thought you knew something I didn't. Barry grunted. How do you communicate? With anyone, Barry, Sandy said soothingly. Easy. It's a stressful situation. Thank you, Sandy. Gretchen shivered a breath and reached out to her. Calmly, Barry tried again. Gretchen, if you need to reach out for help, what do you do? Hit the emergency button. It's like a panic button, but I already did that. Barry nodded. And if you need to speak to someone outside of here in authority? Radio. Mine's in my office, she replied. Good. You need to get that for me. How many patients are here? Barry asked. Residents, Gretchen said. We never call them patients. They're called residents. Sandy cleared her throat, her signal to Barry that she knew he was getting upset. Thank you, Gretchen, for that clarification. Now, how many residents are here, including you, Gretchen, Barry? Barry groaned. Then Gretchen spoke at her loudest, her voice screeching as her hands flailed in nervousness. Including you and Sandy, 32. Wait, no, yes, 32. Six employees on this shift. Barry lifted his hand. Now, we may be able to run from the infected, but they can't. If they haven't turned, Sandy said, or worse, we need to gather them, Barry instructed. Gretchen, you go get your radio. Sandy and I will start helping the patients. Residents. Residents. Out. Sandy, we'll shut the room doors if need be while we move them. Gretchen asked. Where? Near a door for quick escape. I'll check the doors to see what it looks like outside, and if need be, we take them out. Well, that's not going to happen, Gretchen said. Why? Barry asked. We're on lockdown. I know, but we can still escape. Barry stood talking when Gretchen shook her head. What? What's that head shaking? Are you saying no? Do you mean we can't escape? Lockdown is controlled by command, a safety measure. No one gets in or out. They lock and unlock the doors. Well, that's just stupid, Barry said. Can you unlock them? We're told to wait for a rescue or to radio for immediate assistance. Then get that radio. In the meantime, we'll start moving all the residents to one area and keep them safe. That would be... Barry left the answer to Gretchen. She didn't answer. Gretchen, we need a safe place to move everyone where we can lock the doors, preferably with a second way out. Gretchen snapped her fingers. The main dining room. It has a door that leads to the courtyard, and that's fenced in. I forgot. It's a sliding door and the only one not controlled. We have to have a fire escape. Good. Good. That's where we'll go, Barry said. That's on the first floor near the rec room, so most of the residents are up here. Sandy, start with the residents. Gretchen, get the radio and help Sandy. I'm going down to check on the first floor to make sure it's safe. Go to it, Sandy nodded. Stay safe and diligent, Barry instructed. Remember, Sandy, you're an eliminator. Gretchen laughed. That's funny, Barry questioned. Yes, the aging eliminators, Gretchen snickered. Yeah, well, these aging eliminators are going to save your butt. Now get to it, Barry ordered. Gretchen did a sloppy salute, hurried to the door, then stopped. What am I doing again? It was like a covert operation. Radio earpieces, silence, and night vision. When General Morrows drove by the labs during a suite, he saw how dark it was and decided he would lead a team in there. When you can, Liz said to Morrows through his headpiece, we're still safe in Starbucks. We have food and water. Worry about everything else first. That lab foremost. It's not looking good, ma'am. Well, obviously not if I've been staring at the dead version of Dr. Stevens for 12 hours. General, at the very least, secure and seal that lab so his research is intact. As best you can. Yes, ma'am. And find Fred. Yes, ma'am. General Morrows waved his hand for his team of four to follow. It wasn't his place to go in. He had men and women for that. But knowing the importance of the lab, he felt he needed to not only be there, 
but to lead. The outer doors to the lab were open, and the windows busted. Everyone be ready for anything, Morrow's instructed as he led them down the hall. There was a body there, a woman in a lab coat. Nothing remained of her torso. Blood laced the floor, thick and slippery, trails of which led out. He pushed through the swinging door of the main lab. He knew that hallway. They were the rooms where they had kept Casper and the other undead they experimented on and tested. The windows weren't broken. It was dark in there, except the flickering emergency lights that illuminated enough for him to see. The lab where Dr. Stevens did his work was in disarray. Chairs turned over, blood streaked the walls and computers. The doors and windows were broken, and that told Morrow's the dead easily entered. He then went to check the rooms where the undead were kept on chains. Like in the main lab, the doors weren't busted, nor were the windows. The chains were still there, dangling from the wall. Someone had set them free. Even though most of the dead could open doors, he didn't see how they could possibly use a key and undo the chains. Ma'am, come in, General Morrows called out. Could Dr. Stevens have let the dead out? I don't see why, Liz replied. What's going on? They're all gone. Morrows stopped at the final room. Well, not all. He stared through the glass at the little undead girl. She hadn't been freed, but she ran from the wall to the glass over and over, trying to get out. General? The kid remains. Take it out. Morrow signaled one of his soldiers. Careful with it, they're fast. The soldier nodded, weapon raised. Just as he was about to report his stock, yes, ma'am, a screeching, loud, screaming woman's voice blasted in his earpiece. Help us! Help us! Anyone there? She screamed. Instinctively, Morrows flicked the earpiece from his ear and winced. He adjusted the volume on the radio and placed it back in. When he did, he heard Liz already engaged in conversation. Gretchen, calm down, Liz told her. You have Barry there. We'll send a rescue team as soon as we can. Sandy thought ahead. She not only grabbed a cane from storage to use as a blunt object, she grabbed ace bandages in case she had to tie someone up. If they were in a wheelchair and turned, she needed only to tie the chair to something. She had moved Agnes and three others in wheelchairs by the elevators. Another woman and man, who needed no walking apparatus, waited with them. But where were the employees? There were four unaccounted for, and that worried Sandy. Gretchen's loud, I got a hold of them, caused Sandy to wince. Gretchen? Sandy scolded in a whisper. Shh! Go wait by the elevator. I have one more room. It was near the recreation room, but Sandy didn't worry. The undead women at the tables were still trying to get up. She knocked once on the door. Lance? She called out and pushed it open. Lance? Lance was in his wheelchair, facing a window. Lance, we have problems. We can use you. What she saw was so unexpected. Lance, with a snarl, spun his chair around with one arm. He had turned. He held a foot near his mouth and dropped it to his lap. It was a strange moment to think about, but Sandy found it completely ironic that Lance, who lost a leg, was dining on one. She backed up, realizing zombie Lance could control that wheelchair. Grabbing for the door, she then saw the aide on the floor. Grabbing onto Lance's wheelchair, the aide stood slowly, but she quickly fell back down when she tried to balance on the missing foot. Sandy pulled the door closed. Gretchen, help! She dropped the cane when she felt one of them pulling on the other side of the door. Gretchen! Sandy turned her head, calling. Gretchen ran from the elevator toward her and stopped. Watch out! She screamed and pointed. Sandy looked. Undead Marv, with his walker, inched his way down the hall. Oh, for goodness sakes, help me out! Finally, Gretchen arrived to help. Hold the door! Oh, my God! Gretchen, hold the damn door! Once she saw Gretchen had the handle, Sandy let go. She grabbed the ace bandage, tied it quickly and tight to the door handle, then strung it across the hall to the door there and tied the other to that doorknob. Checking on Marv, still a good fifteen feet away, Sandy crouched under the extended ace bandage. Let's go. She grabbed hold of Gretchen and they ran down the hall. Sandy smacked her hand into the down button on the elevator, and there the seven of them waited. Sandy kept looking back. Marv had made it to the ace bandage rope. He was stuck there, pressing against it, trying to move forward, but couldn't. The bandage moved violently. 
Ding! The elevator opened. Hurriedly, Sandy reached inside and hit the hold button. Stepping out, she saw the ace bandage fall. She knew Lance or the aide had opened the door. Hurry! Sandy urged, moving the able-bodied residents into the elevator first. It was going too slow, and Sandy knew it. Cramming them like sardines into that elevator, knowing it took longer than it should, when a slow-moving undead in a walker, a footless aid, and an amputee in a wheelchair were making it in better time to the elevator. The open elevator door alarm blared out. Gretchen spun Agnes's wheelchair, backing it in, just as Lance, Marv, and Tina, the aide, were a mere ten feet from them. The doors slowly began to close. Then, six inches from shutting, they opened again. Gretchen screamed. Agnes said, Ow! Marv, Lance, and Tina were five feet away. Sandy hurriedly pressed the button. Again, the door started to close, and again, six inches from shutting, they opened. Gretchen screamed again. Ow! said Agnes. They were two feet. The door slid closed and stopped, opening yet again. Something was stopping it. This time, Tina, the aide, reached in. Sandy was able to get the end of the cane through the door to hit her in the face, to push her back as the door started to close again. Oh, wait! Gretchen inched back Agnes, and instead of stopping, the elevator doors finally closed. My bad. Her foot was... Yeah, yeah. Sandy caught her breath, leaning against the side of a wheelchair as the elevator lowered. The carriage stopped with a double ding, announcing they had arrived. The doors slid open. Gretchen screamed. What the hell is the matter with you? Barry asked. Sorry, just habit. Barry glanced at Sandy. Don't ask, Sandy said. Just, let's get them out. There were twelve. That was all that remained of everybody they were able to get into the main dining room of Resting Meadows. Five from the second floor, seven from the first. Some had turned, while others were victims. The two unaccounted-for aides pounded relentlessly at the dining room doors Barry had barricaded shut. It was quiet and dark in the dining room, and he hoped that would eventually cause the pursuing dead to leave. The remaining residents began to fall asleep, not Barry. He stood by the windows looking out in the courtyard. He could hear the distant sound of gunfire. Pop, 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 rat-a-tat. The sounds told him it was bad out there. He knew from experience all that was needed was for one infected to bite another, and within hours there would be dozens. After taking the radio from Gretchen, Barry was finally able to get through to Liz, and they switched to a private channel. I've been in the Starbucks, she told him, since the crack of dawn. Won't be much longer, Barry replied, before dawn cracks again. How are things there? Well, you have fifteen people in the Starbucks. They're all pretty hyper. Scared? No. Hyper, everyone's been drinking espresso non-stop. Barry chuckled. We're calm here. Won't be long, Liz told him. They have to finish clearing the streets, then we can all be rescued. They won't do it until the streets are clear. What happened? Barry asked. Breach on the bridge, and then, well, you know how that goes. One bite, how many are outside of Starbucks? A couple dozen out front, four or five out back. We'll get out eventually. Our alive manpower is outnumbered, and they're trying to clear without damage to the town. We're going to have to do some serious rethinking of safety when this is done. It just seems strange, Liz. You were safe for so long. It's out of the blue. Something happened. Unfortunately, we'll never know. I'm going to try to catch a nap. I'll let you know if I hear anything. Roger that. Barry placed the radio on the table, then lowered to a chair, setting his crutches against the window. It was pitch black in the courtyard. He couldn't see if the dead lurked there or if it was safe. He hoped it was safe, because he needed a place to go with the residents should the doors to the dining room give. And the way it sounded, he honestly didn't know how much longer they would hold. Chapter 17 Penultimate April 23rd, Day 369, Center City, West Virginia Riggs was exhausted and was glad he was able to get an hour or so of sleep in the final leg of the drive. Yates had downed a bunch of espresso and was hopped up and ready to drive. Everyone slept. Riggs had nightmares in the short span of time he had closed his eyes. He didn't remember what they were about, just they were bad. The slowing of the steadily moving vehicle caused Riggs to wake. He had fallen asleep in the high-back leather chair behind the driver's seat. He sat up. 
What's going on? Everything okay? Unlike himself, Yates replied solemnly, I don't think so. Riggs stood and moved up front with Yates. The checkpoint was ahead on the road, and unlike every other time, no one was there. Not a vehicle, not a man or woman. In the distance, he could see Center City, and while not a lot, there was some smoke rising up. Shit, Riggs said. I know. He looked over his shoulder. Hit the lights. Let's get everyone up and pull over. We're not going in? Oh, we're going in, but I need a radio first. We're close range now. We should be able to reach the personal radios now. We have the EPEV. Any problems they have, we can rectify them. I know. Just pull over. Yates pulled the EPEV over and hit the lights. Mumbles erupted from the back. Yates reached forward and grabbed the microphone. He pressed on the side. A beep rang out. Attention, sleeping eliminators! Riggs gave him a quirky look. Really? You're using the PA? I don't feel like shouting. He brought it to his mouth again. We have a problem. Rise and shine. Riggs shook his head. I'm headed to the back to try to reach them. He walked away through the body of the EPEV. Riggs! Rachel called him groggily. What's wrong? We don't know, but I need to find out. He made his way to the very back of the EPEV and sat down at the controls. He lifted the radio, hoping to get connected on a local frequency. After several attempts in different channels, Riggs got through. Channel 2020 for General Morrows, the radio man said. Roger that, Riggs replied and switched. Calling General Morrows, are you there? Over. This is General Morrows, over. This is Commander Riggs of the Flaming Saffrons. Riggs, it's good to hear from you. We have a bit of trouble here. We need to wind this down and end this. We're close, but could use the extra help. Well, you're in luck. We're here. We have the EPEV, Riggs said. Just tell us where you want us to go. The only way was out. Barry knew it wasn't going to hold, and knew it was time to take the residents outside into the courtyard. It was light enough to see the dead weren't outside the fence, but that wasn't to say they weren't out there. Running wasn't an option, not for Barry or the others. Arms reached through the dining room doors, pushing them more and more. Barry had been an eliminator and around the dead long enough to know the masses that pushed their way in were more than just geriatrics in wheelchairs and walkers. They had been joined by other dead forces. Move everyone to the center, Barry instructed. Away from the windows. There was no protective wall, only windows. Barry took the cane Sandy carried and used it as a brace on the sliding glass door. When he finished doing that, he knew how close they cut it, when the interior dining room doors burst open and the barricade fell. As he suspected, able-bodied dead were mixed in with the wheelchair-bound and others like Marv. It was cold outside. An early morning spring chill was in the air. Barry could hear the whimpering and worried chatter of the residents, and he stood watching as the dead made their way to the dining room windows, staring out to the courtyard, hands beating against the glass. Barry had to think of something. Gretchen was young and healthy, and if she was brave, he would send her out to see if they could evacuate. He knew that wasn't going to happen. Frustrated and worried, he took a step back from the windows and turned to look at the residents huddled together. Gretchen was with them. She was bent over. Barry didn't mean to, nor did he want to look at her behind, but he couldn't help but notice the rectangular object that protruded from her pocket. Barry had the radio. What did she have? Gretchen? Barry walked to her. What do you have in your back pocket? It's the assisted living satellite phone. You had a phone this entire time? Yes. You said the phones didn't work. The phones in here don't work. This does. Barry held out his hand. What? Give me the phone. It's a satellite. Only a select few have them. She handed it over. Who are you calling? Never you mind. Barry walked off a little from the group. He knew who he wanted to call and didn't know if it would be in vain, but he had to try. After looking at the horde in the dining room, Barry dialed the phone. Madam President? The soft female voice called to her, close to her ear. It didn't startle Liz awake. They were too gentle about it. Liz had finally passed out on one of the chairs, sitting sideways, her head drooping forward. She felt able to rest, especially since Maros had told her the hordes were either under control or oddly leaving the city. Maybe they sensed the threat. It was odd, but it allowed Liz to relax. Madam President, she repeated. Liz opened her eyes to see the young female Starbucks barista. What is it? 
Liz asked. The young girl puckered her lips and pointed. We need to find a way out. Liz peered beyond the girl to the window where the dozen or so dead pounded against the glass like they had all day and night. Only this time, two large cracks were in the glass, one on the door and one on the picture window. Okay, Liz said. There's a storage room in back. Everyone there. It'll be tight, but it'll be safe. Everyone, in the back. The people in the Starbucks rushed by her, and Liz lifted the radio. Liz was horrifically mesmerized by them, the way they were relentless, and how Dr. Stevens hadn't moved. He focused on Liz, his fists steadily hitting the glass. General, Liz called out. General, we're making a last stand. Please tell me you're close. A clip of static, and the general replied, Not us. Curious as to what he meant, Liz got her answer when a rod of some type impaled Dr. Stevens from behind. The end of the rod protruded through his forehead. That happened, and the point of a sword went through the head of another. Her eyes shifted back to Dr. Stevens. The pointed rod was withdrawn. His body was shoved forward, smacking into the glass. He slid, cheek against the glass, leaving a bloody smear and dropping to the ground, exposing Rachel. Rachel smiled, waved brightly and excitedly, then, in a snap, spun around and impaled another dead. Liz released a ha of emotions and smiled. Everyone, she shouted, we're going to be all right. We're saved. Zeus had an amazing way of overpowering the dead. It was something Riggs would never get tired of watching. Maybe because he was such a fan, or the fact that Zeus was so big, he could get away with lifting the dead, impaling them, then tossing them like a sack of potatoes. He did it with angry-sounding grunts and professional wrestling theatrics. He watched for a few seconds, then Riggs's attention was drawn when he watched Yates walk up to an undead and point-blank shooter. Yates! Riggs yelled. Save your ammo! For what? You never know. Hand to hand, please. Aye, Captain. Riggs shook his head, and just then he heard his satellite phone ring and felt it vibrate on his hip. Are you... Yates asked. Getting a call? Riggs lifted the phone. Hello? His eyes widened. Barry? Tell me you're close. We're at Starbucks, Riggs said. We'll put down the latte. We need you here. We're overrun and been fighting all night, Barry said. We're cornered out back. We're almost done. We'll be there in a minute. Jeremiah, I'm not sure we have a minute. On our way. Riggs hung up and assessed the situation. There were around eight more and a few stragglers on the street. A few soldiers battled them out. Zeus, Casper, Riggs shouted. Can you finish here? Yates, Rach, come with me. Rachel yelled out as she withdrew her honing rod. What's going on? Barry, Sandy, they're overrun. They need help. Dude, you mean they're like Knight of the Assisted Living Dead? Casper asked. Something like that. Yates, Rach, Epev, now. Riggs rushed to the vehicle. Rachel backed out of the mob, pointing to Casper. Night of the Assisted Living Dead. That was good. Be careful. You too. I'll be fine. They're all in wheelchairs. Rachel ran to the EPEV. We'll meet you there, Casper yelled. Rachel gave a thumbs up as she loaded in the vehicle. She was barely inside, and it started to roll. Clank, clank, clank. Barry jammed his crutch over and over into the padlock on the fence that kept them inside the courtyard. Every wheelchair and resident was near the fence, but there was no way out, nowhere to go. I see them, Sandy pointed. Coming on the property now, the Epev. The vehicle moved like a bat out of hell, rolling down the driveway. Hey, everyone, Gretchen said chipper. Here comes the flaming saffrons. Yay! She clapped her hands together. One more second, Bear, Sandy said. They'll be here in a second. Will it matter? Barry asked. Crash! The window of the dining room shattered. Yates nearly fell off his chair when the EPEV swerved. Riggs drove frantically. You got them? Riggs asked, using the inter-vehicle comms. Got them! Yates's fingers moved on the keyboard. I can drive through the fence. Don't drive through the fence and wreck my EPEV, Yates told him calmly. Get it and... A hard click of his finger, and Yates raised his eyes to the exterior camera angles. The explosive landed at the section of the fence next to Barry and the others. It exploded and flew back, clearing an opening. The EPEV came to a grinding halt, and Yates shifted his view to another monitor. We have about two dozen moving quickly, 
He spoke fast. They don't look like wheelchairs and walkers. Lock onto them, Riggs stated. Rach and I will go out. Get those fast ones first. You got it. I need five seconds. Yates moved quickly. Barry wasn't wrong. He knew by the sound they made outside the dining room doors. He knew by the sound they made outside the dining room doors. He knew by the height of the reaching arms they weren't just the residents. His fears were confirmed when he saw them at the window trying to get out. Lance was front and center. When the window broke, the fast ones, the ones that weren't residents, climbed out first. Even Lance hoisted himself up and rolled out the window pane to the grass. Barry didn't have time to watch what was going on. He heard the explosion and Sandy calling out, Move the residents! But Barry focused on the onslaught of dead. They were in that fresh and running stage, not new enough to move slow and not decomposed enough to slow back down. He lifted his pistol and fired. He hit one, then a tall, lanky Zed wearing scrubs ran his way. He charged toward Barry, totally focused on him, as if he had been targeting Barry all along. Barry depressed the trigger. Nothing. Lifting his crutch, trying to balance, Barry swung out, hitting him with the rubber end, pushing him back, but the scrubs undead kept coming. Back against the fence, Barry knew he couldn't run to catch the others. He was cornered, but he kept the undead at crutch length, giving it all he had until a bullet seared into the undead from the side, blasting out blood from the other side of his head. It dropped to the ground. Riggs spun to Barry. You okay? Yeah, yeah, Barry nodded. Thank you. He saw Rachel running into the yard, sword in hand, her honing rod in the other. Riggs lifted his radio. Yates, where are our shots? Locked on all but two, Yates replied. Fire, Riggs instructed. A shifting sound carried out, followed by a series of pops and high-pitched whistles. And just like Yates had said, all but two went down fast, dropping in their tracks. Barry was trying to take it all in. It was happening so fast. His heart raced, and he was so grateful for his team. Riggs spun and fired at one of the remaining Zeds and raised his weapon for the other. I got it! Rachel called out, then drew the Zed's attention away from the others and ran behind him. What's the one on the ground by him? Riggs yelled. Rachel nodded, but Riggs knew she didn't hear him. She raced back to the Zed, doing her typical baseball slide behind him, landing awfully close to the one that was crawling. So much so, Riggs saw the look of surprise on her face. He wanted to yell out, I told you, but he didn't. After a beat, she jumped up, swiped the back of his legs with a sword. Then, with a quick in, she retracted. She put it down with her honing rod. Good job, Riggs yelled. Rachel walked backward a few steps, looking down to the crawling undead. This one isn't even old. That, Barry hollered, is my... He winced when Rachel quickly speared her gladius into Lance's head, then pulled it out. Friend. Barry cleared his throat and dropped his voice. I wanted to put him down. She's picking up habits from Yates, Riggs said, then quickly turned his head to the high-pitched, almost delightful squeal. My hero, the woman yelled. That's Gretchen, Barry said as she ran over. She's different. Before Riggs could even respond or register what Barry said, Gretchen had bodily pummeled Riggs, throwing her arms around his neck. She held on tight, leg lifted to his waist, while she delivered fast kiss after kiss to his face. Yates paused as he walked by. Man, Riggs, you're just on everything. Rachel shook her head. Old habits die hard. My hero, my hero, you're so brave and hot. Anyone ever tell you you're hot? Rachel told him. So hot, so brave. Yeah, thank you. Um... He reached for her arms, trying to pull them off him, and looked at Barry, mouthing the word, Help! Yates made his way across the yard, laughing at Riggs, trapped in the embrace of his admirer. He looked at the carnage, most caused by the automatic tracking and shoot system of the EPEV. He was glad to use it. Had it not been for his vehicle, Barry and the others wouldn't have made it. It was close. Rachel stood near the busted windows of the building, looking in. He walked over to her. Hey, Yates said as he approached. Hey, there's still a bunch here. She nodded her head. Inside, there were residents from the assisted living facility, all of which had turned. 
the wheelchairs barely moving, and the ones in the walkers moving almost humorously slow. Boy, Casper nailed that one, Yates said. It was a good comment. It was. I look at them. I don't know if I can put them down. Rach, they need to be put down, Yates said. They aren't a threat. Maybe they can do that peace thing to them. I don't think I can do it. Yates laughed. Seriously? Like you can? Without hesitation, he lifted the pistol and fired into the man with a walker. Oh, that's cold, Rachel said. They aren't people. We don't know that. Look at Casper. True. You're so fast with that, Rachel said. One day you'll appreciate it. She mumbled. More than you know. What? She shook her head. Good job today. You too. Mistakes were made, Rachel said softly. What? What mistakes? He looked at her and noticed she had this far-off glance. Rachel, are you okay? I think I am. Just had to reconcile it. What are you talking about? Yates asked. Rachel took a deep, shivering breath, then faced him. When I went after that last one, I wasn't paying attention. Too cocky. There was one on the ground. Who knows? I'm not sure it's that bad of a thing. Rach? She lifted her hand. Right by the thumb, it bled, and a clearly deep mark was seen. I was bit. It was arguably the most emotional-sounding Riggs had been in the entire time they had been eliminators. Everything showed in the way he said that single word. Voice deep and vibrating, hands swinging out, then pointing as he blasted. No! Riggs, Rachel pleaded. No, Rach, no! Riggs spun. Sandy, Sandy, get the kit. Hold on, stay put, don't move, he ordered her, then stormed to the EPEV. He returned a minute later. Sandy! Riggs, Rachel tried to reason with him. Please calm down. Are you serious? No! Riggs shouted. She then spun to Yates. Why would you say something? Why wouldn't I? Yates replied. Something needs to be done. Yes, it does. Riggs knows what I want to do. Why do you think he's acting like a madman? He's acting like someone that cares, Yates said, raising an eyebrow. Rachel! Barry moved to her. Listen to me, honey. I know what you're thinking. Please. Rachel shook her head. Rach! Riggs stormed to her. I am begging you, begging you, please let Sandy give you the antiviral and... No, Riggs, I'm done. This is a gift. It really is, Rachel said calmly. What about Casper? Riggs asked. You want to do this without him around? Yeah, I do. I don't want him to see or him to talk me out of it. That's not fair. I want him to do that, Riggs argued. I need Casper to talk to you. Riggs, I'm done. I miss my family. I miss them so much. When I was bit, the first thing that went through my mind was, I'm finally going to see them. I'm going to see my babies. Rachel, I get it, but no one is just going to put you down like a dog, Riggs said. I won't. I will not. I won't ask you. Rachel turned and stepped to Riggs. I need you to do it. What? No! Yates backed up. No! Yates... Please, please, one shot, Rachel pleaded. I'm asking you because you are the only one that will and can do this. Rachel, I can't, Rachel said. Yes, you can. You know you can. You shoot without thought, and I need you to do the same for me. Please. She extended her arms and dropped to her knees. I miss my family. I miss my children. I've done everything I could to live on. A tear streamed down her cheek. I'm done. I want to be with them. With everything I am, I beg you, Yates. Please, please send me home with my family. Yates tried to control his emotions. His jaw clenched and the muscles flexed in and out. Please, Rachel whimpered. Yates raised his pistol. Pop. Rachel dropped to the ground. Chapter 18, Volume Finale, April 27th, Day 373, Center City, West Virginia. 
Casper wasn't in the best of moods, and the last place he wanted to be was in a meeting with Liz and Dr. Levine. He had been Levine's test monkey for days, stuck in a lab, when he needed to be elsewhere. There weren't many people Casper didn't like in his lifetime, and Stephanie Levine made that short list. Wonderful, Liz said. We're in the middle of cleanup, but I'm sure we can get you the assistance you need, along with transportation. Thank you, Stephanie said. I would love Mr. Bix to be there. Liz peered up to Barry. Would you? Depends. I'm still healing from this leg, and it depends what my team is doing. I thought we were doing boats, Casper said. Isn't that what you said yesterday when you stopped by and saw me at the lab? That's one of the things, Liz said, distributing the cure on the boats. Eliminating, Casper said. Listen how well he's speaking, Stephanie indicated to Casper. Two days ago he wasn't. Thank goodness all of Dr. Stevens' notes are there. And you can use them. Now how do you see this cure going? I see it not only as a cure, but as a vaccine as well. It won't take long to mass produce. Can you... Casper pointed to the door. Excuse me. He didn't want her permission. He just walked out. In the reception area, he paced back and forth. Each step he took fueled a fire in his belly. He spun around when the door opened and Barry walked out. Okay, Barry said. What's going on with you? I know everything with Rachel has you down, but this is not you. She... Casper pointed to the door and whispered, Is a liar. Who, Liz? No, Dr. Levine. She's lying, Barry, lying. This whole cure thing is a ruse. There is no cure, no vaccine, nothing. Dude, we don't even know if she's a real doctor. Where's this coming from? Barry asked. Why do you think this? Because I know. I... On the way here, I accidentally grabbed her case and opened it. It was empty. No vials, nothing that looked scientific. Just a few scraps of paper. I see why you're upset. And I am done. I'm going in there to tell Liz everything. No, Casper, Barry stopped him. You aren't. What? I know how you feel. I know you're mad. But you don't know if that empty case means she doesn't have anything. How do you know those scraps of paper weren't notes? How do you know she didn't have the cure hidden elsewhere? You don't. It's not going to hurt to say something. Yeah, it will, Barry said. You say something and squash all hope. Right now, we all need some hope. But is that right? Barry shook his head. I don't know. I just... He stopped talking when General Morrows stepped into the reception area. Is the president in her office? Morrows asked. Barry nodded. She is. Good. And... He lifted a laptop. You two may want to see this. He immediately went into the office without knocking. Barry and Casper followed. Yates sat, elbow to his knees, head lowered as his hands were folded close to his face. He couldn't stop getting that moment out of his mind. I miss my family. I miss my children. I've done everything I could to live, Rachel cried. I'm done. I want to be with them. With everything I am, I beg you, Yates, please, please send me home with my family. Barry told him it was the first time he really saw Rachel cry. She never broke down. But there, as she begged Yates to deliver one bullet to take her life, she sobbed. He raised his gun, but that was all he could do. Yates heard the pop, saw Rachel fall to the ground, and when she did, it exposed Riggs holding the tranquilizer gun. You dick, Rachel spoke groggily. Yates lifted his head. Rachel lay in the hospital bed, the back of it elevated, her arm bandaged. You're awake, he said. I asked you to shoot me. I know. You didn't. I know. Yates stood up and walked to the bed. Rachel, listen. For the last few days I've been thinking. I really have. I've been working on the plans for the coolest prosthetic ever. You can even tell me what you want me to do. I mean, it's just the hand, but we can do so much. Why didn't you do it? Rachel, Yates, you never hesitate, ever. But you did. You hesitated. I know. Why? Rachel asked. Because you're my friend. I don't have, nor did I ever have a friend. You're my one and only friend. Yates walked to the bed. I couldn't do it. 
So even if Riggs didn't knock me out, you wouldn't? Rachel asked. How do you know? Yates spun when the door opened. Riggs walked in. He paused in his stride, then continued. You're awake. And pissed, Yates said. Too bad. Riggs walked to the bed. Third test today, Rach. You are 100% virus-free. We got it in time. You had no right, Riggs, to make that decision for me, Rachel said. You took that choice away, Riggs shrugged. Get over it. You have some work to do, yeah, but it's your left hand. You can do it. Yates is working on... Don't! Rachel screamed. Don't dismiss what I'm saying. Don't... Don't dismiss that I wanted to die. I wanted to finish this, and you decided what I wanted didn't matter. You weren't thinking clearly, Riggs said. I was thinking very clearly, and I had said it from day one. If I got bit, put me down, Rachel said. I know. But you made a choice not to. You knocked me out and cut off my hand, and now I'm alive instead of dead. Yep. It was my choice, Rachel shouted. Do you know how unfair that was? After a brief pause, Riggs lost it. His face turned red, and he swung out a point. Fair. Fair? You want to talk fair? What's not fair is you just wanted to go, leave, buy, without regards to us. All of us. Well, sorry, Rach. You lost that right the moment you made us all love you. We love you. I... Love you. I lost everyone I loved once, and I won't do it again. I wasn't losing you. Sorry, I just wasn't. So be mad. Doesn't matter. It does matter? Rachel asked. Knock, knock, called Sandy pleasantly, and she popped her head in the room. Why, Yates said, do people say knock, knock? It doesn't make sense. Sandy tossed out a wave of her hand to Yates. Glad you're awake. Just wanted to pop in. I'm delivering a baby today. Isn't that great? It is, Rachel replied. Good luck. Everything okay here, though? Sandy asked. Yeah, just pissed at Riggs. I don't blame you. I'll be back later. Get some rest. Sandy walked back out. Riggs looked at Rachel. Pissed at me? You know that. Not him? Riggs pointed to Yates. He explained himself. But I did? Nothing I said made a difference? Riggs asked passionately. What the fuck, Rach? Jeremiah, language, Barry said softly as he entered the room. Riggs tossed out his hands. I give up. Casper walked in after him. Hey, Rach. Hey, Casper. Barry handed her a cup. I brought you a Starbucks. Figured you could use a few sips to get your wits. Thank you. I'm so glad Starbucks reopened. Rachel sipped. This is good. I wish I had this when I woke up and saw them. Did you lay into them? Casper asked. I just did. Wait, what? Riggs asked. Why are you acting like she didn't just wake up? She didn't, Casper said. She's been up for two days. You guys just don't happen to be in here when she's awake. He shrugged. And dudes, she has been waiting to be awake enough to blast you guys. But don't feel bad. She yelled at me and I wasn't even there. Why did she yell at you? Riggs asked. Because I was glad you made the call. Glad quick draw McGraw there, he pointed to Riggs. Didn't fire. She expected me to put her down afterward. I wouldn't do it, especially after seeing Yates's cool plans for her new hand. I've seen them, Rachel, Barry said. He's a genius, and if anyone can build you one, he can. The bionic chick, Casper said. It'll be cool, like secret 007 stuff. Don't one of you care that I'm mad I didn't die? Rachel asked. No one responded. Rachel grumbled and laid back. Dude, Casper approached the bed. You need to get out of the mood, snap back to the rage we all know, and get on your feet. We have work. He pulled the wheeled food tray closer and put the laptop on it. Check this out. What is it? Riggs asked. From Morrow's, Casper explained. We were in a meeting with the Prez and her. Her? Riggs questioned. Who's her? It, Casper replied. Well, Yates cleared his throat as he huddled around the laptop. That clears it up. Rachel asked, Did you say anything yet, Casper? Barry said not to. Riggs shook his head. What are you guys talking about? I'll tell you later. This is more important. You guys are going to freak. Casper pulled up a video program. Dudes, check this out. The black and white video played, 
It was of Dr. Stevens's lab, and it showed Stevens being attacked. That's Milton, Casper said, and paused the video. Milton? Riggs asked. You knew this man? His name isn't Milton. I called him that, Casper said. He was in room three, locked and chained in room three. How did he get out? Rachel asked. Watch. Casper switched surveillance camera views, showing Milton thrashing in chains. A shadow cast in the room, and Milton calmed down. Soon a man walked into the room, and to Milton, undoing the chains. Stop, Yates said. Stop, is that... Casper paused it. Yep. Fred. He let them all go. What the hell? Riggs said, shocked. Language. Is he insane? Riggs questioned. Seriously? Casper smiled. Look at this. Another black and white video played. Fred stood before a vending machine. Keep watching. He didn't move for at least four minutes. Casper had to speed up the play to get to the point where Fred began banging his head on the machine, then kicking. He lost his mind, Yates commented. Nope, Casper replied. Wait for it. Wait for it. Fred turned from the vending machine, and Casper froze the frame. Rachel gasped. He turned. Not only did he turn, Barry said. I mean, Casper's eyes never went clouded. You could see they are. So he turned all the way and kept his wits about him. Yates scoffed. I don't know if you would classify an undead Fred. He paused to snicker. Banging his head against a soda machine is keeping his wits. He kept his senses, Riggs stated, but lost his mind, like he went mad for sure. He went diabolical, dude, Casper replied. This was the start. From here, he let them go, but he had to know he was going to do it before he turned because he never went back into Stevens' lab for the keys. So I think he knew he was turning and losing his mind before that happened. But the best part, Command got the call about the breach on the bridge on April 22nd at 5.57 in the morning. Check out the timestamp on this, he pointed. Riggs leaned in. April 21st, 9 p.m.? He was with me, Barry said. A few hours before that and was fine. It happened fast. Riggs folded his arms. Does Maros think there's a correlation between him at the lab and the horde on the bridge? He saw Casper grin. Oh, don't tell me. Casper switched views. Only camera angle we have. It was a shot outside the asymptomatic facility. Fred was entering with three undead. Just after ten. We don't know how he got there, but he turned them all and gathered the ones roaming the area. And then... Barry touched the screen. After they wreaked their havoc, they made a pretty impressive horde exodus. This camera's from the bakery, Casper explained. Just before the northern barricade at town, they went straight through. They all just left. With the exception of a few stragglers, Threat is gone. He not only led them, Barry said. It's almost as if he had some sort of control or communication with them. Rachel saw the horde all moving on the screen out of town. Oh, I feel bad. I feel really bad. I liked Fred. Now he's some sort of super zombie villain. None of this makes sense. Riggs said. None. I mean, why cause that much disruption and then just leave? Fuck! Yates blasted and stood. Riggs did a double take and turned to Barry. What? No telling him about language? Fuck! Again! Riggs held out his hand. Want to swear some more? Fuck! Yates repeated. I told them. I told them about this, but no, they thought I was being a prima donna or a dick. What are you talking about? Riggs asked. Casper, back that up, Yates instructed. Casper did. Yates reached down, hit the space bar, and paused the video. Using his thumb and forefinger, he enlarged the image on the screen. There, he pointed. Right there. That's why. Oh, my God, Rachel said in shock. Yeah, um, if there was a doubt in anyone's mind, Yates said, that Fred knew what he was doing or not, it is all cleared up with that single image. It wasn't just Fred leading them out of town. Riggs finished the sentence. It was Fred in one of the EPEVs. Yates nodded. He stole an EPEV. And that... Casper closed the lid to the laptop. Lady and gentlemen, is our next mission. 
I suggest you start to heal, Rach, and you get on that prosthetic, Yates. Our next mission is... He snorted. At hand! Rachel shook her head. That was good. We have to get not only that EPEV, Casper said, but super zombie villain Fred as well. Levine thinks there might be something in his blood. You know, if there are more like you, Rachel told him, there are more like Fred. Well, that just changed everything, Yates stated. Did it? When do we go? Riggs asked. Barry answered. As soon as Rachel feels up for it. I think Yates should make some adjustments to the EPEV that the others didn't. And Fred dismantled the tracking, so it's a wild goose chase. Nodding his understanding, Riggs faced Rachel. Are you up for this? I know you're really pissed at me. Anger and sadness aren't worth holding on to, Rachel replied. I'm up and ready. I want to do this. It's a new focus, and the ante has been upped, so I'm pretty sure another chance to die will present itself. Riggs grumbled, then asked Casper to open the laptop and show him the footage again. Riggs wanted to watch and learn everything he could. He wasn't sure what he'd learn, but something had to be there, even if they had to go back another day. Without a doubt, there was something not only sinister, but different about Fred. He not only very well could be the key to ending the virus and saving humanity, he could be the key to ending humanity as they knew it. They had to find him and the missing EPEV. Both were dangerous beyond belief. Riggs wasn't worried. Not in the least. They were the flaming saffrons, eliminators, and a family. Together, they could take on and beat anything. And they would. This has been The Eliminators, Volume 3. Written by Jacqueline Druga. Narrated by David Dietz. Copyright 2020 by Jacqueline Druga. Production copyright 2020 by Jacqueline Druga. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.